members, the speaker. Members, the Legislative Assembly is honoured to be situated on the ancestral lands of the Wadjuk Noongar people. We acknowledge the first Australians as the traditional owners of the lands we represent and pay our respects to their elders both past and present. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament now assembled, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper all our consultation to the advancement of thy glory and the true welfare of the people of Western Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and uh, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Uh, brief ministerial statements. The Minister for Sport and Recreation. Thank you, Madam Speaker. With the Tokyo Olympic Games closing ceremony taking place last Sunday night, it gives me great pleasure to acknowledge our local champions for their performances and representation of Australia on the world stage. A total of 54 athletes, 22 officials and five support staff from Western Australia represented the nation at the Tokyo Olympic Games. As the Minister for Sport and Recreation, I am pleased to acknowledge the podium finishers for Western Australian athletes. Zach Asserti won bronze medals as part of the men's 4 by 100 metres and 4 by 200 metres freestyle teams. Annabelle McIntyre became Western Australia's first gold medalist at an Olympics since 2008 and Western Australia's first ever rowing gold. Jack Cleary also won a bronze medal for rowing. Brianna Throssell and Tasman Cook complete, competed at the women's 4x200 metre freestyle relay team that won a bronze medal. Brianna has gone on to become the third Western Australian to bring home three medals, winning gold and two bronze in the swimming relays. Matt Wern won a gold medal in sailing. West Australians Tom Wickham, Trent Mitten and Aaron Salutsky won a silver medal for the Kookaburras hockey team. Sam Welshfield won a bronze medal in cycling and Duop Reef won a bronze with the Boomers in what was Australia's first ever Olympic medal in basketball. Of course, these homegrown heroes would not have been able to reach this elite level without the associations, clubs, staff and volunteers they make, that make up each sport. I acknowledge the hard work of the team at the West Australian Institute of Sport to prepare our athletes for a successful Olympics campaign in what has been a challenging lead up to the Tokyo Games. Our local athletes' performances on the big stage was inspirational and will have a ripple effect all the way through to grassroots sport and resonate with kids who would no doubt want to follow in the footsteps of their Olympic heroes. That's one of the fantastic things about the Olympics, not just the medal tallies, but the boost to participation at the community level. Members of the House, please join me in congratulating all the West Australian athletes who competed in the Olympic Games. Simply representing Australia in Olympic Games is an incredible achievement and is the result of a great deal of hard work, sacrifice and determination. I would also like to congratulate the 24 aspiring West Australian athletes that have been selected to represent Australia at the Tokyo Paralympics, which starts on the 24th of August. I look forward to providing a similar update on that later this month. Here, 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 and uh, congratulations to all those athletes, and uh, we'll all look forward to the Paralympic Games. Uh, the Minister for Citizenship and Multicultural Interests. Madam Speaker, I would like to inform the House that on Wednesday, the 4th of August, I had the pleasure of presenting the Outstanding Community Languages Teacher of the Year Award 2021. The award is now in its third year, celebrates excellence in teaching by community language teachers and recognises their commitment to helping young students learn skills that broaden their horizons and last them a lifetime. This year's award was won by Ms Anja Reid of the Goth Society of West Australia for her dedication to the school and the teaching of the German language and her outstanding skills in motivating and encouraging her students to learn. This year, 11 strong nominations were received for the award from Community language, Languages School teaching German, Greek, Mandarin, Polish, Russian, Tamil and Vietnamese. Each school was entitled to nominate one teacher. 
The award presentation was hosted by the Community Languages West Australia, formerly the Ethnic Schools Association of WA, in partnership with the Office of Multicultural Interests and was held at the new West Australian Museum, Bula Batit. I was honoured to host the award presentation with Mr Enzo Zerner, AM, President of the Community Languages of Western Australia. It is well known that the McGowan government recognises the importance of supporting language learning and maintenance in Western Australia. In 2021, close to $700,000 in funding has been provided to the community language schools through the Community Languages Program, administered by the Office of Multicultural Interests. This funding was provided to 46 community language schools to assist their teachers and administrators to provide quality language teaching to thousands of students. Madam Speaker, the importance of language learning and maintenance cannot be overestimated. Language abilities increases career opportunities, facilitates links with the rest of the world and increases intercultural understanding. I am sure members of the House will join me in commending teachers of the community language schools, most of whom are volunteers for their commitment to maintaining and extending Western Australia's linguistic diversity. Further ministerial statements? The Attorney-General. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I recently had the pleasure of opening WA's uh, Legal Aid WA's 16th virtual office located at the Clarkson Library in my electorate of Butler. I shared that honour with uh, Tr uh, Mayor Tracy Roberts of the City of Wanneroo. The virtual offices are an initiative of the Legal Aid's CEO, Dr Graham Hill. They use advanced technology and innovation to improve access for justice for people living in an outer suburban and regional areas where there is limited access to physical legal aid offices. <coughs> Each virtual office is fitted with a state-of-the-art video screen that connects the Legal Aid's head office for face-to-face -face appointment with a Legal Aid lawyer. Virtual offices are located in community centres across WA and are hosted by partner agencies including Citizens Advice Bureau, Community Resource Centres, Hope Community Services, Corelli Adult Education Centre, Youth Justices Services and now the City of Wanneroo. These organisations use their local knowledge and relationships to help community members identify legal issues and connect them with the legal aid services. I understand that legal aid hopes to continue to open more virtual offices within the next ones planned at Manjimup and Narragin. I launched Legal Aid's first virtual offices in 2019 in the outer suburban centres of Armadale, Joondalup, Midland and the regional centres of Esperance, Fitzroy Crossing and Halls Creek, Karatha, Leonora, Mandurah and Meekathara. Since, uh, since then further offices have been opened in Fremantle, Quinana, Rockingham, Bustleton, Durian Bay and now Clarkson. To date over 2,160 legal services have been delivered through virtual offices. Over 68% of the people receiving assistance have been new clients accessing Legal Aid's help for the first time. This initiative is making it easy for these people to access legal information and advice at an early stage, helping them resolve their matters quickly with improved outcomes. <laughs> I commend Legal Aid WA, the City of Wanneroo and the Clarkson Library on their successful collaboration that has delivered this important new service to the local community. The Minister for Police. Madam Speaker, yesterday I was privileged to attend the WA Police Force Suicide Prevention Forum, which was held at the Perth Convention and Exhibition Centre. I'd like to acknowledge the Commissioner, Chris Dawson, and his team within the Health, Welfare and Safety Division for their efforts in planning and delivering this initiative. Madam Speaker, you, better than many of us in this chamber, know the difficult and arduous job our police officers do on a daily basis to keep the community safe. Tragically, sometimes the ongoing impact of the stresses police face in carrying out their duties is not realised until too late. The recent loss of two serving police officers is a sobering reminder for us all that mental health is an issue that we need to better understand and work harder towards identifying the symptoms and ways in which we can better manage the causes. The forum brought together representatives from all ranks within the WA Police Force, as well as subject matter experts and researchers with the goal of raising awareness and identifying the challenges associated with mental health and suicide. A key point that I took from the forum and one which 
we must encourage all uh, which I encourage all members in this chamber to promote is that we must all speak up in an effort to remove any stigma that surrounds mental health and encourage anyone who feels they need to ask for help to seek it out. Under the McGowan government and Commissioner Dawson, there have been a significant boost in resources and services provided by the health, provided by the health welfare and safety division. Nevertheless, we must all constantly work to improve our support of police officers who put themselves into harm's way on our behalf on a daily basis. Thank you. Are there any questions? Speaker. The Leader of the Liberal Party. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Health. Minister, I refer to your claim in question time last week when you stated, and I quote, we have had a significant increase in demand, 14 per cent in emergency department presentations this year alone, and comments from Mr Mark Duncan Smith, President of the Australian Medical Association, WA, clarifying that there had been, uh, overall there had been a 3 to 4 per cent increase, which is in fact consistent with yearly trends across your term. And I ask, given COVID-19 has been the scapegoat for your government's failure to address the health crisis, which has been worsening over the last four years, how do you respond to AMA, WA, the AMA WA president confirming it? it is your government's neglect which has caused the crisis, not COVID-19? The Minister for Health. There's more parts to that, um, to that question, uh, Madam Speaker, than an episode of Home and Away. Uh, but let me go through some of these things, Madam Speaker. The fact of the matter is, is that every health system in this nation and internationally is struggling with a spike in demand as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. That's your curve. Whether you like it or that's not, member. I know it doesn't fit your narrative, but that's well, tough. It doesn't fit the And you data. can't come into this place with your statistics data. to try to pretend no, no. otherwise. So no, let, no. let me... So, the question. member, you have asked the question and you've held up your chart. Uh, if we could just have the answer from the minister, please. So let me take the member through this very slowly, Madam Speaker, because that's clearly the speed with which he learns. If you compare December 2020 with December 2019, we've had an increase in presentations of 11.6%. January 2021 to 2019, an increase of 10%. In March 2021 to, uh, to, to March 2019, increase of 5%, and in April, an increase also. But importantly, Madam Speaker, and I've been saying this now for weeks, weeks on end, whereas the member comes into this place with his same material, the same accusations, and we beat them off day in, day out. The fact of the matter is that triage ones between 2021 compared to three years ago is up 10%. Triage twos up 15%. These are critically ill patients. These are the people who are having the impact upon the patient flow in hospital EDs. Now, I know it's it's true to say that if you take the numbers globally, that is the very highest security and the very lowest. You've seen a modest uptick of around about 5% 5, 5 between 2019 and 2020, 21. But the fact of the matter remains that the people coming to our EDs are sicker and the fact of the matter remains that the people presenting with mental health issues are, more co are coming, coming there with more complex issues. That's led to the length of episode of care going up. That's led to the, the, the constraints which are sitting on our EDs at the moment. I notice, Madam Speaker, that the member for VAS, who um, unfortunately can't be with us during this week, and we wish her all the very best in her struggles, but clearly on the weekends is able to, to um, make uh, several um, work-related, um, undertake several work-related activities, where she said that between the first six months of, the last six months of 2019, pre-COVID, was 80, there was 80,400 uh, average presentations per month, comparable to the first six months of 2021, there was 81,200. Well, Madam Speaker, not only has she got it wrong, the average is actually 94,219, uh, 94, but she's comparing the first half of one year during the summer months with the second half of another year during the winter months. 
Now, no homework at all, Madam Speaker. No accuracy, no even pretense at prosecuting the truth in relation to this debate. But if the member wishes to stand up again, we'll explain to him again in very slow language, very slow sentences, and perhaps we'll produce some charts as well to if hopefully that once at one point in the future he will actually get it. A supplementary, a supplementary question to Thank the Leader of the much. Opposition. Minister, given the amount of spin and selective information coming from your office, how are Western Australians supposed to trust that you can deliver the health system that they deserve? The Minister for Health. Madam Speaker, that's one of the longest supplementaries I've ever heard. I'm and had a bigger, a bigger preface than, uh, than War and Peace. But, Madam Speaker, there is no spin here. We are being truthful with the people of Western Australia. We are being truthful with the people of Western Australia. That will be a great opportunity for you to learn those lessons, uh, Member for Cottesloe, being truthful with the people of Western Australia. The fact of the matter is that our EDs are under intense pressure. Our health doctors and nurses working on the front line are working harder than ever, having come off the, the, the back of one of the most stressful periods of their careers. And that's why we are undertaking the most significant expansion of our hospital, um, uh, uh, hospital beds and our hospital workforce. But it's not easy. It's not easy. But thank goodness we've got a McGowan Labor government because at least we're dedicated to the hard work. Yeah. Yeah. The member for Churchlands. Um, my question is to the Premier. I refer to the announcement that the McGowan Labor government will invest an additional $1.9 billion in health and mental health services across Western Australia. And I ask, can the Premier outline to the House how this significant boost in funding will address the unprecedented demand in WA's health system and support the delivery of high quality care to West Australians? And can the Premier advise the House if he is aware of any threats to the health of West Australians? Madam Speaker, can I thank the member for Churchlands for the question and can I also acknowledge the former Deputy Premier, uh, the Honourable Eric Ripper, uh, who's in the uh, President's, uh, President's Gallery uh, Even today. Even the Welcome, Speaker's uh, Gallery, yes. In the Speaker's <laughs> Gallery, sorry. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> In the Speaker's Gallery today, welcome, uh, welcome, uh, Eric. Um, Madam Speaker, uh, Western Australia has the uh, best-funded health system uh, in Australia. Uh, we are per capita spending 18 per cent higher than the national average uh, on our health system uh, in our state. Uh, but we are under heavy demand, as the Health Minister has outlined, uh, with enormous increases in ED presentations, particularly. Uh, with uh, co complex uh, mental health uh, reasons uh, and a range of conditions which are placing pressure uh, on our emergency departments. Uh, so on the weekend, the Health Minister and I announced uh, significant funding in the state budget uh, that is coming up of $1.9 billion boost uh, in health and mental health funding across Western Australia. Uh, that will mean more staff, more beds and more services uh, on top of our existing funding uh, for our health, health system. And uh, on top of that, Madam Speaker, uh, we'll be putting in place $1.8 billion for the new Women's and Babies Hospital at the QE2 site uh, in Netherlands. Yes. And on top of that, $1.3 billion over the next four years on important capital works improvements, both in the city and the regions all over the state. Uh, this will mean an additional 332 new beds across the health system. Uh, it'll mean... Um, an additional 100 extra doctors, around 500 uh, extra nurses, uh, and that is all on top of the already announced expansion in beds, uh, plus $495 million in mental health spending uh, across uh, Western Australia, including $129 million of that towards our youth uh, mental health. The reason we can do that is we have had strong financial management yeah, over the course yeah. of the last yeah. four and a half years, uh, which has put the state in a strong financial position, certainly compared to the last government and compared to any other government in Australia, which allows us to invest uh, in important health initiatives all over the state. The member asked me about threats. Uh, Madam Speaker, yesterday or the day before, we received a letter from a Mr Clive Palmer from Queensland. Oh no. Uh, it was, oh, no. Uh, his, letter, his letter demanded... 
Sorry, the Premier has the floor. It's the Liberal and National Party's friend. He does fund their election campaigns, Madam Speaker. Now, he, um, he, um, Mr. Palmer's letter, Mr. Palmer's letter from a lawyer, uh, basically threatened the West Australian government with legal action if we don't suspend the vaccination program uh, for COVID-19. Uh, it was, it was shocking, appalling, disturbing. Uh, dis and disgusting that Mr uh, Palmer would do that. It shows an appalling degree of ignorance on his behalf uh, and it is an appalling misuse of his wealth that he is prepared to do that and threaten the health and wellbeing and lives, particularly of older people uh, in this state. Uh, if he's successful in his action and he's threatening some sort of injunction against the state, uh, well then, uh, it will damage the health of not just West Australians but all Australians and people could potentially uh, die. Uh, Madam Speaker, we will not give in to this bullying and bizarre behaviour by Mr Clive Palmer once again. Bullying and bizarre behaviour towards the people of this state is a record of doing that on multiple occasions. This is another example of that, but I must say this is a particularly disturbing example because what it does is it, does, it doesn't just threaten the finances of the state, it threatens the lives and health of people in this state. The member for Rowe. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. I refer to the state government's school student wellbeing study conducted by Detect WA which found around 40 per cent of high school students are experiencing moderate to high levels of emotional distress, a threefold increase from 2014. And I ask, Minister, can you confirm that school nurses have been pulled out of WA schools to staff state-run vaccine centres, leaving schools with diminished or no nursing staff? The Minister for Health. So on the one hand, Madam Speaker, the member would have us be concerned about the impact of COVID-19 on the mental health and wellbeing of our students. On the other hand, Madam Speaker, he wants us to tie our hand behind our back in terms of how we fight COVID-19. I would have thought the best way we can, we can address the concerns that young people have around COVID-19 is to get the, take the opportunity to get as many people vaccinated as possible. I'm not quite sure where you're coming from here, Member. Do you want us to solve the problem or don't you? Do you want us to solve the problem or don't you? In the last election, we committed to an extra 100 uh, school psychologists, which will go a long way to equipping our schools to provide a better environment for the kids that they, care, that they look after, to make sure that we can continue to, uh, to uh, um, respond to the issues around mental health and wellbeing. And of course, as the, um, as the Premier has just said, uh, we've, um, re we've also just announced an increase of $495 million in spending in the Mental Health Commission for a range of mental health uh, uh, services in our community. But the thing we must do now is to get the community vaccinated. We, it's all hands on deck. Order, please. I know where you st I know where you stand, member on vac on vaccinations, because we've seen it from your mate Clive Palmer. We know what your position on, on vaccinations is. It's <laughs> Madam Speaker, once again, I concede to the member for Gurrwin in terms of Even the, the, wisdom, the wisdom, wisdom of this place. She provides great insight into the offerings of the member for Cottesloe there. I th Minister, I do think you're referring to the member for Lansdale. My apologies, member for Lansdale. But, Madam Speaker, the fact of the matter is that we have to get as many people vaccinated as possible. I've announced today that we've engaged a whole range of nurse graduates that are now going to take up roles in our vaccination clinics. We have assistance in nursing in our vaccination clinics. We've, we, we have asked 35 of our 300 uh, uh, odd uh, school based nurses to, to be able to do some shifts in our vaccination clinics as well, because we want to make sure we get as much of this stuff 
into the arms of Western Australians. That's the only way we're going to get out of this, Madam Speaker. That's the only way we're going to get out of this. And with all the impacts that it has, both upon the physical well-being of the members of the West Australian community, as well as the mental health issues that they confront. And so we make no apologies for making sure that we have got all hands on deck in terms of our efforts to get people vac vaccinated. Um, A supplementary question to the member for Rowe. Uh, thanks, Minister for Health. Can you confirm that those 35 nurses that you are taking out of the schools, uh, is that the full extent of it, or will there be more on top of that? Uh, Minister. I can't give any guarantees that that's the extent of it, Madam Speaker. What I can guarantee is that we'll do, ev we'll do everything possible to make sure that we can protect the people of Western Australia by getting them vaccinated as soon as possible. The member for Joondalup. My question is to the Minister for Health. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's massive investment of $1.9 billion into our health system, and I ask, can the Minister outline to the House how this investment will help deliver more doctors, nurses and midwives for our health system? And can the Minister advise the House of what strategies will be undertaken to recruit more health staff for our hospitals? The Ma Minister for Health. Madam Speaker, I thank the member for the question. It's a very important one. And as members would be aware, the Premier and I committed to an extra 332 beds um, over the weekend as part of our significant expansion of the hospital system. That will require an extra 100 doctors and 500 nurses for that, al for that alone. But, Madam Speaker, uh, we have to recruit more. There's no point in having more beds unless we can have more doctors and nurses to stand by those beds to provide world-class health care for the people of Western Australia. And when we came to, to office, Madam Speaker, there were 34,700 members of our health team. Today there are over 39,000, a 14 per cent increase uh, in, in just our first term. 45 per cent of all public sector jobs, Madam Speaker, were created uh, in, the, in the health system to continue to provide great health care. And in just the first six months, Madam Speaker, the first six months of this year, we have recruited more than 750 FTE nursing and midwifery staff into our health services, and, um, and there will be more. But, Madam Speaker, the labour market for doctors and nurses is very tight. Because of the, the situation with our international borders, we can't recruit as many overseas doctors and nurses that would usually come to this great state as part of their, their ongoing career opportunities. So, Madam Speaker, today I've, we've announced a significant investment in a campaign to ensure that we get more people uh, in our, in our um, in nurses in our health system. We're investing $71.6 million into a health workforce attraction and retention strategy. The budget will commit $35.6 million extra for new workforce initiatives. This is $36 million. Uh, this is on top of the $36 million election commitment for, um, focused on 600 more graduate nurses. So let's start with the international campaign, uh, uh, international and interstate strategy, Madam Speaker. We are bringing in, as we speak, 209 junior doctors from the UK and Ireland to start work in our WA health system in the next few months. Months. Two million dollars for an even more targeted international, uh, national, and local advertising campaign. A key focus of the recruitment tra uh, strategy is attracting experienced nurses and midwives back into the workforce. We're providing refresher courses, Madam Speaker, free of charge, um, which were paused during COVID-19, to bring experienced nurses and midwives back into the system and to assist others to upgrade their skills. These refresher courses will provide a smooth transition back into the health system, and the McGowan government will fully fund the cost of the online refresher training um, and will facilitate paid clinical placements for those who have completed the training. In addition to that, Ms. Uh, Madam Speaker, we want to make sure that we continue to um, engage as many uh, experienced nurses and midwives, but also make sure that they are supported by great nursing graduates. And in a typical year, about 700 graduates will be offered places in the health system, Madam Speaker. And as a result of this, um, uh, uh, as a result of this initiative, we will uh, top. Uh, the, this will come on top of the 600 new graduates and nurses already promised. This year, we will recruit 1,100 new graduates. We will, will receive jobs. And, Madam Speaker, I just want to draw your attention, Madam Speaker, because I think all members of the of the of the chamber should be concerned. 
It's important to, know, to understand that if you're going to go out there and make accusations of, of, of a government and their efforts to recruit, you do so in a way which is truthful with the people of, of West Australian community. So I was disturbed, Madam Speaker, to see a tweet from the member from Cottesloe recently that said that, said that we were promised 1,000 new nurses and Cook delivered none. So, Madam Speaker, let me take the opportunity just to explain, again in very slow English, to the member for Cottesloe that today we have recruited 927 of those 1,100 nurse graduates already in our system today, working the wards of the WA Health System, providing great support to our experienced doctors and nurses. By the end of the month, that would have increased to 949. Madam Speaker, this is a tough job. The spike in demand in, re in relation to our hospitals is putting the hospital system under great pressure. But we are bringing resources to bear and extra doctors and nurses to bear. But I, one thing I think this health system shouldn't have to bear, and that is the untruthfulness of those opposite and their tweets in the community. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Madam Speaker, my question today is to the Minister for Emergency Services. Minister, I refer to your announcement of 11 caravans being supplied to people seeking emergency and temporary accommodation in the Midwest as a result of the devastation following Cyclone Saroja. And I ask, are you aware that five of your 11 caravans appear to have not been allocated to families in need and are currently parked at the Geraldton State Emergency Services headquarters? And there they are there in all their glory. And don't seem to have left the yard. And I ask, how is this excusable when you announced this measure back on the 21st of July, which was already weeks late? The Minister for Emergency Services. Uh, I thank the member for the question. And uh, the provision of caravans was part of a uh, response to requests from the community directly. Uh, and we consulted with some of the, or well, indeed all of the 16 local governments that were affected by Cyclone Sarosia. Uh, there was feedback from communities through the local councils, through local community outreach, uh, and the member should be reminded that there were a range of accommodation uh, uh, offered and given and taken to people impacted by the cyclone. Now, it's not always that uh, people wanted a caravan. Indeed, some people were provided with accommodation in towns like Geraldton. Uh, other people had other sources of accommodation. Uh, other people made other arrangements. So the number of caravans that were provided uh, was in, uh, in a result of direct contact with the community. Those caravans were taken to Geraldton, where they are being uh, made uh, good. Uh, they, you will know, uh, member, that if you try to buy a caravan in Western Australia today, you can't get one. Uh, if you wanted to order a new one, it would take at least six months. So these caravans are second hand uh, and were provided on that basis that they could be provi provided quickly f uh, for the people who needed them. Uh, there are some, uh, some issues with the caravan in terms of licensing, that they have to be licensed. But in, in relation to the people who are getting these caravans, uh, they are the right fix because some people want to stay in on their communities in Northampton. They want to be on properties that have been destroyed. They want to be close to animals. They want to be close to communities. So the response we've provided in terms of accommodation has been varied and bespoke according to need. The need based on what the community told us in terms of a small number of people was the provision of caravans. They are being provided. I, don't, I can't give you the exact reason why those caravans are there at the moment in Geraldton, but they are in the region ready to go. Obviously, most of those caravans have now been provided to the people who need them. And um, uh, if it's an issue of putting a, a registration on a, on, a, on a caravan and getting it on site, then that can be done quite quickly. Supplementary question. Supplementary question. I am staggered by that response. So, where in your press release does it outline that these caravans were not fit for use when you took them to the people in the north, in the, in the shore of Northampton, Chapman Valley, and and uh, and Greater Geelong? That's staggering. You sent out right. caravans which are not fit for purpose. Sorry. Point of order. I'm taking a point of order. Please sit down. Uh, uh, this is an opportunity for a supplementary question, not That's a, right. Not it's not an opportunity for yeah. further argument. So you've asked your question, not asked the minister to respond. Uh, member, they are adequate for, uh, as caravans to be provided for people. 
Sorry, we just hear from the minister. Member, thanks. The the response, quite frankly, the response of the National Party to an issue that has impacted your own constituents has been woeful. Has been woeful. Now I've been in the community in the Midwest many times. I've not seen you there, member, once. I've not seen you there once. Okay. Now it's very it's very easy. It's very easy. It's very easy from the cheap seats. It's very easy from the cheap seats to to criticise. But this is a huge disaster that has impacted many areas of our state across 16 uh, uh, local government regions. Uh, we have provided a massive response in terms of clean-up. We have provided a massive response in terms of ongoing support and emergency accommodation. We went to the community. We went to local governments. We asked, what is it you need? A range of uh, requests came back. In terms of caravans, it was 11 from all the Shire presidents and CEOs contacted, they said they wanted 11 caravans. So guess what they got, member? They got 11 caravans. If there are more caravans needed, they will get those. Order, please. But if it is not easy in the current market to walk into a, to a shop and get a, get a brand new caravan, these caravans are fit for purpose. They are late models and they are being provided and they are being provided uh, gratefully by the people who need them. Now, if you sit there and criticise and carp on, I'd rather you get behind the effort that's being launched to support your own constituents. That concludes that question. Uh, the member for Bicton. My question is to the Minister for Transport. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's commitment to permanently protecting the Belia wetlands, which was delivered last week with the passing of the Metropolitan Region Scheme Belia Wetlands Bill. And I ask, can the minister remind the House how this government came to the decision to stop the destructive Row 8 project and protect the wetlands? And can the minister update the House on the work underway to deliver a long-term responsible solution to getting trucks off local roads in the southern suburbs? The Minister for Transport. Thank you. And can I thank the member for Bicton for that question and, of course, her work over many years to help deliver this commitment. Members, it was with great pride last week that we finally delivered the commitment that we gave to the people, and that was to save the Belia wetlands for future generations, members. Remember, we took it to the 2017 election, and of course, the Liberal National Party frustrated this policy commitment in the other place. And again, we took it to the 2021 commitment. And I'll refer to some of the comments and the attitudes from the Liberal National Party in a minute. But what we've been able to do is change that reservation from roads to parks and recreation. Members, we've also created, extended the A-class reserve boundary to include the Belia wetlands. And this has been a fight over many decades, members. And there's been people that have been working very hard, year in, year out, to deliver it. Can I thank my parliamentary colleagues, the member for Fremantle, the member for Bicton, the member for Willoughby, and can I also thank the member, federal member for Fremantle, Josh Wilson, for all of his work too. Can I acknowledge all the work um, done by the community, the, the general community and also some of those community leaders, in particular Kim Drav Dravnix and also Kate Kelly from the Save Billia Wetlands Group. Can I acknowledge all the work they did over many years? Of course, we've extended the A-class reserve. We've um, now deleted, we are deleting the Row 8 corridor. We're also, of course, um, um, building new infrastructure under the stewardship of the Minister for the Environment, extended boardwalks and more infrastructure so more people can actually appreciate these beautiful wetlands. And of course we're doing that and at the same time we're delivering the broader commitments of moving more freight onto rail, improving the roads leading into Fremantle like High Street, developing intermodals all those commitments being delivered. And of course what's the Liberal National Party attitude? They still want to build Row 89. They still want to build Row 89. And again, the National Party, you think they'd be more concerned about regional roads, but their commitment always has been on the Perth Freight Link. That's the only road project I've heard them talk about. The Liberal National Party and in the upper other house, the Honourable Nick Goran and his new apprentice, I think Neil Thompson, talking about these, these projects. Nick Goran. 
The Leader. No, please sit down, Minister. I'm taking point of order. Uh, the Minister should refer to the member by their, their full title. Uh, the Honourable Nicola. That is, that is uh, correct. If you're referring... Sorry, I'm giving the ruling. Um, if you're referring to a member in another place, you need to, prefer to them, uh, refer to them appropriately. Yep. Honourable Nick Goran, sorry about that, and the Honourable Nick, um, Neil Thompson. So, the leaders, Honourable Nick Goran, who of course led the Liberal Party from a record, I think, six seats in South Metro to zero seats. Zero seats. Honey, I shrunk the Liberal Party. That is a. That. That. Good line. That. Good line. That I like that line. Is, is the description of the Honourable Nick Goran. <laughs> Shrunk the Liberal Party into oblivion and now still in the other place, insulting our commitment and insulting the people of Western Australia who have voted on this issue twice, members, twice. And now let's look at that whole corridor. Member for Riverton, member for Jandica, member for Bateman, member for Bicton, all fought on this issue. And again, we delivered the overwhelming response that people wanted to save the um, Billy Wetlands and deliver the alternative freight and trade plan for Western Australia. The uh, Leader of the Liberal Party. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. Minister, I refer to your commitment to recruit, recruit an additional 1,000 nurses in April this year through a national and international advertising blitz. And I ask, uh, have you recruited? How many nurses have you recruited from overseas uh, as part of this advertising blitz? The Minister for Health. <laughs> Madam Speaker, slowly, very slowly. I'm not sure, Did you answer this before? but I'm pretty sure I answered this in the last question. <laughs> so, Member. <laughs> Members, the Minister for Health is Madam answering the question, and I'd ask everyone else to listen to the answer. It's, 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 um, it's difficult to know where to start to address the incompetence, Madam Speaker. But look, let me explain. This. I promised the people of Western Australia, Member, that we would re recruit through the Nurse Graduate Intake Program a thousand nurses this year and a thousand nurses next year. Well, normally, we take in just over 700. So this is a significant increase. Not only takes account of our election commitment, but goes beyond that because the McGowan Labor government is investing in our health system to meet the demands of our health system. However, in addition to that, the Premier and I have recently announced an expansion of that program so we have 1,100 this year and 1,200 next year. So this has never been done in our health system before. This is an unprecedented level of expansion and intake of nurse graduates. Now, we want to blend them with experienced nurses, so I will speak this point very slowly. We have recruited 750 experienced nurses so far this year. And although it was a long time ago, at least two questions ago, we have recruited 927 nurse graduates this year, and by the end of this month, that will have got to 949. So that was our commitment, 1,000 nurse graduate places this year. Uh, we're at 927, 949 by the end of this, uh, this month. So, Member, don't bother asking a supplementary. Uh, Minister, supplementary. clearly you don't listen to the questions that are asked of you, so I'll ask this supplementary question slowly no, so that you can understand. No preamble, Minister, just question. how many nurses have you recruited from overseas as a consequence of your advertising blitz? Minister for Health. Well, Madam Speaker, as, I, as I've, I've just come from a press conference where we've provided details in relation to that, so maybe I'll take up a little bit more of the, of the opposition's time and question time to explain that program. This is an exciting program whereby we're advertising in the UK, Ireland and other places to try to bring in nurses from, from overseas. They will be uh, re recruited via a program which will see them come into Western Australia in, over and above our cap. They won't have to pay, pay their, quarantine fare, um, their quarantine fees and we'll provide them with a relocation allowance. It's a program which comes on, which has got nothing to do with the, with the uh, 1,000 nurse graduate 
commitment that, that we made back in April this year. That's a completely separate separate commitment. And, um, and as a result of that, uh, we will hopefully have a great blend of nurse graduates and experienced nurses. And as I said, we've already recruited 750 experienced nurses. Now, some of those will be locals. Some of those will come from interstate. Some of those will come from overseas. But we welcome them all because they will provide great care for the people of Western Australia. The Speaker. Member for Belmont. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Energy. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's commitment to supporting Western Australians facing hardship, particularly as the state recovers from the economic impacts of COVID-19. And I ask, can the Minister outline to the House how Synergy is supporting those West Australians who are doing it tough and helping prevent them from being disconnected? And can the Minister advise the House if he is aware of anyone who believes the government should not be supporting struggling West Australians? The Minister for Energy. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. I'm very pleased to answer the question from the member for Belmont, and I know her deep commitment to helping people in hardship. I know that's one of the motivations that led her to this place. And I want to say that uh, Synergy has been prioritising hardship over the period of time the, that uh, the McGowan government's been in power. And last year we saw a range of COVID supports that helped people in hardship. But of course, we also saw the $600 account offset. We saw the doubling of the energy system payment from $305.25, which meant that the lowest income earners in Western Australia got $1,210.50 of free electricity from the government of Western Australia during uh, uh, 2020. We've, uh, the, the government's reformed the HUGS program so that rather than helping Synergy, it helps uh, ha people in need. We've introduced the Household Energy Efficiency Scheme, a scheme mirrored on a program that was run by the former Gallup and Carpenter government and abandoned by the Liberal Party when they were in power. And we're implementing the Smart Energy for Social Housing that's seen significant bill reductions for people in social housing. But Synergy continues to work hard uh, through the Keeping Connected program, which is, which is in-person outreach to uh, their customers. You'll see that Synergy is now advertising, inviting customers uh, that are having trouble with their bill to speak directly to Synergy so that rather than the first problem being getting a bill they can't handle, that, they, that they're actually in, inbound to Synergy to get help uh, from a range of uh, assistance that Synergy can provide. Synergy has been working with financial counsellors and they've created an online portal, which is a really major reform. It allows the uh, 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 financial counsellors to see exactly what's happening with the Synergy uh, billing system. It's led to the Financial Counsellors Association writing to me to congratulate Synergy on the work they're doing to work with financial counsellors to help people in hardship. We've seen the, the government uh, fund additional case managers uh, into, uh, into Synergy starting in July last year. They've got seven of the 11 dedicated managers on board already and we're already seeing excellent results. They've worked with the 1,600 people in most hardship and we've seen 430 of those, over a quarter of them, already graduate, at, graduate so that they can now support themselves without needing additional assistance. And we've also seen them focus, Synergy focus on family violence. And we know that one of the problems that many people in hardship have is that they're the victims of domestic violence and that they've been subject to coercive control and they're being left with debts. So I'm very proud of the work that Synergy's doing there to help people uh, in, in that terrible situation that are suffering from family violence. But the member asks who are not supporting this action. Well, I was very surprised on Friday to hear that the member for Cottesloe doesn't support this action. The member for Cottesloe went on radio and said it was shocking. It was shocking that the Labor government is working with Synergy to do all these things. And that he said it was shocking that we weren't sending in the debt collectors, that we weren't just taking a, a financial approach to this, that we're actually working with customers to make sure that their life can handle the situation that they're in. Because we care for people in that situation. I don't go on radio saying it's shocking that the no debt collectors are being sent out uh, to, the, uh, to the people of this state. And it's no wonder that that's the attitude of the member for Cottesloe, because in the last time the Liberals in government, disconnections went up by 86.2%. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Communities. 
Minister, I refer to local support service providers in the South West reporting there are approximately 100 pregnant women without a fixed address and a, a recent significant spike in demand for newborn packs for homeless mothers. And I ask, one, can you guarantee that women giving birth at local hospitals can you guarantee that women giving birth at local hospitals and their newborns will be supported and provided with suitable and stable accommodation? And two, is there any risk mothers who do not have a fixed address at discharge would be separated from their children? The Minister for Community Services. Um, Madam Speaker, um, I actually haven't heard that uh, information that the member is referring to, and I would have appreciated um, her bringing that to the attention of my office before raising it in this place. Uh, it, is not, it is not my understanding ever that um, children are taken into the care of child protection um, simply because there's no accommodation available uh, for the mother. In fact, um, everything is done to make sure that uh, people who, um, who need emergency accommodation are given emergency accommodation. And if there are any um, concerns about what would happen once a, uh, um, someone who's facing a range of, of difficulties, whether that's domestic violence, mental health, drug and alcohol issues, whatever they are, um, uh, housing insecurity, that those issues are dealt with before the baby's born. Uh, and um, supports are given to that family. And in fact, we've put a record amount of investment in early intervention um, assistance for families to ensure that children don't come into um, the, the child protection system. So uh, to answer your question, I'm not aware of, of the circumstances that you're talking about. We're well aware that there are housing pressures um, throughout the state and uh, in, re in regard to um, the amount of the demands on private rentals as well as the public system. However, I do also note that there has been record building approvals, and the Premier talked about this in question time last week. I think over 80 per cent of building uh, approval increase uh, in, um, I think, last year. So there are significant building approvals, and there's been quite a bit of commentary that once those buildings uh, are built and, um, and people are able to move into them, then that will then in turn take pressure of private rentals and into the public system. Uh, and of course, we've had significant uh, investment by this government into um, public and uh, social housing as well. Uh, I would urge any uh, either um, individuals, families, community members or their representatives, if they know that of people that are in that sort of hardship to get involved with services or the Department of Communities, um, because uh, it certainly should not be the case that, um, that there are, uh, are risks to keeping uh, families together because of homelessness or the threats of homelessness. Supplementary. The Leader of the Opposition with a supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Uh, 100 women without an address is seriously concerning. Is there a specific program that government offers? Is there a, is there a specific program or support service that women can uh, access, given their vulnerability as they go into hospital, potentially with the risk of losing their child? The Minister for Community Services. Um, I do note that the member hasn't referred to the authority for the information that she's giving to us today, so I would her urge her to have given um, to, to come to either the Department of Community or th through my office to give that information so that we can give proper support uh, to those uh, women uh, and their families uh, as required. Um, I, I, it's important to note that there are extensive services that are available for people throughout the state, and that includes in regional, in regional areas, uh, whether um, those women are um, pregnant, whether they've got children or not. Uh, quite a lot of work is done to ensure that there's stable accommodation and, importantly, proper supports. And in fact, with the Department of Communities, we're best placed to do that now, knowing that child protection services, as well as the Department of Housing, um, that gives support uh, for people who are in public housing or, or looking for public housing, are, are placed together um, to give support to those. Uh, to those people. So, um, both through the Department of Communities and the Department of Health, I'm surprised that you talk about those numbers, and I would urge you to seek for those people to get in touch uh, with the Department of Communities, District 
offices or for you to give me some of that detail through my office so that we can deal with those issues a bit more uh, constructively uh, than in the parliament sure. here. Speaker. The member for Southern River. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, before I uh, ask my question, I'd like to acknowledge the students of Canningvale College in the public gallery on behalf of myself and also the member for, member for Jandicott. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Seniors and Ageing. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's commitment to continuing Labor's strong record for supporting our seniors, including the introduction of the WA Seniors Card by the doubting Labor government 33 years ago. And I ask, can the Minister update the House on how the McGowan Labor government is helping ease the financial strain on seniors card holders, particularly those who are, play, who are facing financial challenges as a result of COVID-19? The, the Minister for Seniors I and Ageing. I certainly can. And I'd like to thank the member for Southern River for his question and also acknowledge the tireless work he does in connecting with his community and in particular bringing forward the issues that seniors face in his community. So I thank you. Now, the McGowan government is a champion for seniors in Western Australia. And the WA Seniors Card program was brought into being by a great Labor Minister, the Honourable Kay Hallahan, in 1988. Here, here. And it was a first, a first in programme of its kind in Australia, and it was subsequently taken up right throughout Australia. And that just goes to show what a great and innovative initiative it is. The WA programme provides seniors across the state with access to on average $650 annually in total value for state government concessions, and more if they hold a Commonwealth Seniors Health Card or Pensioner Concession Card. In July 2021, more than 312,000 West Australian Seniors Card members received the cost of living rebate, in total approximately $25.5 million. Singles will receive $93.12, and couples will receive $139.64. The WA Seniors Card Program also provides members access to over 900 business discounts, and I know those are in great demand, and they offer great savings every day, assisting seniors with the cost of living. And what's more, Madam Speaker, the McGowan Government will soon be reintroducing the safety and security rebate, and that will allow WA Seniors Card members to claim up to $400 per household to go towards installing or buying home safety or security devices. Now these, these concessions, Madam Speaker, are be, uh, were able to deliver those because of the strong and responsible budget management of the McGowan Labor Government. And I know they're going to be very well received by our seniors community. Thank you. The Leader of the Opposition with the last question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. Minister, I refer to the State Government's Quarantine Advisory Panel and I ask, one, how many times has the Quarantine Advisory Panel met since its formation? Two, will you table the minutes of these meetings? And three, if not, why not? The Minister for Health. Madam Speaker, I don't have the answer to that. The uh, Quarantine Advisory Panel is actually formed under the Department of Premier and Cabinet. Obviously, uh, they are meeting on an ongoing basis. I've had a meeting with the Chair, so I know they are meeting and considering um, items. And um, I spoke with the, the Director General of Health yesterday, who I think has a meeting with them today. So if that provides you an idea of the level of, of, of activity. Uh, but beyond that, Madam Speaker, I don't have any other details. Supplementary. Uh, supplementary. Thank you. Minister, can you confirm that all 16 recommendations of the Wiramanthri report, of which the formation of this panel was one, have actually been implemented? I would suggest that you're vastly expanding your original question with that. It's not really a supplementary, but I'll allow the Minister to respond uh, on I don't occasion. have any more details to provide the Chamber, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Uh, are there any petitions? If not, uh, papers, papers for. Sorry, you've got a petition? So, the Attorney General. Uh, to, uh, to the Speaker and members of the Legislative Assembly of the Parliament of Western Australia assembled, we, the undersigned, the LGBTQIA plus students in WA public schools are not receiving the protections to which we are entitled under law and instead suffering from a culture that enables and perpetuates homophobia, transphobia. Currently, students in the LGBTQIA 
IQA plus community are being consistently demeaned and stigmatised by their peers through actions such as referring to particular behaviours as gay, mimicking typical gay behaviour and attitudes with the incentive to cause offence. As a direct result from this, the LGBTQIA plus students are being substantially affected with some, some of these harms being having a feeling of shame, a rise in <clears throat> sleep disturbance, experience of social isolation, having low self-esteem, school avoidance, a loss in mental stability and having to stay hidden in the closet. The Western Australian Equal Opportunity Act, which has the key objective to promote recognition and acceptance within the community regarding equality of all persons regardless of their sexual orientation, does not outline what is classified as intolerable student conduct. Despite the Act covering how LGBTIQA plus individuals should be treated in schools by school administrators, there is nothing, nothing stating how students should treat each other. Now, we ask the Legislative Assembly of Western Australia to take action on A, legislation to protect the LGBTIQA plus students from discrimination in our public schools and, and by other students. B, acknowledge that LGBTIQA plus students need special protection under law. C, immediately investigate why this issue is still evolving despite society's shift in values and attitudes towards LGBTIQA plus acceptance. Additionally, will you integrate and update the current 2018 version of the Equal Opportunity Act to address A, it is lawful for students, it is unlawful for students to bully, intimidate or discriminate an individual because of their sexual orientation. B, it is unlawful for students to use offensive slurs with the incentive to cause harm and offence to that individual. Otherwise, the state government to produce a new act to address these matters, the total number of signatures being 91 students. The petition is tabled. <coughs> uh, papers for tabling. The following paper is pre presented for tabling. Local laws in relation to the Local Government Act 1995. Uh, giving notices of motion. The Attorney General. Madam Speaker, I give notice the Criminal Appeals Amendment Bill 2021. I give notice that on the next day of sitting I will move that a bill for an act to amend the Criminal Appeals Act 2004 to introduce rights of further appeal against conviction and to make consequential, consequential amendments to the Bail Act 1982 and the Criminal Procedure Act 2004 and the Fines, Penalties, Infringement Notices Enforcement Act 1984 and the Supreme Court Act 1935 be introduced and read a first time. Madam. The question is, it will be read a first time? Those... Oh, sorry, it's just a notice of motion, yes. The, Member for North West Central. Thank you, Madam Speaker, I give uh, notice of motion uh, that on the next sitting day I will move that this House condemns the Labor Government for its failure to prioritise the housing in the last five years of government, creating a housing crisis in this uh, in the state. Sorry, create a housing crisis the state has never seen before, triggering a significant economic and social consequences. Any further notices of motion? If not, I have a message uh, from the Legislative uh, Council. Madam Speaker, the Legislative Council acquaints the Legislative Assembly that it has agreed to the Metropolitan Region Scheme Bill Yet Wetlands Bill 2021 without amendment on Alana Clossy. Members, uh, members uh, today I received within the prescribed time a letter from the leader of the Liberal Party in the following terms. Uh, matter of public interest, I wish to move the following as a matter of public interest today, that this House condemns the Labor government's inability to acknowledge the ongoing and deeply devastating health crisis and its impacts upon, impacts upon West Australians. Uh, yours sincerely, uh, Dr David Honey, MLA, leader of the WA Liberals. Uh, the matter appears to me to be in order, and if there are at least five members who will stand in support of the matter being discussed, and there are, um, the matter can proceed. Uh, the Leader of the Liberal Party. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Um, 
you know, it's, it's interesting, isn't it, members? We sort of go back to last week and there wasn't a health crisis. The, sorry, Leader. I'll, I'll read the motion. I apologise. If you could move the motion, that I would will. be great. Thank you. I was almost off in flight there. Thank you very much for, right, thank you. for bringing me back to the important task of reading the actual motion. The motion is, Madam Speaker, um, that... The, that this House condemns the Labor government's inability to acknowledge the ongoing and deeply devastating health crisis and, it in, and its impacts on Western, upon so Western Australia. So you've moved that motion, yes? Thank you very much. Uh, now, um, as I say, isn't it interesting, members, I mean, how things change in a week? They say a day's a long time in politics. Well, you know, a few days over the weekend is certainly a long time in politics because last week we didn't have a health crisis. Um, in this place, and then all of a sudden, over the weekend, we see $1.9 billion uh, mysteriously appear to be uh, to get out of the crisis. And I was pointing out last week when we discussed this, when we discussed this matter, that uh, it seemed that the Minister for Transport had the magic key when it came to getting money out of the Treasurer um, for the uh, enormous blowout in the Metronet project. And uh, you know, I did suggest that uh, perhaps the Minister for Health could take some uh, hints. And, and obviously, the Minister for Health has. I, I imagine he's gone and asked. I imagine, I imagine the Minister for Health has, has said, "Look, uh, Minister, look, Minister for Transport, what's the magic? Because I'm just not getting any traction to get the support I need." So, look, good on the Minister for Health. I think you know, admitting that it is a crisis and and putting your hand up and and seeking the uh, seeking the support from your. Uh, your colleagues um, for this is a, is a good thing and we welcome that recognition that this is a health crisis. Um, but the, the problem is the reason we're here, and, and I don't think we're going to see anything different going forward, to be quite frank, um, is the mismanagement of this portfolio under a part-time health minister. And I don't blame the minister for that, uh, in the sense that the Premier has given him a whole range of portfolios. And uh, we have said for some time that that is going to be uh, a real problem, because it's going to be very hard for this minister to focus on the matters that need being dealt with. And, and what we've seen is it's taken four and a half half years for this government to recognise that there's a health crisis, despite on this side uh, us repeatedly telling the government there's a problem and that there are major problems uh, in the health system. Now, I would um, especially at this point like to recognise the excellent work done by the, uh, health, the, uh, the opposition's health spokesperson, Libby Metham, uh, and for all the work she and my parliamentary colleagues have been shining on this matter, um, and I hope that has actually given some assistance to the Minister for Health to get his support, because finally, finally the Treasurer has realised, hang on, there is a crisis, and of course it's a crisis that no one could ignore, because everyone I speak to who goes to hospitals, everyone I speak to who goes into hospitals tells me about it. They tell me about the stress the staff are under, they tell me about the time they have to wait uh, to get ser uh, services, and I'd also like to to uh, thank the AMA and the Australian Nursing Federation. I assume they have the minister on speed dial and their button's just about worn out um, because uh, they are doing the excellent job of representing our healthcare workers uh, in this state and making and, and recognising just the enormous mental stress and physical stress that those uh, members are under trying to provide the good service to the people of Western Australia. And sometimes the government tries to sort of make out uh, on this side that somehow we're critical of those healthcare workers. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, truth. We have deep empathy for what those healthcare workers are going through because of the inaction of this government. The, uh, if we uh, uh, look at the um, recognition, we look at the, you know, the, the sort of treating this health crisis as a political issue. So, so all of a sudden we hear that there's a great bucket of money. So we see the media statement, there's a $1.9 billion boost. Um, uh, then we're going to have 332 extra beds um, uh, and so on. And, and I'll go through that. Uh, the 332 new beds comprising 223 general beds and 109 mental health beds and so on. And it goes on to talk about um, delivery of various uh, services and investments uh, in, in this particular area. Um, now, I want to go into that in a little bit uh, of detail because it sounds like um, there's a, a significant investment. Now, we don't know exactly how much of this is new funding because, like all announcements by this government in relation to funding, what we see is that it wraps in old commitments with new commitments and then it's all presented as a new commitment. So we're not actually sure whether it is 1.9 billion of additional funding or whether it's 
some new funding and old funding uh, wrapped in, but we've got a hint that a bit of it's old funding. Um, now, the, the, the immediate announcement exposes itself um, as smoke and mirrors. So if we look at the, the release, it says funding for 332 extra beds uh, and more frontline staff at WA hospitals. Now, you would assume, members, that that's 332 on top of whatever the government's already planned to do, 332 beds on top of what the government's already planned to do beds. So, you know, we would welcome that, those more beds. They're desperately needed. It's quite clear that the hospitals are massively overstretched. But what do we see? Um, uh, we, uh, uh, it goes through. So the government's announced that. Um, now, what do we actually see um, um, when we go into the detail? But in fact, it turns out that 158 of those beds have already been committed. 158 of those beds have already commi been committed. So this is an, an old announcement. So it's not 332 uh, uh, new beds. Uh, it's it's uh, it's uh, almost 160 beds uh, fewer than that. So it, it's not 332 new beds. So what, why spin it? Why not just say you're putting in this number of extra beds? Why go in there and spin it as if you're putting in 332 new beds on top of former commitments? Um, and that 1.9 billion is a new commitment because, as I say, if that money was well spent, we would say that's probably appropriate by this government. Um, but in fact, uh, it, it's an old announcement. Now, we also see that Labor's being um, deliberately opaque on the timing of the implementation of these measures. Now, we can't wait four years for this crisis to be solved. Um, we've seen that for three to four per cent increase in demand for services year on year, uh, that, that uh, there seems to be some desire to deny that that's the case. Um, but we've seen that uh, going on and on. We need a solution now. We've got a system that is massively overstretched. Um, now, the Minister's um, promised the uh, 1,000 nurses back in the 14th of April, and, and we see the announcement then back in the 14th of April, um, and, uh, uh, and it goes through and talks about the 1,000 new qualified nurses joining the health system uh, this year, and uh, the Minister has outlined today, he says that the government is well on track uh, to do that. Interesting to see what the net increase is, but uh, the Minister said again he's given a detailed press conference today uh, outlining all of that. So we'll look at that and just see what that represents in terms of, uh, in terms of increasing staff uh, into the hospital system. Um, but um, if, we, uh, if we go a little bit um, further down, it, it's talking about an extra 200 newly qualified nurses are in addition to the McGowan government's election commitment. So in April, um, it, it, we saw this announcement come out. At the election, the government said there was no problem, no health crisis. In April, they're already admitting that there's a crisis. Uh, and then we see, uh, coming up to now, the admission that, in fact, there's an even greater crisis, a $1.9 billion crisis uh, in the health system. Now, we've seen that, um, we've seen that uh, the minister has now said we're going to have an advertising blitz. So the, the minister stood up here and claimed that he's undertaking a national and international advertising blitz. Now, just like the broader health, uh, uh, health announcements, it's a campaign that sort of sounds very glitzy, uh, glitzy big on detail, uh, uh, big on promise, I should say, but extremely light on detail. Now, no one has seen the advertising blitz. Now, the ANF um, certainly are querying why they haven't seen it. If we're out there, we're advertising, we're fighting for nurses internationally, why haven't we seen that advertising blitz? But in fact, we haven't seen that advertising blitz. Now, the, um, uh, and we, we see that the minister can't even tell us how many nurses have come in from overseas on this. Now, in our health system here, we know that the reality is, let, let's take this back in a little bit of logic, members. We knew uh, a year ago that there were shortages in the hospitals. So when we talk about getting these extra nurses, the government couldn't even fill current vacancies. They couldn't even fill current vacancies uh, in the hospitals. Uh, and we know that the health system in Western Australia has always critically depended on a steady stream of doctors, nurses and other health professionals coming from overseas. Um, and yet, what we, the minister can't even tell us how many medical professions we're getting in from overseas. Now, we know it's a competition for talent, but the truth is Australia and Western Australia is a highly desirable location for people all over the world. So surely it can't be on the wits, can't be beyond the wits of this government uh, to have already brought people in, and we should know what that is, because to be quite frank, 
I believe that there have been efforts to do that, unsuccessful. I have no faith whatsoever that this minister is going to deliver in the future uh, in, terms of those, uh, in terms of those additional uh, recruitment exercises. We don't have the details. What country are we advertising in? How much money is being spent uh, in the campaign? How many nurses do we expect to recruit? So what's the target for overseas recruitment? Because we cannot fill all of those places. It's all right saying you're getting graduate nurses in, but you all know, or any one of you that have been involved in the health industry knows, that in fact graduate nurses in their first year or so consume resources of the hospital. One of the problems in the hospital has been that the staff in the hospital uh, are in fact have been taken off training uh, and because they can't afford the time to train the new uh, nursing staff that are coming into the hospital. So uh, those, ones are, those new nurses in the longer term will help. Maybe in four years they'll be extremely helpful in our medical system. But right now we need experienced additional nurses in the health system. Uh, and we're not seeing any detail on what those targets are. Um, we don't, uh, we don't and, and the Minister did give a little bit of detail today saying that they were going to bring in these nurses, they were going to be above the cap. I'm interested to know the details of that minister, and that is how many nurses are we going to bring in above the cap? I might say, just as a little aside on this, we heard on the weekend, any of you that watch Landline, the dire straits that farmers in this state are going to be in um, come the next harvest because they simply do not have the labour coming in. If it can be done for nurses, why can't this be done for other professions as well, other critical needs in this state? But that is a, an aside. Why can't we see that? But I'm glad to see that and I'm glad to see it's above the cap, Minister, because that certainly answered some questions that we had on this, uh, this side of the House. What are we going to do when we bring those nurses in? Where are they going to be housed? How are we going to have accommodation for them? Because we know the other thing we have in parallel with the health crisis in this state is a housing crisis in this state. And that is that when people are trying to get workers in, there's nowhere for them to live. So has the, has the health minister, I understand if you've got current people uh, living in the state, trainees coming up, but when we're bringing in new nurses and new doctors from overseas uh, and from interstate, do we have any plan whatsoever for housing them? Um, I know in regional communities they have not been able to get workers into those communities because they simply do not have anywhere for them to live. And can I say that includes police and nurses. In Geraldton, I understand um, that in fact the government's availing itself of Airbnb to try and house government workers. So that has to be dealt with uh, in parallel if we're going to see a real solution um, to this particular problem. I do want to go on to the issue of the nurses um, being used in the, the COVID vaccinations. Um, I uh, am stunned by the Minister's question today uh, on that. Um, I, I know that there are a number of members in this place that actually do care about mental health is issues in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this community. But what we heard was is that we've seen in about a year a trebling of the most severe presentations uh, in schools uh, for students suffering mental health problems. And can I say that overwhelmingly uh, young women um, uh, are affected about twice the rate as, as, of young men. And any of you that have been to the schools will know that self-harm um, is one of the major factors uh, that presents itself uh, in, in terms of a response to those mental health issues with those students. How can you take a school nurse out of the school? Because the school nurses are the ones that see those students. The school nurses are the ones that see those students with injuries. The school nurses are the ones um, who are going to be the canary in the cage reporting that issue and dealing with that issue. Those nurses are not just some ancillary. It's not just the school psychologist or the school counsellor or the school chaplain. They may deal with part of it. But in fact, it's the school nurses, those highly trained medical professions that identify those key issues and then can refer those students. I find it, I really do find it incomprehensible, given offensive. the enormous, it, it is offensive, given the enormous crisis we have in schools right across this state. We can all hypothesise about what we think the cause is, whether we think it's COVID or whether we think it's something else. But those frontline staff that are dealing um, with those students, the front line of dealing with the mental health of those students, um, that this minister would think, no, no, we'll pull them out. Our solution is to pull them out of the schools uh, and, and, and put them into the, into the, into the COVID vaccination centres. Now, the truth is, if you want a priority, that mental health crisis is today. Today. Today, there are kids in those schools who are suffering this enormous anguish and, and undertaking self-harm 
they need treatment today. Yes, we think you should accelerate the, the, the uh, vaccination program. I'd, I'd be very, very surprised if other states have pulled their nurses out of schools. And Western Australia is an absolute laggard in vaccinations. Uh, I think that, that this is a, should be a matter of shame for this government. And as I say, I was shocked by the answer um, that the health minister gave today in question time. Thank you, Member. Uh, Deputy Leader of the Opposition. This excellent motion brought to the House by the Leader of the Liberal Party uh, and uh, called on the House to recognise the Labor government's inability to acknowledge the ongoing and deeply devastating health crisis. And nowhere is that health crisis more evident than in we see the uh, level of ambulance uh, ramping in our hospital system. It's emblematic of the uh, of the entire crisis and we're up to 5,000 hours in, in a month of ramping is, uh, is a shocking uh, number and a shocking statistic to see. We know that the, uh, the Minister has uh, responded to this through, uh, uh, through the, uh, the member of uh, the other place who's brought about the inquiry into St John Ambulance. Uh, now instead of actually looking at the reasons for the ambulance ramping, it appears that Labor wants to have a go at St John's themselves. Uh, we've raised this as a matter of concern before because we know how important St John Ambulance is to the community that we represent uh, right throughout Western Australia, uh, both within the city and within the country areas. Everybody knows that the issue of ambulance ramping is not down to St John's, it's a mismanagement of the health system. But instead we see this misguided approach by the Minister to ensure that St John's themselves come under some sort of a review uh, led by the Public Administrations Committee under the Hon. Pierre Yang. You really think this was so bizarre and so uh, abnormal if it hadn't actually already happened before in the past. Now we know that uh, back in 2008, uh, this report from the ABC, opposition wants to retain St John. Well, the opposition then were Liberal National uh, members and they were looking to stop uh, St John's being stripped out because uh, the Australian Liquor, Hospitality and Miscellaneous Union were quite happy to see uh, the government uh, looking at the situation with St John's, they were urging uh, back in 2008 for St John's to be taken over by uh, that service to be taken over by the government. And in fact, the opposition's health spokesperson uh, then, Kim Haynes, said the proposal had not worked in other states and should not be introduced in Western Australia. Uh, and he goes on to say that uh, his understanding is it being far less than successful in other states, uh, ended up with services were less efficient than we already had. He's concerned that any change would result in less efficient and more expensive service. The problem is not St John's ambulance service, but Jim McGinty and his mismanagement of emergency departments, so that ambulances are ramped for hours at a time. Well, that was said long before we saw 5,000 hours of ramping that we see at the moment. But we know that attacking St John's uh, seems to be in the DNA of this party, just as uh, we know that attacking uh, electoral representation uh, for regional people is in the DNA of this party. And similarly, uh, we see a process now being launched uh, for uh, reform in that area, uh, even though there isn't a problem to be addressed in terms of, um, of a misallocation of uh, representation between the city and the bush. Uh, the government's doing its best to make a problem, uh, to publicise that there is a problem, and then go out there and find its own solution, which was its existing policy before the election, just as it's doing with St John's here. A long-held desire, apparently, from the union movement uh, to see St John's uh, nationalised uh, may well come to fruition as part of this, uh, uh, this review and the, under the, uh, the overwhelming, the overwhelming uh, majority that this government has in, uh, in both houses of parliament allowing it to achieve that long-held uh, long uh, desire uh, to rid itself of, uh, of regional members of uh, parliament and to rid itself of St John Ambulance. Uh, it's a disgrace that it even be contemplated at a time when we have already got a crisis in our health system. I want to turn very quickly to uh, another matter, um, and that is the breach of uh, protocol that took place on uh, two vessels uh, recently, the first one being uh, in Geraldton, uh, where a person had uh, COVID uh, and was taken to the Geraldton Hospital. We have uh, spoken before about the series of events that led to alarm and concern in the Geraldton community, uh, and that there had subsequently been a uh, report done. Uh, last week in uh, private members business, uh, we had a motion uh, on the health situation, and I asked them for the health minister and his response to that uh, 
to that uh, to that motion, uh, if he would uh, outline to us when that report would be made available, uh, and, uh, and when it would be completed, in fact, and when it would be made available, so that we could all see what actually went wrong uh, when that whole. Uh, uh, hospital was badly impacted and 50 odd people had to be uh, put into uh, a level of isolation for some time, uh, a great deal of concern in the community and then we found only a few weeks later exactly the same thing happening in uh, Fiona Stanley. Uh, and instead of getting an answer from the Minister uh, as to why um, we had not seen that report and when we would see that report, if we would see that report, uh, no answer was given because the Minister failed to respond to the motion. He sat there throughout the whole motion, he took notes, and then he set a whole coterie of backbenchers to stand up and talk about unrelated matters. I'm sure that they had very interesting topics, so very interesting things they wanted to talk about, but none of it was actually responding to the very uh, uh, cogent arguments put by the uh, opposition. Uh, and instead of that, we saw a minister who chose to hide behind his backbench. And I thought that was uh, quite unprecedented. I've never seen that before, where uh, you sit here, usually the minister sits through the uh, the, um, the outline, the case that the, the opposition puts forward, and the minister chooses to respond. We now come to the point where the minister doesn't even respond. He just sits there and lets others stand up for him and, uh, and, take, and make the response instead of himself. I, I think that's disgraceful, and uh, I asked some very relevant questions about Geraldton. I asked questions about the situation for regional people who are, um, are looking for their second dose of a vaccine and then find that their local health centre has cancelled the appointments. Now, we know that there is a certain degree of time uh, critical uh, criticality around getting a, the appropriate uh, time to get your, uh, your dose uh, for that second jab. And so, in some circumstances, I've been made aware that they've actually had to drive to Perth uh, several hours of travel um, to ensure that they can actually get the jab at the appropriate time. I asked the minister uh, about that, and again, there was no response. He just sat there and refused to respond. And, uh, and so we're none the wiser uh, as to, uh, to any of those issues, what happened in Geraldton. Uh, and why is that so important? Well, not only because it threatens the health of the staff in the hospital, not only because it threatens the health of the community in the, in the city of Geraldton and in the case of Fiona Stanley in the, uh, in the uh, wider metropolitan area here, uh, but it also threatens uh, the, um, the commerce between our state uh, and the rest of the world. And we've since seen uh, this government put out a notice to uh, shippers uh, about a range of procedures that they uh, expect uh, from what are known as uh, uh, high-risk ports or high-risk countries. Uh, and, uh, and the response from the government is actually, in a way, threatening the trade uh, of it, on which we all rely. And, uh, and it's led to a knee-joke reaction last week of an announcement uh, for a particular country, Indonesia, of, of $2 million in assistance. Because I think you know that you went too far uh, and that you were actually uh, damaging uh, the trade of our country going forward uh, because of your inability to handle a couple of cases of COVID which had appeared uh, in the ports. I'm told by shippers that you can have plenty of um, processes put in place where there is zero contact uh, between the, uh, the ship uh, and any persons uh, that would lead to any risk of, uh, of COVID coming to the community. Instead of um, looking at your protocols, instead of looking at your failings, you've chosen to blame the shippers and to try to uh, put the, uh, the heat back on an industry which is already struggling to get uh, vessels over here uh, because there is a shortage of shipping right around the world. And, uh, and if you have a government which is uh, not clear about how it's going to treat uh, industry and treat those ships when they come here, they'll choose to go elsewhere and we won't be able to get our product uh, overseas. And then we'll see uh, that the, uh, the government's failings have gone far beyond uh, simply their inability to run a health system. Thank you, Member. Deputy Speaker. Leader of the Opposition. Uh, I rise to support this uh, very good motion moved by the Leader of the Liberal Party. Uh, and I do, hope that the, I do hope that the Minister is going to stand and respond today because, as the Deputy Leader of the Opposition has pointed out, it was quite extraordinary last week where we brought a debate of quite 
uh, significant issues in relation to the state of our health system, and the minister did not choose to stand. Now that's either arrogance or he's uh, simply had no answers. And, and what we've uh, what we've discovered is that he was waiting, I suspect, for a good news a good news opportunity. Uh, and over the weekend, we've seen we've seen a big headline. We've seen some dollars, some much need much needed dollars put back into the health system. But it's it's uh, almost too little, too late, Minister. Almost too little, too late. You are now mopping up four and a half years of neglect. Four and a half years of neglect. So I truly hope that you're going to stand up and respond to this debate and not avoid uh, some of those questions. Because like the Deputy Leader of Opposition, I asked questions last week during that debate around recruitment, which we asked again today. Uh, we asked questions around how they were going to be recruited, where they were going to be recruited from in terms of nurses uh, and other staff. And there were no answers provided because you didn't stand up. You didn't stand up and answer those questions, as you have a responsibility to do as the Minister for Health. So for months and months, this government has been blaming the influx of people going through our ED doors for the, the crisis that we see happening in our, uh, in our health system. But the figures don't lie. And uh, I, I would suggest neither does the AMA president of Western Australia, the Australian Medical Association. Now, he was on record yesterday as saying absolutely no massive increase in demand on the health system. The figures that we uh, are referring to come directly from the Department of Health in, re in reference to uh, those uh, people walking through the uh, emergency department. There has been a steady increase of 3 to 4 per cent year on year in, in ED presentations, mental health presentations, uh, 3 per cent increase over four years. Ramping has gone up 300 per cent. Now that is a summary of the commentary that the AMA president of Western Australia gave yesterday in response to uh, the information that was provided around the, the funding announcement from the government. The bit that goes to the heart of what we as the opposition have been raising in this House every day the parliament sits is this comment. Neglect and underfunding by ALP, the Australian Labor Party state government, is to blame. They are to blame. Yeah. They are to blame. So they can deflect as much as they like, but all the key stakeholders in this industry, all the key people that are impacted, are suggesting that the reason that we have this rescue package on, on, on the deck right now is because this government has failed the people of Western Australia for the last four and a half years. This minister has been asleep at the wheel. Asleep at the wheel. Uh, he, goes on, he went on to make some other comments around WA, the only workforce without job security for senior doctors, and suggested that there wasn't a possibility of getting 100 more doctors if they didn't have job security. He mentioned that there was a severe shortage of child psychiatrists in particular, and I'd be very interested from the Minister's perspective as to how we will uh, address those issues, given the increase or the, uh, the suggestion that there has been a significant increase in mental health pres presentations. And, uh, and I think, uh, to go back a little bit, and talk about some of the uh, the presentations over the last six months into our emergency departments. Uh, average presentations over the last six months of 2019, pre-COVID, uh, pre-COVID Deputy Speaker, 80,400 people. Average presentations the first six months of 2021, uh, 81,000. 200, 81,200. It's not a significant difference. And the graph that we've got shows that they are, they have been increasing in a predictable manner, a predictable manner that should have been able to be planned for by this government. So great to have the big announcement, extra funding and services, but the devil will be in the detail. The devil will be in the detail. And where exactly are they going to get them from? And when can we expect them on our doorstep? I don't think the AMA believes you can do it. I know the Nurses Federation have serious concerns about how you're going to achieve that outcome. And certainly the opposition has hasn't heard any detail today that gives us confidence we're going to see any uh, end to the crisis that we're experiencing uh, uh, today and into the near future. Now, in particular, midwives have been a significant problem, and we've seen, I think the numbers are, let me go, 40, a loss of 40 midwives over the last four, uh, over the past year. We had 1,191 midwives in the first quarter of 2020-21, and just 1,151 in the last quarter to June. Now, with 6,200 bubs forecast for delivery at Kate, uh, King Edward Memorial Hospital alone, that's up from 5,800 in 2020. That is of serious concern. And the Minister will remember that uh, from a regional perspective, we raised quite some time ago, uh, 2019 I think, uh, some innovative solutions from the Geraldton University Centre, some other industry-led uh, solutions to try and get more midwives into Western Australia. And the Minister couldn't make it happen. There was no will. There was no will. So 
those red flags that the opposition keeps talking about, those code yellows, those ramping figures that have been occurring for the last four years, uh, the solutions that have been put forward by industry to train more staff, all been left to the last minute so that this government can sail in and provide a big chunk of money with no detail, it's absolutely not good enough. Failing the people of Western Australia, failing the people that are working in that system, and uh, I, can, I can absolutely guarantee, absolutely guarantee that the words of the Australian Medical Association's uh, president, uh, Mr Mark Duncan, that the neglect and underfunding comes from the Australian Labor Party state government is to blame. They are to blame. Nothing to do with the people coming through our emergency department. Cannot deflect to COVID. It is simply not true. And I hope the minister stands up. I hope the minister stands up in this debate and provides a response. Thank you, thank you, Acting Speaker. Well, my friend, you're no chip off the block, I can tell you that much. If I could be compared to Jim McGinty, I certainly wouldn't compare you to the Honourable Nick Catania. You are a disgrace to the name Catania. You really are. And I must, I must think at times that your family watches your political career and just shakes their head in disappointment, betraying such a great family name with such a disreputable uh, act of conduct. Oh, I'm coming to you, Sunshine. Don't you worry about that. There is, there is no point of order. Carry on, uh, carry on, Minister. Well, and Member Farrar, I didn't get up last time because you ran an MPI last week where you had the same arguments you ran today. Then you ran the same arguments for three hours during private members' business. And so what did I do? I referred you back to my arguments in the MPI last week. I mean, quite, and, and quite frankly, um, I, th I think the other members of parliament had your measure anyway. Had your measure. Members. Uh, I think the member for Coburn uh, mopped the floor with, with, with your arguments, and it was, um, it was a delight to see. Um, and, uh, but we will, we will entertain the same arguments that you put up. Uh, Leader of the Opposition, you come in this place uh, uh, peddling the same Liberal Party lies about the ED presentations, and, um, and that's disappointing. I thought, I thought you would do... I thought you would do your own your own homework, and um, and and I address that specific issue today in question time, and this is in part, acting speaker, uh, the frustrations that we have, and that um, we have said in this place on numerous occasions that there is a change in the way people are presenting to the EDs. They are presenting with greater acuity, and as, and they're presenting with more complex mental health issues. And I hear the man before uh, Cotteslow sighing, uh, which means that he's obviously listening to me. So maybe just for once this will sink in. Maybe this just for once will sink in. And that the fact of the matter is that, um, that we have had a significant increase in the uh, acuity of patients coming to, um, to our hospital EDs. Uh, a 10% increase in triage one, 15% increase in triage two, uh, the, and they're the people who are having a significant impact in terms of our, in terms of uh, the the, uh, the the EDs at the moment. But this is this isn't you know we're not all we're not orphans in this. We're not orphans in this. This is taking place right around Western Australia. I saw an interesting article in South Australia the other day where they um, where the paramedics there are putting people into taxis and sending them to GP clinics so that they don't go to the EDs. So such is the such is the the state of the pressure that they are under, uh, the, the, and you know this is um, this is being replicated elsewhere. What they not doing elsewhere is responding in the same way that the McGowan government is, which is being able to oversee significant investment, uh, significant investment in in their hospital system. And, um, and, and, this, and this is the reason why we say that the West Australian community should have confidence, and that's because they, they understand that we have a plan, a plan to increase supply and make sure that we can continue to, um, to invest in great health services so that we can continue to make sure that we provide world-class health care. The $1.9 billion that we announced the other day, uh, with the Premier announced the other day, uh, Acting Speaker, was a budget announcement. And yes, it does include the announcement that's already made, but that's the nature of budgets. 
they are a, it is a budget announcement. So it's a 332 bed increase. Um, and if uh, the member for Cottesloe had bothered Acting Speaker to read the press release, it says the 332 new beds comprise 20, 223 general beds, 109 mental health beds, with the budget including funding for 158 beds already announced. So we've been completely upfront. Page one of the press release, a public document, and one that we would hope the member for, for Cottesloe would read. We don't expect him to understand it. But we do expect him to read it, particularly if he's going to come into this place with the accusations that he's making. And um, I think it's important that members do, uh, that the community does understand the unprecedented level of investment that's going to our health system to make sure that we can respond to the current situation. And respond we are. I followed up with an announcement yesterday, um, Acting Speaker, that we are uh, obviously in significantly increasing the support that we are providing to, um, uh, to our uh, EDs, which, is, which includes a $50 million package to make sure that staff in our EDs have the support they need, which includes an investment around 50 new staff as part of the, uh, of the significant announcements we made at PCH, as well as funding for the virtual emergency management uh, program, which, is a, which provides an opportunity for, uh, for uh, paramedics to liaise with, with ED consultants to ensure that that, per that particular patient uh, ne necessarily comes to the ED. They may be diverted to an ambulatory care uh, facility. They may be diverted to a diagnostic or, or, or medical imaging facility. They may be referred directly to an inpatient facility. But this is what we do to continue to make sure that we manage the system in a dynamic way. And the member for Moore seems to think that we have some sort of uh, conspiracy uh, going on with regards to the tax to St John's Ambulance. I spent some, and, um, uh, and of course the CEO of St John's Ambulance was there with us yesterday to talk about the great partnership between the, the Gowan Labor government and St John's Ambulance. And it's, an, it's a relationship which continues to grow, both through our great work that we're doing with innovations in metropolitan ambulance services, but also through our country ambulance strategy, which will see a significant increase in the number of professional community uh, paramedics as part of our, I think it is uh, a 30, no, I won't, I won't, uh, mislead the House um, Acting Speaker with the number, but a significant increase in the number of professional paramedics practising in regional Western Australia. <laughs> what is, what, are you some sort of ambassador for the HR Nichols Society? <laughs> really, Member for Rowe? I mean, you can't say that the unions are taking over the ambulance service because their union members are already in the ambulance service. That's why they have an interest. That's why the same reason why the AMA, the doctors' union, has an interest in public health, because their members are there. The same reason why the nurses' union are interested in the public health system, because the nurse, their nurses' members are there. I'm not quite sure why you think there's some sort of takeover but they're already in the actual ambulance services and are keen to see those ambulance services thrive like any other union does that's involved in the public, in, in the public health system. Madam Speaker, we made some significant announcements this morning with regards to, um, to recruitment of, of nurses. Uh, that, that involves uh, both uh, celebrating the fact that we've recruited 750 new, uh, new experienced nurses either into or back into the, into the hospital system, that we've already recruited 927 nurse graduates as part of our 1,100 uh, uh, graduate nurse intake that we will, that we will uh, undertake this, week, this year, and as part of a program where we are seeking to try to recruit doctors and nurses from overseas. It hasn't started today because of the announcement. Today was another budget announcement, so we, this, it will be funded. It's been part of a program that's been ongoing. Member for, for, for Swan Hills, this is, this is getting really loud and difficult to compete against you. <laughs> but, um, Hang on, Minister. Members down the back, if you want to have a conversation, take it outside, thanks. <laughs> 
Carry on, Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Acting Speaker. Uh, but it is part of an ongoing recruitment program to make sure we've got quality doctors and nurses standing next to the patients, uh, particularly in the beds that we are expanding. So that includes, Acting Speaker, uh, 209 doctors that we've already secured the services of and are making their way to Western Australia right now and in the coming weeks to come and practise their craft in our hospitals to provide great care. Now, usually these, these doctors and nurses would come to Western Australia automatically, Acting Speaker, as part of, you know, UK and Irish uh, doctors and nurses, Indian doctors and nurses wanting to come to Western Australia as part of their experience, uh, uh, their professional experience. And they will continue to, um, but, uh, but because the borders are closed, we actually have to actively recruit and bring them into, uh, into Western Australia over and above the cap of, of, of returning Western Australians at any rate. So an important part of, of the program. And today we announced that we will pay for their hotel quarantine. We will also provide them with a relocation allowance because we want to make sure we bring them on board. In addition to that, we have refresher courses so that, so that nurses who are currently registered as nurses, but have been some time before they've been in the, in the wards acting speaker, will be able to undertake an online Line refresher course, which we will pay for, and then we will place them in a hospital as part of the completion of that refresher course in, in, paid, in paid employment. So a range, of, a range of measures that we are undertaking to make sure that we can meet the current spike of, of hospital demand. And I'm sorry if the statistics don't meet the opposition's narrative. Um, it's just unfortunate, but the fact of the matter remains that we are seeing a significant pressure on our hospitals. It's not because of a lack of resources. As I've already explained to this place on a number of occasions, we've increased hospital funding by 14 per cent in the time, since the time we've been in office. We had 34,700, uh, uh, I think it's 34,700 uh, uh, healthcare uh, health workers in Western Australia. That that figure is now at over 39,000. So you've seen a significant increase in the um, in the the resources to the hospital system. Again, doesn't meet the um, the AMA's or the uh, opposition's narrative, but it's the fact. I want to turn. Um, momentarily um, acting speaker to the issues raised by the member for Roe in question time and re-prosecuted as, as part of their debate today. Uh, School-based nurses do not undertake mental health care of, of, of kids. They might have referrals, they might, um, they might, be, uh, they might be, have those issues raised with them, but they will then refer them to a school psychologist. And, uh, and I'm very proud of our election commitment, which we are currently uh, implementing, which is bringing an extra 100 school-based nurses into our education system. A great initiative which will continue to make sure schools are a safe place for kids to come and to make sure that they can, get the, they can um, be cared for in that environment. Uh, in relation to the issues raised by the member for more, uh, the, there is an inquiry, a review in relation to the issues that took place at Geraldton Hospital. I think my response to you last week is the same as this week, is that you should put that question on notice. But, um, but, uh, but you know, when those, that information becomes available and um, the government's in a position to respond, I'm sure that that, that, that will be undertaken. But, I think the premise of the member for Moore's uh, um, comments was that we've done a bad job managing COVID, that somehow Western Australia hasn't managed the, the COVID threat very well. And I think the, dominate, the dominating narrative member for, for Moore is the precise antithesis of what you're trying to suggest. And that even though uh, no system is perfect in, re in relation to managing COVID, I think we've done a pretty good job. The people of Western Australia have been outstanding in relation to their response to COVID-19. And um, the Premier and I have been uh, fortunate enough to have the support of the people of Western Australia to provide, to, um, to have actually guided us through it. Not perfect, nothing's perfect. Nothing in healthcare is perfect. What is important is that you learn from the experiences of any clinical, any clinical situation and make sure that you continue to improve it. And, and, and we are. But, your, but this argument that somehow the whole system is broken because of one incident is, is just disgraceful, um, but is not unsurprising. We've seen the dangerous commentary today from Clive Palmer that vaccines are a, are a threat. 
and we know that Clive Palmer and, and we know that Clive Palmer is your friend. We know you jumped into bed with Clive Palmer as quickly as possible last year to undermine our strategy. We know that you're there. You're simply that you're that you're that you quietly enjoying Clive Palmer's narrative yeah. and Clive Palmer's efforts. Members. I tell you what's offensive, the member for Cottesloe, is the way that you scampered behind his coattails last year to try to tear down our borders. I tell you what is offensive, member for Cottesloe. Member for Cottesloe. It's you suggesting, it's you continuing, continuing to try to detract from our great efforts to to get rid of the COVID, to to respond to COVID-19 pandemic. But member for Cottesloe, I think the most damning effort of you over the last 72 hours has been your tweeting your little activity on Twitter to suggest that we haven't recruited as part of our 1,000 1, nurse graduate intake. And I'm very proud to say today that stands at 927. 927, and by the end of this month will be 949 out of those 1,100. Now, I'm, I'm disappointed that you didn't take the opportunity today when you were on your feet to apologise to the chamber and to the government for trying to mislead the public. I'm sorry that you didn't, that you weren't, uh, you weren't uh, uh, respectful enough to the people that you represent to say to them, "I got it wrong." But it's not surprising. It's not surprising. It's what we expect from you. And uh, once again, with this motion, you've got it wrong again. Thank you, Minister. Now the member for Coburn. Deputy Speaker, imagine this. Imagine being an opposition so hopeless at their job that they choose to use their MPI to give the government an opportunity to speak about their $1.9 billion investment in our health system. But we don't need to imagine that. We don't need to imagine that, Deputy Speaker, because it's happening Maybe right it's now. It's happening right now. Inconceivable. But, th but this is just a continuation of the brilliant strategy from the member for Cottesloe that he's been rolling out in this place time and time again. But that's all right. I'll get my mop out as the minister Minister for Health said, and I'll follow his very good work. And I, I, I can talk about um, the additional $1.9 billion uh, that this Labor government is investing in our health system. And you, you, can, you can sort of see how we arrive at today's MPI by the opposition's performance in question time. Because you, you can sort of see that there was, there was probably a, a staffer who wrote this MPI on Friday afternoon, and, and, and he, and he, and, and, and he he or she left it on the desk of the member for Cottesloe, and, and he, he, he walked in this morning having swanned around Cottesloe all weekend, uh, and he's wandered back in this morning, and he, he picks this thing up on his gas. He goes, oh, this looks good. Yeah, this looks good. I'll put this in. Completely oblivious, seemingly, to the fact that in the interim, the government has made a very significant announcement about funding for our health system. And, and it, was, it, was, it was good to hear the member for Cottesloe acknowledge that in his contribution to this place because otherwise you would have no idea that he was aware of it. Bringing this motion, I even went and looked on the member for Cottesloe's Facebook page. He's got about 1.4 thousand followers, which is about the same as me, um, having been in this place for a matter of months. Uh, and on his Facebook page, he, 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 he shared an article six hours ago uh, about the health system in WA Today, but the article was from the 5th of August. Uh, so it wasn't contemporaneous, didn't have anything to do with the significant announcements that this government has made in, in the health space. But, but look, that does expose a crisis in Western Australia, uh, Deputy Speaker. It, it exposes the crisis in the Liberal Party, the crisis that is engulfing the, the crisis. That, and you always see this, I know I've got him. I know I've got him. I can just sort of reel him in because, the because the this Party. is the crisis that he is presiding over. A Liberal Party Leader that is not Party. a serious opposition in this Member. And, and you know what I will say? Who am I? Who am I, member for Cottesloe, to look a gift horse in the mouth? All right, let's talk about what this government is doing in the health space. So, $1.9 billion additional investment across the health system. And what I'm particularly proud of are the investments in the mental health space, something, an area that is very important to me and that I spoke about in my first speech. Uh, this is, it includes a record $495 million increase for the Mental Health Commission. That is, as I say, a record increase 
And a significant amount of that commitment, $129.9 million, will go to youth mental health services and initiatives. And we know that when it comes to mental health, early intervention is critical, and it shows that this government is serious about getting on with the job. Uh, but the commitments to mental health don't just stop there with that funding for the Mental Health Commission, because as the Minister for Health has repeatedly outlined in this, pl in this place, uh, mental health presentations are an issue for the emergency departments as well. Mental health presentations at emergency departments are up by 11.4 per cent in the past three years. And that is why, and, and that those people are also spending longer in emergency departments. And that is why uh, there is an additional spend of $100 million, which includes extra beds in the mental health space. Um, and we, we, we've heard the member for Cottesloe and the leader of the opposition referring to the AMA. It's always good to hear members of the Liberal and National Party endorsing the position of a good union. Um, and, and I can say that I spoke, with, I spoke with a member of the AMA's council on Friday, and he said to me, you know what we really need? We need dedicated mental health facilities in our emergency departments. Lo and behold, member for Cottesloe, included in the $100 million spend on our emergency departments is a $61.6 million commitment for mental health construction in our two uh, mental health emergency centres at Rockingham and Armidale hospitals. It is an excellent announcement. Uh, dedicated mental health emergency department facilities have been working very well overseas in places like Toronto, and it is a credit to this government that it is pushing ahead with those facilities. This is a government making significant investments in health and in mental health. It is a government that is getting on with the job. It would just be nice if, for once, the Liberal Party would get on with its job and be a credible opposition in this place. Thank you, Member. Uh, the Member for Kimberley? Have I got that right? Yes. The Livers for Regional West Australians. Yeah. For me, as a member for the Kimberley, I know and see firsthand the importance of quality health care and services. Since coming to this office, the government has made sure funding has been provided to Regional WA to provide better services. This includes $7.98 million towards planning the development of the Broome Health and Wellbeing Campus. Uh, Nyambaburu Yaru project as part of the WA recovery plan. This is an exciting project that I will be watching closely. In the previous term of government, we funded and have delivered step up and step down community mental health facilities in Albany, Bunbury, Kalgoorlie and Geraldton. And the government continues to progress the delivery of further step up, step downs in Broome and Karatha, as well as new step up and step downs for Headland and a dedicated youth step up, step down. Additionally, additionally, the implementation of WA's first ever country ambulance strategy, which was released in November 2019, was by this Labor government, after the most extensive community consultations ever taken on country ambulance services. So far from the strategy, $9.2 million was committed to last October for three paid paramedics and six new ambulances in the Kimberley and funding to enhance access to care and patient flow for patients across all regional WA through improved patient coordination services. Plus announced this year a further $10 million boost for country ambulance services. This includes funding to recruit paid paramedics in nine regional locations to further strengthen country ambulances and provide better on the ground support for local volunteers. Recruitment is already underway for 25 additional paramedics to expand the current workforce workforce and support local volunteers. Yesterday I welcomed the incredible announcement by Minister Cook and Minister Dawson that in the upcoming state bu budget $1.9 billion will be invested in health and mental health across WA. Our regional communities will benefit from this massive boost. This includes $960 million for WA Health to address the unprecedented demand in the health system that is 332 extra beds and more frontline staff in hospitals across the state. In addition, hundreds of millions of dollars to boost the capacity of health services around the state. A number of additional regional specific initiatives are being delivered, including commitments made at the 2021 election. 
As you know, Acting Speaker, the Kimberley is an extremely large and remote electorate with a lot of people living in remote and rural locations and communities, not settlements. Um, here, here. Yeah. This Labor government knows this Labor government knows that, and that's why they're funding different programs and schemes to create better access and regional and rural people to get the health care that they need. $19.7 million will be invested to expand the eligibility of the patient assisted travel scheme for patient support escorts for patients from vulnerable and disadvantaged groups as well as maternity patients. I am pleased that this government will provide $10.9 million to the Royal Flying Doctor Service to refurbish and replace aircraft engines, making sure residents of the Kimberley can, take, can be taken to where they need in times of medical emergency. This is particularly um, sensitive for me. Just recently in the winter break, uh, I had an opportunity where my father's brother was suffered a heart attack in a remote community. And thank, thankfully, due to the RFDS being flown out from that remote community to the town base, and then down here to Royal Perth, he has survived that um, and is still recovering. Um, it is a long recovery process, and my sisters, my cousins are here through the help of Pats to come down and make sure that he is supported through this process and he can come out the other side. Yeah, yeah. I'm also excited to see $2.8 million to expand women's, country, women's community health services in the Kimberley, which includes mental illness, family, domestic and sexual violence. This government is committed to responding to the mental health needs of all West Australians. This includes improving supports and services in the regions for people experiencing mental health, mental ill health or alcohol and other drugs issues, as well as their families, carers and support people. The new mental health services funded in the budget will make modern integrated care more accessible to people living in rem remote communities across the state. Um, I would like to acknowledge that also mentioned there was a concern for mental health of students that funding totaling $42.2 million for the employment of 100 full-time equivalent psychologists as well as additional supervising and lead psychologists over four years in public schools and a, and a commis, whatever that word is, increase in funding for non-government schools is also a commitment by this government. Um, so, regional communities will we'll benefit from the $31.7 million invested to expand statewide eating disorders and treatment programs. This is a reality, especially, um, I know this from my, my daughter and her friends, who her, her concerns for her friends who have shown signs of eating disorders. A comprehensive health and mental health package for regional WA will ensure all West Australians, no matter where you live, will have access to quality health care. Member for Matt Lawley. Thank you, Acting Speaker. It is a great privilege for me to stand and speak in opposition to this motion, but in particular to follow on from the member for Kimberley. Members, take note. If you want to learn how to represent a regional constituency, listen to what the member for Kimberley has to say. She can speak up with passion, commitment and alacrity on what it takes to represent a regional community. She is a testament to her community and to this chamber. Members, it is also a great privilege to follow the member for Coburn in his contribution. It struck me as well that this had the character of a Dorothy Dixer, this uh, matter of public interest, and it was, it was incredibly surprising to see. And his explanation, the member for Coburn's explanation as to how it was that the member for Cottesloe arrived at presenting this motion for debate this afternoon seemed all too accurate. And I just wonder whether or not it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an incredibly plausible... It's a very, it's a very plausible proposition, but I suspect, I suspect that we are coming towards the end of those times in which we'll be standing up to talk about health. It will be coming towards the end of those times when the state opposition continues to make the point that this government hasn't handled the health of Western Australians better than any previous government. And the reason I say that is, f is for a couple of reasons. The reason I say that is because their arguments today were completely paradoxical. On the one hand, for example, we have the member for Cottesloe saying that this is a minister who doesn't listen to the workforce, but on the other hand, he has the ANF and the AMA on speed dial. On the one hand, we say that the, the Leader of the Opposition says, um, you know, this is too little too late, but we have a $1.9 billion investment. 
on the one hand, we have the member for Moore saying that he doesn't agree with Clive Palmer and that they're a safe pair of hands when it comes to public health messages such as vaccination. But not one of them, not one of them has stood up and publicly distanced themselves from their ideological bedfellows who are undermining public health in Australia. Ideological bedfellows like George Christensen, like Craig Kelly, like Barnaby Joyce, when, is, when, are these, when are these members opposite going to stand up and say, we don't agree with anything that they are saying, they are wrong and we are concerned with the public health of Western Australia? When are they going to apologise? When are they going to apologise? One of the fascinating things, one of the fascinating things that the member, that the member for, that the leader of the opposition raised, and I thought this was, you know, as a, as a dad with two young kids, this is an, an issue that's close to my heart the investment in midwives. And I thought, what can we do as a state to encourage those perinatal and neonatal services, those birthing services, all, the, all, of, all of those important services that are critical to the state of Western Australia? And I know in the, in the, electorate, in the electorate of Mount Lawley, uh, most of my constituents have the great opportunity to access the, uh, um, the neonatal services and the obstetric, obstetric and gynaecological services at Osborne Park Hospital. And I know that there are incredible staff at King Eddie's Hospital as well, providing fantastic services to people across Western Australia. But That's what time. could we Thank do you. to invest $1.8 billion in a new the women's question. and babies hospital? Thank you, Member. The question is that the question be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those to the contrary say no. Aye. The noes have it. The noes have it. Div division called. Ring the bells. Oh, sorry. He said no. He said division. Yeah, no. Um, he did say division. It was, well, it was, yeah. <laughs> to catch all those at afternoon tea. <laughs> the long afternoon tea. Lock the doors. The question is that the motion be agreed to. I appoint the member of Belmont as the teller to the nose and I appoint the member of Roe as the teller to the eyes. Before the tellers tell, I vote, cast my vote with the nose. All those in favour, please stand to be counted. Thank you. Please be seated. All those against, please stand to be counted.
The results of the division, the eyes five, the nose 45. The nose have it, the nose have it. <laughs> Honours of the day. Government business order of the day number one, Arts and Culture Trust Bill 2021, second reading, adjourned debate. Member for Wanneroo. Thank you, Madam Acting Speaker. I rise to make a contribution to the Arts and Culture Trust Bill 2021. And members, despite some people's perceptions of me, I'm not at all an extroverted person. And in fact, I'm rather shy, particularly when it comes to performing in front of an audience. So I'm sad to say that unlike um, many other members who've made a contribution to this bill in recounting uh, their own creative endeavours in years gone past, um, the member for Kingsley comes to mind and the, the member for Belmont, I certainly don't have anything to contribute in that regard. I can't dance, I can't sing, and I certainly can't paint. And as good as some of you are in this place, the most accomplished by way of public performance skills is surely our very own Minister for Culture and the Arts, the member for Mandurah, um, David Templeman. New members, uh, new members, you are most definitely in for a treat at the end of the year on the last day sitting, where our minister again, hopefully, will take us in song to summarise 2021. And um, the pressure must be on you, Ms. Minister, incredible pressure, uh, to trump last year's performance of Hallelujah, which was went viral. <laughs> top 10, top 10. Um, but of course, our Minister for Culture and the Arts, whilst being an accomplished performer himself, his real talents come in his championing, and I mean this most sincerely, of the arts and creative industries in this state. It's very much through his leadership and passion that the McGowan Labor government is investing more than ever, more than ever before, to support our creative community and to put arts and culture back front and central on the agenda. Just to quickly highlight this bill, the Arts and Culture Trust Bill 2021 is a reform initiative to improve the governance of the state's arts and cultural assets. The Arts and Cultural Trust, uh, uh, Trust will be a contemporary statutory authority and have broader powers than the Perth Theatre Trust. This bill um, passed through this place in the last parliament, of course, and it is another example of a bill that didn't quite make it through the Legislative Council uh, in the 40th parliament. I congratulate the minister for bringing it back to this place so soon in our 41st parliament. Um, during the election campaign, the McGowan Labor government announced that we would invest $100 million to build a state-of-the-art film studio and screen production facility at Victoria Quay in Fremantle. This facility is the critical piece of infrastructure needed to take WA's film industry to the next level. And the commitment includes an additional $20 million for a screen production attraction fund and potentially will be able to employ 2,800 new and ongoing jobs um, in the film production and hospi hospitality in industry. It's a very exciting development. I note the bill has been amended from the previous bill in the House to give effect to the State Solicitor's Office advice concerning the proposal that the State will require legislative authority to establish, own and operate the screen production facility business. I want to turn uh, to take this opportunity really to share with you uh, two of the extraordinary things that happen in Wanneroo by way of local contributions to the arts sector. Minister, Wanneroo is quite vibrant and a buzzing little local arts community. Um, and of course, the first uh, one I wanted to mention uh, relates to our beloved local theatre, the Limelight Theatre, located right in the heart of Wanneroo. 
This theatre is managed and operated by the Wanneroo Repertory Inc., a non-for-profit organisation. Limelight Theatre is in its 48th year this year, first being established in 1973. The theatre is governed by a 10-member executive committee elected by the repertory membership. Volunteers for all aspects of the operation, productions, front of house, theatre, maintenance, properties, membership, services, financial control, are all drawn from the repertory's membership. I just wanted to take this moment to actually outline to the House the current executive committee, if I may, Minister, including the wonderful President uh, Shelley McGinn, Vice President Karen Murray, Secretary Richard Tudge, Treasurer Mike Gibbs, Maintenance um, Manager Julie Clark, Social Media Kathleen Dilcastle, Technical Manager Paul King, Publicity and Marketing Sandra Powell, Volunteer Coordinator and Front of House RJ Smolders, Social Media Ashley Torrens, Committee Tech Gordon Park, Bookings and Membership Patrick McGinn, Wardrobe Joan Brassick, Props Lorraine Jones and Newsletter Ian Jones and of course the dozens and dozens of wonderful volunteers that help um, make Limelight Theatre such a fantastic part of Wanneroo. Each year Limelight Theatre presents six major productions. Um, these are very well attended, not only locally by people from Wanneroo and also the city of Joondalup and broader, uh, more broadly the northern suburbs, but of, uh, of course people come from far, far and wide including south of the river, to attend their very successful productions. Just want to take the opportunity to, Minister, in case you're interested, of the performances that uh, are on schedule for the rest of 2022. Um, we, uh, not we, I don't dare uh, suggest that I'm part of the, the, um, the wonderful work that Limelight Theatre does. I like supporting them, but I certainly am not going to take any credit for the wonderful work they do. Um, my favourite, uh, uh, I thought you might be interested in this one, uh, The Woman Who Cooked Her Husband. Sounds interesting production. Uh, another one, a taste for one, equally divided, Dusty, Full Monty, Pack of Lies and 42nd Street. And uh, like I said earlier, those productions... <laughs> Do you think so? Um, well, you know, Minister, you have... Minister, you have been there before, and you know you have been on the board, on the stage of Limelight Theatre. It was only for a photo, but I reckon if you're up for it, I could I have a chat with some of them at Limelight Theatre to see if you get a cameo performance at the Full Monty. I'd like to see that. Um, um, uh, I'll, I'll see what I can do for you, Minister. Look, uh, Minister, you know in 2017 I uh, was able to deliver $93,000 to Limelight Theatre as part of my election commitments, and you helped to um, announce that at the wonderful theatre to pur purchase new stage curtains and upgrade its foyer furniture. And prior to this election in 2021, I was happy to be able to achieve a $25,000 commitment to replace drapes, tiles in five bathrooms and back backstage lighting and prop ladder. I look forward to seeing those further upgrades to what is a fabulous local theatre doing fantastic work. And um, I urge people, if they do want to um, see those productions that are being planned and being performed later this year, that you get online as soon as you can, because the tickets don't last very long. Our ongoing commitment and support of uh, local theatre companies like Limelight Theatre is indicative of the support and priority that the McGowan government is giving to the arts, with unprecedented investment in a range of areas from grassroots right through to our new $100 million state-of-the-art facility um, that, in Fremantle that I mentioned. Um, members, I'd like to just take a couple of moments to uh, uh, talk a little bit about the current president of Limelight Theatre, Shelley McGinn. And, um, my actual connection with her. Um, members, you would know that prior to an election, and certainly I did that back in 2016, um, we make a lot of phone calls reaching out to our community, reaching out to residents to introduce uh, ourselves and to have a chat um, uh, to gauge what people's issues are in the local community and, and, and just get a bit of a pulse of things. I certainly did that back in 2016, and I was making a bunch of calls when um, 
I, uh, a lady answered the phone and she introduced herself as Shelley McGinn and I introduced myself as Sabina Winton. And we had a lovely chat about Wanneroo. She's a long-term uh, local in Wanneroo. And as we started chatting, I uh, sort of uh, uh, explained to her that I was a former student of Wanneroo High School. And as I said that to her, she said, that's really lovely. I was a former teacher of Wanneroo High School. And then there was a silence um, on the line uh, as we both um, connected the dots and uh, I said to her, hang on a sec, did you used to be called Shelley Brown? And she said, hang on a sec, did you used to be called Sabina Fed? And I said, yes, and it turns out that Shelley McGinn was Shelley Brown, who was my year nine English uh, teacher back in 1979, um, who I'd not heard of since that time. Of course, I went home that night trying to rifle through my old report cards to make sure that her impression of me back in those days match the impression that I was trying to build with her as a potential member for Wanneroo, and I'm delighted that it was. And since that time, I've had a wonderful relationship with her, uh, as well as being the president and life member of Limelight Theatre. She's the former treasurer and current committee member at the Wanneroo Sports and Social Club. She's a convener of the Wanneroo Community Network. She's the Ed Connect volunteer at Spring Hill Primary School and at Wanneroo High School. Um, for a retired teacher, uh, she's the kind of person I aspire to, still staying connected with her community and giving back so selfless, selflessly and in such a fantastic way, whether it be with students, uh, with a lo local sports social club or through uh, her work over a significant period of time with her, her passion, her first passion, Limelight Theatre. Um, I do have some memories of attending Wanneroo High School and particular drama. Um, I was no star. Uh, it wasn't really my forte, but I do, re do remember um, one particular uh, drama production that I was part of, which was called The Seven Deadly Sins. Um, I had to do a bit of Googling in preparation for this today, and they are lust, gluttony, greed, sloth, wrath, envy and pride. And as much I keep trying to reminisce and, and recollect. I can't quite remember which of the seven that I had to represent. But looking back now, um, but looking back now, I reckon maybe wrath would have suited me. Um, there's a fair bit of sloth that comes in occasionally uh, when we're in lockdown, and uh, certainly occasionally I'll, I'll accept that there's a little bit of lust that goes on. Um, uh, maybe I need to go back to the school and go through the archives and see some of the old photographs, uh, photographs and records of that production. Uh, I'd be very interested to see which of those seven deadly sins that I did have to, have to represent, and I'm sure I didn't do a very good job at the time. Look, building and supporting our arts, and, and particularly, you know, I'm talking about performing arts uh, as a theme throughout my speech. Um, really starts in our schools. Wanneroo Secondary College has always had a strong, a strong programs over the years um, since I left back in 1982. In fact, members, Wanneroo Secondary College is a performing arts has a sorry has a performing arts specialist program. This program speci specifically uh, relates to dance, drama, and music, both instrumental and vocal with a strong focus on performance opportunities, not only within the college, but in the local community, also nationally and internationally. It certainly is a highly sought after program and is widely known as the best specialist program of its type for students in the northern suburbs, and they've had much success. Most recently in July, they held a dance showcase iridescent at Queen's Baptist College Auditorium. Um, which involved uh, dancers from their Year 7 to 10 SPA uh, group, as well as their year, year 11 and 12 ATAR and general dancers. Of course, their success is really quite incredible when I think about it, given their current facilities. Um, what was cutting edge nearly 40 years ago when I was a student performing The Seven Deadly Sins is certainly not good enough for the programs that the school is offering now. But that is their current facilities that they operate under. The same tiny stage that I strutted my stuff very badly um, is exactly the facilities that um, the school has to work with, despite the fact that they run this most awesome specialist program. 
I was very delighted as part of the election commitments um, prior to the election that um, we are investing $5 million for a state-of-the-art performing arts facility. And that work is well underway and will allow the school to take this very popular and highly regarded performing arts program to the next level. The brief to, the brief to guide the architect includes a theatre with, three, sorry, with 250 retractable seats, a music and drama studio, green rooms, a bio box, a general learning area, storerooms, staff office and landscaping. Certainly if I had some of those whistle and bell facilities available to me, who knows, I may have uh, done a little bit better in my year nine drama classes. But seriously, uh, members, that school being able to have its own purpose-built um, performing arts facility, being able to seat 250 um, uh, 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 guests to be able to watch their performances which means they won't have to traipse across to Queen's, Queen's Rock or other places to hold their functions. So work is well underway in the sense that the planning work has been done. Construction is, construction is starting in October 2021. 20, uh, so what are we, August, a couple of months away, and we anticipate that the project will be completed in October 2022. Um, of course, this follows on from um, my 2017 election commitment, which has now fully been delivered in that that school now also has a brand new state-of-the-art gymnasium, um, which means they are able to do even better work in, the, in not just the general sports programs that they run, but also through the highly regarded specialist sports programs at that school. Um, I mentioned before that as part of the Wanneroo Secondary um, College's performing arts program, that they have a very strong fo focus on providing performance opportunities for their students, not only at college, but also out in the local community. That's nowhere better on display than the current performances this week, and in fact opening night was last night um, being Monday, by the current year 10 specialist performing arts students. Um, and their whole, uh, they're performing um, a romantic comedy called Crazy For You, but the nice, well, the nice segue, I guess, from where I started with Limelight Theatre uh, members is that that uh, production is being held at Limelight Theatre um, opening night last night, and hopefully, um, if I can get a leave pass out, out of here tomorrow night, hint, hint, Minister, I'd love to be able to go and see them at tomorrow night's performance. Um, I'd like to give a special shout out to Mr Matt Bell, who runs the entire specialist program at Wanneroo Secondary College, and in particular teachers that are involved in the Year 10 production, Crazy For You, Mr John McPherson and Mrs Alicia Shetham taylor and wish all the students who are participating and all the st uh, students who are performing, but also the students who are participating in the various roles that are required to put on production like this. I wish them all the best. Um, I know you're going to do a fantastic job. Um, Madam Acting Speaker, may I seek a short extension? Please? Extension granted. Look, I want to uh, just finish quickly by moving on down to primary schools, as I always try and do whenever I get the opportunity. and. I'm also very proud of what my local primary schools do in terms of um, encouraging, supporting and giving children opportunities to strut their stuff um, in performances, productions, all sorts of things. In particular, I want to highlight Tapping Primary School, which is doing quite incredible stuff. Prior to the 2017 election, um, Cheryl Peake, who's the performing arts specialist there, um, advocated really strongly to me, saying that their undercovered area was just not large enough to house the entire school population for assemblies, nor was it ever contemplated that that might be a space that would be useful for them to perform their productions. Um, as a result of that, I was really happy to be able to advocate to get funding for $450,000, which resulted in their undercovered area getting a significant ex extension 
to the extent now that the entire school community of some 750 students can participate and be part of school assemblies altogether. It has also given the school great scope whereby they don't need to spend lots of money and go off-site to host their yearly productions, but can hold them at the school. And in 2018, they performed Madagascar in that new space. In 2020, they performed Lion King, and I'm looking forward very much to their next production. Um, finally, I just want to highlight another local primary school doing fantastic things in the area of the arts, and particularly the program that I want to highlight um, is their Speak Out Awards, which is coordinated by teacher Linda Gower. Members, East Wanneroo have been hosting their annual Speak Out Awards um, every year for a long period of time now, and it's been my great honour that they've invited me along to be part of that uh, process. The program essentially challenges and asks the question of every single child in that school, from pre-primary all the way to year six, to prepare and then to perform a speech to their peers. So every single child in pre-primary has a go at getting up in front of their peers to speak, um, all the way up to year six. It's a, it's, it's a highlight of the school calendar for all those students um, as they, so, so every single child does it and then they have a, a school assembly where they announce the winners and the each year winner gets to make their speech. Um, every year I go, I'm really qu quite amazed by the quality, the courage and the standard of the work by these young people to get up and speak publicly um, in front of their peers. And each year the standard gets higher and higher. And each year the expectations that the kids put on themselves to do better each year and uh, this year, the, the pre-primary year one, year two winners are looking forward to next year to see if they can back it up and be the year winner the year after. And it's just the most incredible program um, to be involved with. And I cannot uh, commend Linda Gower, who, co who coordinates it, but also to every single classroom teacher who invests the time within their classroom to support the students to be involved in that program. I want to just give a shout out to this year's 2021 winners. In pre-primary, it was Zaina Lungani. In year one, it was Ruan Lungani. Sorry, let me say that again. In pre-primary, it was Zaina Lungani. In year one, it was Flynn Elridge. In year two, it was Zaina's brother, Ruan Lungani. Apologies for my mispronunciation, but we'll get the spelling right. Year three, Eleanor Titsaduri. Year four, joint winners in Sophie Rose and Chevelle Jones. Year five, Lewin Dakin. And year six, Sol Richardson. And I have to say, Lewin in particular, I think he's won it every year so far, <coughs> and he is just so quietly determined to really pull out all the stops in year six. And I look forward to his um, efforts next year. Um, members, I absolutely love being the member for Wanneroo, where there is a thriving school-based creative environment, whether it be in music, dance, performing arts. I love being the member for Wanneroo, where we have such a wonderful local art scene, as I described through the wonderful Limelight Theatre. And members, lastly, I absolutely am very proud to be a member of the McGowan Labor government who continues to value and invest significantly and without precedent into our arts uh, sector. And uh, Minister, um, it has been fantastic to have you leading that charge on behalf of the McGowan government and I look forward to the next three years of much more. Thank you. Member for Kimberley. I rise to speak on the Arts and Culture Trust Bill 2021. <coughs> My electorate of the Kimberley contributes significant cultural, social and economic benefits to the state. There are a lot of amazing productions held every year and the potential for so much more. 
Many will think of productions in the Kimberley and think of the wonderful Brand New Day, a coming of age musical set in the 1960s, which was first written, produced and performed by, by talent from the Kimberley in 1990. While the musical is at the apex of Kimberley performing talent, talent, it is only one of the many Kimberley successes in the performing arts. I myself was a boarding student down here in Perth when that um, first came down. Uh, a kid, a 13 year old kid from a small town coming down to watch people that I knew, my uncles, musicians, locals, you know, down with all the other school members and students from everywhere else coming down to the Octagon Theatre and like watching this show and knowing these songs and knowing these people and the pride I felt with, that's my uncle. Them mob are from Broome, them mob is from Fitzroy, you know, and they're dancing and everyone enjoying it. This was repeated and I was lucky enough, you know, the production was so great. This was also felt by my children when it was revamped and then made into a movie. The Kimberley su supports a lot of screen activity that drives the industry with outstanding works such as Mystery Road being filmed in the region a few years ago. And who can forget uh, the flurry of Nicole Kidman and Hugh Jackman in Wyndham and Kununurra with the filming of Australia. I welcome the McGowan election commitment of, a $20 million for, of $20 million for a screen production attraction fund and the big $100 million to build a state-of-the-art film studio production facility in Fremantle. This is a great commitment that I hope will support screen productions and performers from the Kimberley. The Kimberley has so many rich cultures across the region from Broome to Kununurra. Indigenous people are inherent storytellers and we share our stories in many ways, orally, on film, dance, theatre and paintings. I don't have any of those skills, by the way. <laughs> we are generous in sharing our stories to the world, but we need the support and facilities to do so in a culturally safe environment. Places such as Galari Media Enterprises are so important for telling these stories as an example. Galari is a broom-based, multi-dimensional, multimedia organisation that provides a unique, innovative and professional Indigenous service in all forms of media and communications to a wide multicultural audience in a culturally accepted way. Galari currently delivers television, radio and web-based media production and broadcasting filmmaking, live performance productions and events, and training in the performing arts and media, reaching out to the mainstream audiences as well as the indigenous communities throughout the Kimberley and beyond by using partner networks. Galari is 100% owned through the Broome Aboriginal Media Association Aboriginal Corporation. For regional and remote artists, often staging performance, often staging performing arts shows in the regions can be cost prohibitive, as often you need to bring crew, sets and other equipment from Perth and the small numbers who attend don't make it cost effective. There are initiatives that help underwrite tour costs which are great for the region, but often it's about bringing a show from Perth out to regions, they don't assist with staging homegrown shows. This bill will establish the Arts and Culture Trust, which will have broad, prow broad powers and flexibility to manage, care for and develop cultural assets for future generations. The Arts and Culture Trust will be a body that can not only manage theatres, but also other cultural assets around the state entrusted to its care. It is exciting that the Trust will provide help with managing venues in the regions, in a more cost-effective way to help our emerging artists. The Trust will have powers to manage all kinds of arts and cultural venues, including outdoor spaces. This body will have the capacity to optimise the potential of the assets it controls, creating flow and benefits for local businesses. This will include state-owned assets assigned to the Trust and potentially any privately-owned assets that enter into partnership with it. The Trust will also have a greater power to engage in business arrangements which will help grow the local capacity of Kimberley-based organisations and performers. 
The state government supports so many key arts and cultural projects in the Kimberley electorate. This includes funding for the Aboriginal Arts Commissioning Fund to support senior cultural practitioners, including Tommy May and Tom Lawford, to share the stories of Aboriginal trade networks through the development of a large-scale work embodied in the form of the Rainbow Serpent's Belly. Kimberley Aboriginal Law and Culture Centre, the Sovereign Systems Project. Warangari Arts Aboriginal Corporation, the Kimberley Arts Centre Alliance, New York City Project, grant funding through the Aboriginal Arts Commissioning Fund to support the commissioning of 10 artists to create significant new work for international exhibitions with a focus on New York. Theatre Kimberley, grant funding through the Creative Communities COVID-19 Recovery Residency Program will support two artists and resi residents to create connections with the Broome community through roller skating and beatboxing workshops. Grant funding through the Arts 15, 15K Plus program for the Dummy Splash Out in Broome, a circus collaboration with Sandfly Kids, artists and Kimberley locals. Funding will allow Theatre Kimberley to work with Broome-born artists Crystal Stacey and Rowan Thomas and the Theatre Kimberley's Broome-based production team to create an exciting and engaging performance, rich with mentorships and learning opportunities. Kimberley Stolen Generation Aboriginal Corporation Stomp and Ground Festival grant funding through the Arts 15K Plus program. Stomp and Ground is a weekend of contemporary and traditional Aboriginal music, dance, culture, workshops, contact and experience. We'll bring together the best cultural and contemporary performance for a music and culture festival to celebrate the spirit of Aboriginal peoples across the Kimberley. Throughout my entire life, I have, I have been privileged to see some great productions in the Kimberley. Again, I mention Brand New Day, which is most memorable, plus Sandfly Circus. Uh, I've been on the Mystery Road back scenes. Um, not me, my sisters, but like witnessing them trying to fight to get in front of the camera. Um, another incredible organisation in the Kimberley is the Marugeku, which is dedicated to Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians working together to create new dance languages, working to build bridges and break down walls between urban and remote dance communities. Marugeku creates so many amazing opportunities for people across the Kimberley region to express their stories and culture through dance, allowing them to perform in the region but also travel across the country to perform for other audiences too. Unfortunately, their celebration of 25 years was recently cancelled due to COVID-19, but I look forward to attending the rescheduled event later in the year. Recently, as the new member for the Kimberley, I attended the 2021 Moundjum Culture and Arts Festival. This was hosted by the Moundjum Art and Culture Centre. This celebrates the vibrant culture of three local tribes, the Ngaranyan, Warora and Wunnabal people. It is one of Australia's longest running festivals of Indigenous culture, having begun in 1997 and gone on to become a roaring success attracting visitors from all over WA. <coughs> Traditional song and dance, also known as Junba, is a focal point for the festival, serving several important roles for the tribes, also educating and sharing their pride as well as a form of storytelling, it is good for social and emotional well-being. This also strengthens connection to country as well as inter intergenerational bonds. In the lead up to the festival, older people in the tribes help, other, help young people to prepare totems and costumes and, pr and practice Junba with them. I am excited for the future of arts in the Kimberley and I look forward to attending many more local performances in my electoral in my electorate, as well as supporting people from our Kimberley, sharing with people other, everywhere else in the state and nation. I commend this bill to the House. Yeah. <coughs> Leader of the Liberal Party. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Speaker, I am uh, rising as the lead for the opposition in this bill. I will say that um, uh, 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 the member for VAS um, would normally be um, leading this bill, but uh, as members may have heard, um, there's a serious health issue in her family that she's having to deal with, uh, and she can't be in Parliament um, to deal with it. So, 
Um, I will soldier on, and uh, the Honourable Peter Collier is, in fact, our shadow spokesperson in the other place. Um, but I'll just go through um, a little bit of analysis and discussion of the bill. Um, <clears throat> I'll indicate at the outset that we support the bill. I might also say to members, in case you're worried about your health, I had my second, um, my second AstraZeneca uh, COVID vaccination yesterday, so uh, I am somewhat less than average uh, today. But anyway, I will soldier on. Um, the Arts and Culture Trust Bill um, will rename the Perth Theatre uh, Trust uh, to the Arts and Culture Trust while expanding its functions and responsibilities for art and cultural venues beyond the theatres. The Trust will be the new government arts entity managed by a board and accountable to the Minister for Culture and the Arts, the Government and the Parliament. Most iconic theatres, such as His Majesty's Theatre, are managed by the Perth Theatre Trust under the Perth Theatre Trust Act of 1979. Now, over the years, various reviews have proposed uh, reform uh, to reform the trust to allow it to operate beyond its narrow role as a theatre manager, and uh, this bill obviously achieves um, some of the outcomes of those various considerations. This bill will place more artistic and cultural venues under the control of the new trust, including the Perth Cultural Centre. The Trust will have much broader responsibilities and powers, with more flexibility to manage our cultural assets. New responsibilities will include management of state-owned assets assigned to the Trust and potentially any privately owned assets that enter a partnership with it. The Trust Board will consist of nine members compared uh, to the current eight, thus ensuring there can be a majority position. Uh, board members will be expected to have specific skills and experience with, which relate to the Trust's operations. Now, obviously, historically, the Perth, Perth Theatre Trust was focused mainly on Perth venues, and hence most of its board members tended to be people with a central focus, uh, Perth focus. And we just heard from the member of Kimberley. Um, clearly, the scope of this bill will um, go much more broadly uh, than simply the metropolitan Perth. Um, and that means, uh, because that trust is going to have a statewide responsibility uh, and it'll have broader membership. The bill also expands the definition of an event, production or performance beyond immediate events to include performances that can be enjoyed at a later date, such as live streaming. The provision allows um, the trust to establish, own and operate um, the proposed $100 million uh, screen production facility uh, in Fremantle, I'm assuming, Minister. Um, and it seems, um, it seems fairly routine, uh, though the increased, uh, or it, it all seems fairly routine, I should say, though the increased centralised control over government facilities um, may not always be the best way to do things. Um, it's, uh, we need to be careful that uh, bureaucracies don't become un unresponsive to the voices uh, from further away, such as those in the regions, and even, can I say, in the suburbs of Perth. Now, um, I'm going to try and be reasonably focused, but there are several parts of the bill that, that I did want to discuss and I will cover in consideration in detail, um, and uh, those being the declaration of places to be venues, de declaring groups as resident companies, ministerial oversight of commercial contracts and admission of people to trust property. And obviously that last one was quite controversial um, a few weeks ago where um, uh, a specific group were prevented from using the Albany Entertainment Centre. Uh, if we go to part one, section four, the minister may declare places to be venues, um, which is page five of the bill. It's, it's claimed that the current regime doesn't easily facilitate short-term events and opportunities, and this clause will grant the Minister the power to declare a place to be a venue used or intended to be used wholly or partly for cultural or artistic purposes. Now, um, that is quite a broad uh, power, and um, it, it, it's interesting. I guess I'm interested to see if there's any qualification on that power, um, because as it sits, it doesn't appear that there's any restraint as to what can be declared a venue. Uh, as it reads, the Minister for Arts can impinge upon any property or piece of land for the purpose of accommodating an artistic event. Um, and, and I guess the question is, is it really the government's intent to empower the Minister with such unprecedented power over essentially the, the whole state and every property therein? And I guess there, Minister, the, the essence of that is, um, does that go to private property as well as public property? And it, it's not clear in the bill um, if that is the case. Um, the, uh, 
Um, uh, the bill doesn't seem to have any constraints on the minister with regard to privately owned or leased property in declaring a place to be a venue. Now, we assume that the minister or a minister would not simply um, collectivise someone's private property um, for the purpose of an artistic event without agreement of the property owner. Um, but uh, in, in terms of these bills, obviously, <clears throat> we know that this minister is a well-meaning minister who would try and take things, uh, you know, try and uh, do things in a cooperative way. But it may be that in future we have a minister who's not so kindly disposed and uh, might seek to exercise broader power if that is possible. Um, and as I say, particularly over private, uh, over private land. Um, and, and obviously, we don't on this side want to see. Um, the compulsory exercise of state power over private property for artistic purposes. Um, and uh, clearly, if a private property owner um, didn't wish their property to be used for that purpose, then um, we would hope that that is the case. And as I say, I'm, I, I would be good if the minister could enlighten me as to whether that, uh, the minister's powers do in fact go to private properties as well as public. Um, now, the same goes to local government property or land that the minister wants to declare as a venue. Um, there's nothing in the bill specifically about consultation with local government or local community representatives to ensure the minister's proposed declara uh, declarations do not cause uh, or create local problems. Um, and furthermore, if a declaration is opposed by the local community, um, uh, what process is there for that community to have those views uh, heard? Um, and I'm not sure if it's possible, Minister, but or if it's needed. And as I say, I genuinely seek clarification on that. Um, uh, you know, does the bill need some amendment um, to specify or to uh, uh, you know specify that the power only applies to state government-owned or leased property or land, um, or in fact, is that implicit? Uh, in the bill itself. Um, if the state government should want to use private or local government property or land, there must be a requirement for the minister to gain agreement uh, from the property owner uh, or holder. And, uh, and as I've said, it would, be, it would be good, as I say, to clarify that, um, for the minister to make it clear that the minister's powers apply only to state-owned land or facilities. Um, and that any place not owned or controlled by the state government can only be declared a venue with the agreement of the owner or the leaseholder uh, of the place. Um, now, just another aspect that would be uh, interesting to have clarification um, is um, section, floor, section 4 under clause 2, uh, which is on page 5, uh, that refers to the declaration of a place to be a venue for a period specified in the declaration. Um, again, uh, without any qualification to this clause, um, I guess the concern is, you know, how long would that period of time go for? Um, um, and obviously, <coughs> that um, uh, is a concern if, if, if that declaration could go for extended periods of time and perhaps prevent other uses of land. And, and as I say, that does come back to that question of if, in fact, um, this could cover private venues as well as um, government venues. Um, the, uh, so the, the question is, should there be a limit on the period or should there be um, some ability to, or in fact some compulsory review um, when a place is declared a facility after some period of time? Obviously if it's for three months or six months or something like that, that's fine, but if it's longer, um, maybe we need to have some sort of uh, review process. I, I note in the bill that um, the minister can obviously um, uh, change the declaration. If we go to part one, section five, um, the minister may declare art organisations to be resident companies. Um, the bill will allow the minister to declare a state funded arts organisation to be a resident company for the purposes of the bill. And that provides, uh, certainly provides greater clarity and certainty for performing groups. Um, the concern with this clause is the consultation or is there a requirement for consultation with existing uh, groups or bodies using the facility? Um, and again, I don't make this um, assertion in relation to the current minister, but maybe in the future there would be a minister who wants to make friends with lots of organisations and uh, starts to assign organisations to facilities that simply don't have the capacity to cope or 
um, those other groups may be incompatible with groups that are using that existing facility. Um, is there some requirement for consultation with the groups that already utilise a facility when other groups are going to uh, uh, come in and uh, use that particular facility? We go to part two of the bill. Part two of the bill deals with the establishment of the new trust, its functions and powers, including the ability to enter into commercial arrangements. Now, the bill will enable the trust to enter into commercial arrangements to stimulate commercial and tourism hubs. It's envisaged that the tr trust will attract activities and events to enliven the Perth Cultural Centre and the residential cultural institutions, the art gallery, the state library, the other museum uh, and other facilities. The trust will need ministerial approval to exercise its powers to acquire or dispose of real property uh, to enter into contract for the management uh, of a venue and uh, uh, for uh, ticketing services. Now, if we look at part two, section 12, general restrictions on trust powers on page 11, uh, that section states that approval will be needed from the minister before the trust can deal in real or personal property uh, as empowered by part two, section 11, clause 3A on page nine. Ministerial approval will also be required in the exercise of powers to enter into venue management arrangements given under part two, section 11, clause 3D, page nine. Now, we uh, obviously welcome the ministerial oversight and believe that is critically uh, important and it also makes sure that the minister, uh, him or herself, uh, are accountable and held accountable for decisions that are made. Um, that, that isn't, I guess there was a concern that this isn't a consistent approach all through the bill and that we are very keen to make sure, whilst we recognise the role of the trust and, and like bodies, that at the end of the day, the minister is the person that, uh, who is always accountable for um, what occurs in, in, in government property entities uh, and the like. Um, part two, section 13, requirement for approval to participate in business arrangements. On page 12, <coughs> the trust is empowered by part two, section 11, clause three F, to participate in business arrangements, including acquisition and disposal of interests in an arrangement, um, which was referred to on page nine. Section 13 requires such arrangements be approved by both the minister and the treasurer. Again, uh, that's very welcome. Uh, because it's ensuring robust ministerial control and, importantly, accountability. Uh, however, clause 13 to page 12 states the Treasurer can exempt trusts from these requirements. Um, and I guess the concern here is that it may be a way for a minister to defer their own accountability, and that is um, if the minister is um, uh, deferring all of that authority to um, a subservient body, um, that um, ultimately then the minister can say, well, I can't be held accountable for the decisions that were made by that body because they had the, the power and I had no say in that matter. Um, I, I think we would always like to see um, that the minister ultimately has the authority and control over, over matters. Um, uh, so uh, I think it is worthwhile looking at that. Um, uh, and that is, uh, and, and I would suggest, Minister, I'm not going to suggest any amendments in this place. Um, I would leave any discussion of that to my lead in the other place if, uh, if uh, that is going to be the case. So I'm not foreshadowing amendments. I'm just saying these are matters that have been uh, raised and um, uh, would, um, I'm very interested in your response. Um, so, you know, the question is, should we, uh, is that uh, exemption um, should it be there at all? Um, should there be a limit to it? Um, and uh, yeah, we're concerned that, that perhaps um, it could be a way of government distancing itself from decisions um, that it knows are going to be made. Um, there's a similar situation existing in Clause 14.1 on page 12 concerning ministerial approval required for the trust to provide ticketing service uh, for a non-trust venue. Um, again, the ministerial oversight is welcome, um, but there is a provision for the minister to exempt the trust from this requirement. Uh, and again, for exactly the same reasons, um, would be interested to understand what the minister sees as the scope of that. And, and obviously, again, the concern is that you have uh, important decisions being made that, that um, are at some distance from the minister. Um, part five, section 70, general regulations on page 36. 
um, uh, saying the regulations we made regarding various aspects of venue management. And I will say this was a section that, that brings back the memories of what happened recently down at Albany uh, with the entertainment centre and uh, a group being banned from using uh, that centre. Now that section 70 lists examples of matters that will be subject to regulations and there are two matters that um, could be particularly sensitive and those being 72B, um, the use and hiring out of trust venues or a part of a trust venue and 72G, the admission of persons, vehicles and animals to trust venues. Now, you know, these are sensitive matters and this is, it is a concern uh, of the opposition that um, we understand that there are there can be extremes, but the banning of um, you know the Australian Christian lobby from the uh, Albany Entertainment Centre was of enormous concern um, to a range of people. Now there are members in this place that may have different views about um, that group, and some people may have a view that some of their views they don't like or they don't care about. Um, but it, it is critically important um, in our society that we have as much tolerance um, as possible to groups with different views. And, and what would... Pardon? The group you're referring to do not espouse tolerance themselves. But that's, uh, I guess, Member, that, that's the issue, isn't it? That in a democracy, I mean, your right is to criticise them and to, to say, but to silence groups. Um, and, and I guess my concern with this power is what we see is a narrowing of the opportunity of venue of, of, of groups to use functions. Now, you know, I, I support robust debate. There are people who I really vehemently disagree with. There are people in this chamber that I, I vehemently disagree with. But boy, do I respect and champion their right to state their opinions and have their opinions. People in this place say quite egregious things to me. I might not like it. Um, but I respect the fact that in this chamber people can say those things and um, equally um, members may not like things I say from time to time. Um, but, but uh, well, I know it's hard to believe, member, but, uh, um, but uh, I have heard that view expressed occasionally. Uh, and it, it's important, I think, that these you know, public venues are, are there. And, and I appreciate there are extremes in everything and I appreciate that um, we need some capacity, um, uh, uh, you know, to have some control over this. My concern is um, that um, there are differences um, which are not extreme differences in the views of the broader community, but because we have a particular view, we say, well, we don't ever want to hear that, we don't ever want anyone to be able to say that in a, in a forum. Now, as I say, I champion everyone here is right and in the community to um, uh, to criticise people when they don't agree with them and do that in a respectful way and uh, the like. But I am concerned that um, this is a mechanism that will stifle and stifle public debate because what's highly egregious, for example, and I'll give you an example, this is not my view, um, but you know, on the issue of climate change, there's a significant percentage of the Australian population that doesn't think that climate change is real and they think that what they... they want, uh, that, yes. That's that's uh, uh, no no. But hear me out, member. Now you might not agree with them. Um, you may think they're they're misplaced, but it, it would be egregious to say that you wouldn't let those people express those views. Now, equally, I am sure there would be a cavalcade of criticism from the media, from you, from others, and and the community could form their own view. But I think it's a dangerous thing in society um, when we start. Uh, narrowing views because then you can go to more extremes and, and I will say in that I'm a uh, keen believer that the climate is changing. Uh, I'm extremely dubious by some statements that are made by people um, around certain aspects of that debate and I think that uh, I think so I, I in fact am very aware of it member and uh, sounded uh, quite alarming and uh, as you would know member in the previous election I was at the forefront of a of a visionary policy to move the government to a zero carbon emission and uh, and also to really catalyse 
uh, the transition of our economy away from fossil fuels. So you can guess where I stand on all of this, Member, but equally I respect the fact that there are good people I know who are very good people, fine people. Um, they don't share those views, and I wouldn't seek to stop them expressing their view in a public forum, even though I think it's wrong, and I may well use my opportunity in a public forum to criticise them. And I, look, I know it's irksome, but I, I do worry in public debate now that things that are irksome um, suddenly become offensive and, and are banned and people aren't allowed to say them. I don't actually think it helps. I think, uh, I think and as I say, I, I appreciate there are extremes in everything. So I appreciate there are some things we, we wouldn't, you know, and, uh, and you know, probably best not to give very extreme examples. You can all imagine what those may be. My concern is that in public debate that um, the definition of what is an extreme view is, is sort of actually what's an irritating view or an irksome view or a view, as members said, were suggesting earlier, a view on something that may be wrong. So um, I think that is, um, I think it's a power and uh, uh, that should be used very, very wisely and very, very sparsely um, uh, in our community. And, uh, and uh, I think as much as possible, um, we should let, let those debates occur. I certainly know on the university campuses um, uh, when I was a student, um, and in fact there are people on the campus at, for example, the University of Western Australia who are anarchists. Um, there are um, people that have some quite offensive uh, uh, views to the Jewish community on campus. Now, I profoundly disagree with those groups. Um, I in no way um, support um, the views that they espouse, um, but um, I think when we go down this path of banning groups, I, I think it actually drives debate underground um, and it doesn't help. As I said, I appreciate there are extremes and uh, you know, we, do need some, uh, we do need some capacity here to um, have some controls, but it should be in the extreme. Um, not for things that we just find irritating or irksome, but pardon. Well, that's uh, it, it. Really, is a, a matter for um, assessment, isn't it, um, Member for Bunbury? But the, um, but the, for example, with the uh, the group that was banned from Albany. Now, I don't um, I don't share their views on many things. I like a lot. I'm half of Australia's population are Christian, um, and they have a range of Christian views. Um, now, some of their views clearly are views that offend people, and I, I will say I haven't, I haven't examined, you know, their particular statements in detail. But you know, those things that are people do regard as extreme, call them out. You know, criticise them. You know, I think you'd find the broader um, community now, in, in terms of the debate about the LBTQIA uh, community and so on. You know what was acceptable for people, or people found acceptable to say 20 years ago. People don't find that acceptable now, and and that that debate's out there. And I actually think it's healthy when we have that debate, and it helps to normalise people's views and to recognise that the world has moved on from a world they knew, um, you know, years and years ago. So, um, in any case, um, on that, uh, Minister, I will uh, end my contribution. As I say, um, we on this side um, support the bill. We see this. Uh, as a culmination of uh, an important effort to um, modernise uh, the role of the Theatre Trust and to uh, make it more contemporaneous. Thank you. Thank you. Minister for Culture and the Arts. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Speaker. Can I thank uh, all of the uh, contributors to um, uh, the debate in the second reading debate with regard to this bill? Look, I, I think it's actually very important that. Uh, uh, we have opportunities to debate uh, the importance of uh, culture and the arts to our Western Australian uh, community and indeed to the uh, story that is uh, us as Western Australians. And um, I'm very proud and pleased that a number of members took the opportunity uh, during the uh, second reading debate on the, um, the Arts and Culture Trust Bill to uh, outline their strong support for the uh, the cultural industries, uh, their strong support for their local community uh, uh, arts groups, arts organisations, artisans, artists, um, uh, arts organisations, uh, their strong support for uh, and why we need to continue to have a vibrant 
robust, uh, creative, um, uh, creative community. Um, uh, it, it's always um, it's always uh, pleasing when I hear members of parliament uh, highlighting their um, their own experiences with the arts, as um, many of the the contributors today and uh, in the previous days of this debate um, highlighted the impact that the arts had on in on them uh, and has had on them uh, as children uh, and indeed in education. Uh, and of course in the broader community. Uh, it's always been my view that of course that um, uh, the, the arts is a great enabler. It's also an important contributor to our economy uh, but it also essentially tells uh, the stories of, uh, of us and the arts in all of its genres do that so well and have done for centuries if not thousands of years for Western Australia in particular with our First Nations people. I'm particularly proud to have heard uh, the contribution from the member for Kimberley, uh, outlining the importance of uh, culture and the arts to uh, the broader communities across the Kimberley, um, and other members who talked about uh, the richness uh, within their own communities, be they in the metropolitan area or, or be they in regional Western Australia. Uh, it is important for all of us to understand that uh, um, the arts is not just about um, uh, uh, seeing a, a great dance or uh, hearing or uh, participating in a great song. Uh, the arts is much more deeper. Uh, and all of us, all of us, it's my firm view that all of us uh, are shaped by, uh, in terms of our own character, by the influences of uh, uh, culture and practice and the arts more broadly. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's actually uh, pleasing that this bill has evoked in many members uh, in this place uh, an appreciation of what uh, the arts does uh, for their communities. Uh, we must also be very mindful, as I'm sure members are, uh, that uh, uh, many people in our community draw their incomes, their livelihoods from um, the arts. Uh, many of them supplement their livelihoods and incomes through artist artistic practice. Um, and many of them, of course, during COVID have been doing it particularly diff difficult, particularly hard. Uh, many of them in the entertainment industry, many of them in the performing arts industry, many of them in the visual arts uh, and dance genres, uh, and those that uh, also provide the equipment, the, the backup, the sound engineering, etc., uh, also, of course, have been impacted by COVID-19. And so during this uh, interesting period of 18 months or so since COVID struck this country, uh, it's important to acknowledge uh, that in, as we speak in Western Australia, we are one of the only uh, few jurisdictions now, state or territory jurisdictions, uh, where we can have 100% attendance at our performance venues, uh, where we can uh, move freely uh, in festivals and events, uh, where we can uh, participate in cultural and arts activity. And I think it's something that we should be not only feel very privileged uh, that we can do that, um, but that we have been able to do that, uh, particularly in, the, in more recent times, more freely in many respects than any other place uh, in our nation. If you look at uh, the situation and the circumstances in uh, Victoria, in, in, in uh, uh, New South Wales and in Queensland, um, many of the people uh, of all ages who have been involved in the arts, of course, have had their livelihoods decimated. Mm. Uh, they are not able to practice, in many respects, their craft and their art. In Western Australia, uh, the impact has been uh, uh, was swift. Uh, when COVID hit and closures, be they of venues, be they of spaces and places, be they of um, uh, museums or um, libraries, uh, be they cultural places where uh, creatives um, do their magnificent work, 
uh, they were impacted. And as we know, that many of the institutions and industries that were impacted first quite often have also um, are the ones that are impacted again when there's lockdowns uh, and are impacted again uh, in terms of uh, uh, being able to uh, sustain themselves coming out of the situation. So to the members of parliament who have made a contribution, all of you, I thank you sincerely. Uh, but there is some things that I want you to do uh, on behalf of your communities, and that is to encourage your broader community in whatever seat you represent uh, to continue to reach out towards those creative people in your community, your, 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 your musicians who perform in, in live music venues, your community theatre people who... Uh, who, um, as a number of members highlighted, have been making a tremendous cultural contribution to their communities, some for many, many decades, uh, that you reach out to them and support them. Go to their shows, go to their uh, activities, involve yourself in their events and encourage others to do so. And when your local gallery is uh, having an exhibition of a local artist, um, go there, uh, as I know many of you do. Uh, encourage people to purchase their works encourage people to celebrate their creativity. Uh, when you uh, have uh, uh, events that bring people together, that celebrate the unique stories of Western Australia, share that. Share it on, fo on, on, on your, your social media and in any other way you can. Because what it does is it underpins that you value and that your community values those people who are part of our creative people. And there are many, many thousands of them. And I have to say uh, that uh, it's not just those that create the work, those that produce the magic uh, that we value and talk about. It's also very true, and it's uh, something that the Premier highlighted, I think, in question time only last week. And this is not an attack on my very good mem friend, the, member for, uh, uh, the Min Minister for Sport and Recreation. But it is important to remind people that it is, in fact, in cultural and artistic um, endeavours that there is a vastly greater participation rate uh, than, than in sport. Now, sport is important, there's no doubt about that, but in terms of attendance to events, it is, in fact, uh, cultural and arts pursuits that continue to outnumber uh, those that attend a sporting venue or a sporting um, uh, engagement. Now, we know that in Western Australia we're in love with uh, uh, some of the codes that exist and they are important. But as to and so too are our cultural and artistic uh, performances and our cultural and artistic activities and events. And it's one of the reasons why uh, I unashamedly am very pleased that I have both the tourism portfolio and the, and the culture and arts portfolio. Because uh, if you're going to tell your story to the world and you're going to tell it well, and you're going to tell unique stories like our unique stories that are embedded in our First Nations people, for example. And then um, when we have those stories, uh, they deserve to be shared with the rest of the world. They are unique. And that is something that I think all of us can be so proud of in Western Australia and in Australia more broadly, that we are not only home to the oldest living culture on the planet, but it is a culture that is embedded with uh, magnificent, special and unique stories. Stories that need to be told, uh, that uh, our First Nations people are very, very eager to share. And it is something that is unique to us in Australia. And why wouldn't we do everything possible to support our First Nations people and all of our creatives to tell their stories, their unique stories to the world. And when we are able to welcome back people from overseas and, and obviously uh, interstate tourists uh, or visitation uh, in the future, it will actually be those stories that I think people will be seeking. It will be those stories that they will seek to uh, be engaged with and, and participate in. Uh, and Western Australia is so well placed to do that, not only because we've been fortunate enough to have a Premier and a government and the community, the West Australian community that has kept 
uh, 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 people safe and focused on pe keep, keeping people fa uh, safe. It's also allowed us some time to hone those stories, to hone those uh, the, the uniqueness of our stories and do it in a unique way. And I am very, very positive about the future, uh, that when people come to Western Australia in the future as visitors, they will see and be enticed here, not just for great sporting events uh, at the stadium, uh, but they'll also be enticed here by world-class storytelling of our Indigenous and, and First Nations peoples, uh, they will see world-class dance, world-class writers, uh, world-class performers, uh, world-class visual artists and their works on, uh, on display. And they will also see and hear those unique stories that are Western Australia. And they'll hear them in all parts of Western Australia. They'll hear them in the regional communities of, of Western Australia. Uh, and they'll also hear them, of course, in the suburbs and the spaces and places around the CBD and some of our institutions that the Perth Theatre Trust currently has carriage over. So um, all of us as members of parliament can play a key role in, 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 uh, in uh, uh, supporting our cultural industries. It's why I'm very proud that this government, the McGowan government, has made the commitment in terms of the screen industry to the $100 million commitment for infrastructure that sounds uh, sound uh, uh, screen uh, uh, infrastructure, along with the $20 million um, uh, investment uh, uh, um, commitment, which will, of course, be uh, in, involve uh, uh, enticement and, uh, and uh, um, investment in our screen industry. We already have a great story in the screen industry in Western Australia. The um, uh, member for um, um, uh, Warren Blackwood and I and and I'm sure the member for Bunbury and uh, uh, the member of members uh, in the South West will be looking forward with great anticipation in the next few weeks to uh, Sydney Fest Oz, which is a, a magnificent and probably <coughs> now the premier uh, regional screen festival here in Western Australia, uh, which we'll celebrate through great support by the, lo by the government uh, and other uh, entities, uh, both locally and, uh, and the local governments there which will celebrate uh, uh, that um, West Australia has um, huge potential in the screen industry. And so we'll see with our, this government's $100,000 uh, prize, which is offered, of course, for the best film, uh, along with uh, 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 the ongoing commitment to support Sydney Festivals, um, helps add to the picture of uh, a burgeoning uh, screen industry in Western Australia. And that's why the infrastructure commitment, the $100 million commitment for infrastructure, the $20 million uh, commitment for in, uh, film incentives, all helps complete the picture to set ourselves up to be a place where not only great blockbusters have the potential to be filmed here, but we'll be able to continue to tell the great stories um, uh, in our regional communities. And the member for Kimberley highlighted Mystery Road, uh, so, uh, you know, been filmed, first two series filmed in the Kimberley. The third series, which has just been announced, will be filmed in Kalgoorlie. So the member for Kalgoorlie and the communities in, in the gold fields will be will beneficiaries of, of filming in that particular um, uh, regional part of Western Australia. This is all about the picture of how we position our community, our, our community uh, 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 culture and arts into the future. Now, this bill is a critical part of it because what this bill does is uh, it enables. Now, it enables a number of things, and uh, I will um, address some of the important um, questions that the member for Cottesloe highlighted, and I'll, I'll go through those, and if we want to tease some more out in consideration detail, I'm happy to do that. But what this bill essentially does, it's, it's a reform bill, and it, it seeks to improve the governance uh, structures uh, with regard to our, our arts and culture facilities uh, or assets. So, as you're aware, uh, uh, the Perth Theatre Trust, as it currently exists, is a, is a trust, uh, and it uh, has uh, essentially uh, um, authority over our state assets, including, of course, a number of our state performing arts uh, centres, uh, including those in the regions, like um, uh, the uh, the um, uh, Goldfields uh, Centre, the Goldfields. Um, um, 
Art Centre in Kalgoorlie and also, of course, uh, the Albany Entertainment Centre in, in Albany, as well as His Majesty's and other uh, concert hall, etc., and others in the, in the CBD. Now, what um, uh, the bill or the trust uh, will, will have uh, powers to manage all kinds of arts and cultural venues, including outdoor spaces such as the Perth Cultural Centre. Now, and this is an important concept. The Perth Cultural Centre has had huge investment, of course, with the opening of Boulevard at our new museum in, on my birthday last year, on the 21st November 2020. Uh, but, of course, the new museum is part of a number of cultural institutions within the, uh, uh, within the Perth Cultural Centre. And uh, the element of this bill that allows spaces and places uh, to be um, included um, gives great opportunity. Now, we, um, uh, um, in this bill, there, there is, of course, an, it, under Clause 4, I remember for um, Cottesloe, you, you highlighted um, uh, issues around Clause 4 and... Um, and the, uh, uh, the aspects uh, with regard to de declaration of places. The, 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 the thinking behind this is quite, um, is quite simple. Um, by allowing, uh, uh, through agreement, um, uh, a place or a space to be uh, uh, allowed to be declared uh, uh, means that um, a pursuit of a cultural or artistic nature can, can take place. Uh, it, it, um, uh, and a good example I would give, which would have been much more seamless, um, but albeit still very successful, was of course the um, uh, the, uh, the Highway to Hell, which the member for um, um, Bickerton highlighted in her contribution. Uh, essentially, um, under this bill, if this bill was, was in place, the Perth Theatre Trust, as the organising entity, uh, or the auspicing entity could have um, uh, sought through agreement to declare the nine kilometres of, of Canning Highway um, as a, uh, a, uh, a space for uh, a particular artistic endeavour. In that case, it would have been the Highway for Hell per, uh, Perth Festival event. Uh, it would have allowed for a period of time um, uh, for that to uh, place to be designated a cultural or artistic venue and uh, the uh, arrangements to ensure that the successful um, uh, delivery of that event uh, would have been able to take place. Now, as we know, in the case of Highway to Hell, um, the alternative way to do it was a whole range of um, uh, arrangements, MOUs and, uh, and essentially agreements by a whole range of parties. Uh, this, this bill would have allowed that to be, a much smooth, in my view, a much smoother process. But I do need to highlight, and I think it's one of the points the member for Cottesloe uh, 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 raised as an issue, uh, was uh, in regards to Clause 4. Now, there's a couple of things that are important, and this is the, it goes to transparency. The First of all, in the declaration of any place to be a venue, the Minister, um, um, uh, of course, would need to publish uh, uh, have, have, have that indication uh, intent published um, in the Gazette, um, and the declaration would be expressed to have an effect for a period specified in the declaration. Now, the reason why we wouldn't go for a, you know, a, a determinate no, um, time period in, in their member is because uh, all cultural events are different. In the case of the, in the case of the um, uh, Highway to Hell, for example, it was held on the 1st of March from memory. Um, there would have been uh, in preparations required for the highway, including the venues along the way for uh, the uh, concert infrastructure. Uh, so it probably would have been a period declared for uh, a, 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 a couple of days to enable that space to be uh, set and, of course, the event taking place as it did then on the, on the uh, Sunday. Um, the time period will vary because we might have uh, situations in the future where uh, Langley Park, for example, might be uh, utilised for a future uh, Perth Festival event or a Fringe Festival event uh, of a grand scale. Um, and again, uh, that might be a period that's, uh, again, through agreement, negotiated for a period of days, if not, 
even possibly for a period of a couple of weeks, depending upon the event and the extent of the event. Um, now, I do need to highlight um, uh, uh, that the, I, the, the Minister of the Day can only issue temporary declarations. So it's only temporary. It's not, a te it's, it's not determined to be of a permanent nature. Um, and so the Minister can only issue temporary declarations and they would only have an effect for a defined period to in, in, enable that event to take place. Um, the declaration issued by the Minister must be published in the, in the Government uh, Gazette. And it's important to, to um, uh, note that um, in Clause 3, which I think you highlighted, uh, there is a definition um, of venue, and that means a place declared under Section 4.1 to be a venue used or intended to be used wholly or partially for cultural or artistic purposes, or any other place used or intended to be used wholly or partially for cultural or artistic purposes. And place means any land building or structure, whether permanent or temporary, or any part of any land building or structure. Now, the motivation for the expansion of the def definition to include land stems from the limitations the government and uh, the PTT have faced in the past when wanting to use, utilise public spaces. Um, uh, and that example I gave was the public uh, was the, uh, the Perth Cultural Centre, um, where we've had in the past, uh, because of the definitions essentially under the current Act, um, uh, the, uh, there's been restrictions on. Uh, what has been able to be carried out. Now, we want the Perth Cultural Centre to be an active space, uh, and we want those institutions that are, uh, have a footprint on the Perth Cultural Centre, be they <coughs> Boulevard at the New Museum, be they the State Library, be they the Art Gallery West Australia, be they Pika, uh, be they even the State Theatre, we want to ensure that they have the capacity uh, to uh, not only collab be collaborative, uh, but also those spaces and uh, places within and outside of those venues uh, to be fully uh, activated. And that's why uh, that uh, occurs. Now, your concern uh, about the, um, and I think this is an important point, and it's a good question, the, uh, the um, concern about whether a Minister of the Future could just simply say, I'm taking that and decree. Can I assure you, Minister, it's that um, the Minister cannot impose this power. A place can only be declared a venue if the venue is used or will be used for cultural and artistic purposes and with the agreement of all parties involved. That's a very important con uh, con uh, concern. I think it's a good concern that you raise, but that is... Sorry, Minister, just to give you a question. Just for the uh, benefit of my colleagues in the Upper House, um, where, where does that derive from in the bill, or is that is that a, a, a sort of a statutory interpretation, if you like? I'll, um, I'll just seek. I'll, uh, I'm sure my advisers are listening to that. I'll just get a note just to refer yeah, to, to to answer what you're saying. Um, now, um, but I, I, I want to assure you that that, that is a that is a key key consideration. You also mentioned clause five. Um, which clause five is, is, is particularly uh, refers to the declaration of arts organisations to be resident resident companies. Um, now, th what this allows is this clause allows the minister of the day to declare an arts organisation to be a resident company for the purposes of the bill. And what it does is uh, it does provide the criterion an organisation must meet to be declared a um, resident company, and that's under sub clause. <laughs> Pardon me, sub clause one, and specifically to be ultimately declared um, a, uh, a uh, uh, or to fulfil the requirements to, for the minister to actually declare an arts organisation resident company, the arts organisation must satisfy the minister that the organisation con conducts activities at one or more trust venues, and it receives funding from a state government department agency or instrumentality. Now there are examples of organisations that. Um, uh, that are already regarded as resident companies and could be declared, uh, essentially. Uh, they, of course, are the Black Swan Theatre Company, the Barking Gecko Co. 3, which is a dance company, of course, the West Australian Ballet, WA Opera, Yuriak, and as examples. Now, um, what this clause essentially um, does um, is... is uh, it, it, there is the criteria that, it's, uh, that is, uh, it is a government-funded entity or receives government funding. Um, 
and uh, it, it allows uh, a, the uh, the organisation to um, uh, to be uh, uh, given some um, a status because of that declaration. Um, and uh, I'm happy to go through a little bit more in detail uh, as we come to that. The other one is the Clause 14 you mentioned, Member for Cottesloe, um, which uh, um, specifically uh, relates to... I'm just going to that. Uh, the ticketing um, services for activities not at trust uh, venues. Um, uh, this clause provides the trust cannot provide ticketing services for any activity outside a trust venue without the approval of the minister. So there isn't a ministerial approval uh, requirement there. The subclause one provides the minister must approve the trust providing ticketing services for any activity outside of trust venues. Um, and those subclauses two and three provide the minister may in writing exempt ticketing services for any activity or class of activities from the need for ministerial approval. An ex ex exemption can be unconditional or subject to conditions specified in the notice. Any notice issued by the minister may, re may be revoked or amended by the minister at any time by sending written notice to the trust. Uh, so this subclause 4 provides the minister with the power to give directions to the trust regarding how ticketing services may be provided. Um, now, uh, um, uh, um, this uh, ensures a layer of uh, transparency, of course, with regard to uh, ticketing services, uh, and of course that is through um, ultimate uh, approval um, by, um, by the minister. Now, I just wanted to... Um, uh, um, highlight that a number of members um, uh, talked about um, the importance of this bill and the essentially the amendment uh, which uh, relates to uh, the government's um, uh, the government's uh, um, um, screen production facility. This is very exciting. Uh, I did mention earlier that this was really. Uh, important. Um, this will be a game changer for the screen industry in Western Australia. And what this uh, bill essentially does um, is expands the use of trust venues and trust property to include production activities or any other activities of an artistic, recreational or educational nature and uh, the inclusion of a definition of production activity. So it is an enabling element of this bill. Now this is very important because when, of course, the uh, screen facility is constructed and the model of operation finalised and determined, um, uh, this will enable that production, um, that, uh, that screen facility uh, to uh, 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 obviously operate. And um, uh, uh, we, of course, are very keen for that screen facility to uh, deliver to a whole range of uh, the screen industry outcomes, post-production, pre-production, uh, smaller and larger scale uh, production, um, productions and filming. Um, uh, and that's one of the reasons why you have, you know, in any build for screen facilities, you have uh, uh, one or two or three um, sound stages. Uh, you have production, uh, high level production uh, uh, and technical uh, um, resources uh, in, uh, on site uh, and it's important to note why this screen screen facility is so important because it completes the jigsaw uh, currently in western australia we have fantastic films series uh, documentaries um, we have you know outback truckers i think one of our members was highlighting to us you know a very successful um, uh, um, uh, streamed um, um, enterprise made in uh, regional WA. Um, but uh, uh, so we have these great films that take or, or, or entities that are filmed in, in the regions and in and around Perth, uh, but uh, uh, any um, uh, major s film activity that's required in a, uh, in a film studio, of course, we don't have those facilities here. Uh, we will have them. So it completes that picture. And of course, it also means the post-production work uh, and the creation of opportunities for 
digital um, uh, digital screen technology and of course um, uh, VR uh, development ongoing development of VR and uh, other uh, digital uh, 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 enterprise can be encouraged further we want that to be seen as essentially a creative uh, hub uh, which of course not only provides and delivers outcomes for screen filming but of course nurtures encourages uh, activities in in all of the other genres including those genres around gaming for example which is huge uh, and uh, we have in western australia already uh, a number of uh, independent and small entities that are already delivering gaming uh, gaming product to the world uh, you uh, vr uh, product to the world um, and we want to see more of that uh, created and shared uh, 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 both creatively and economically throughout the world. So uh, that is an important component of, of this bill, is, is, is that support uh, of the establishment of our uh, film, um, our film uh, 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 inter, uh, infrastructure. Look, um, I, look, I might leave that there. I'm sure the member for Cottesloe may, have, may seek some clarification in um, <coughs> consideration and detail. But once again, I thank all the members, and there were uh, some 15 or so members who made a contribution to this bill uh, through their comments, and I thank them, uh, because that is very, very enlightening for me and very, very uh, um, uh, gives me great um, faith that the arts is held in uh, great esteem um, by so many members in this place, and you'll be great advocates and champions as you move about and celebrate your unique stories in your communities and the unique people who tell them. Thank you, Minister. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those contrary say no. Think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. A bill for an act to establish the Arts and Culture Trust and to repeal the Perth Theatre Trust Act 1979 and the Perth Theatre Trust Common Seal Regulations 1980 and to make consequential amendments to various acts and for related purposes. Is leave granted to proceed forthwith to the third reading? Leave is not granted. We now proceed to consideration in detail. to invite sure. into the chamber. Thank you, Speaker. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce you to my advisers. Uh, immediately to my right is Ms Margaret Butcher, from the, uh, representing the Perth Theatre Trust. Uh, and directly in front of me is Ms Sarah Risk, uh, Legal Counsel. And to my immediate opposite right is Ms Caroline O'Neill, who is my Policy Advisor for Culture and the Arts in my Ministerial Office. <coughs> Um, look, just for the for your assistance, um, uh, part uh, one, part one, uh, section three is the first section. I have questions. On. <coughs> The question is that clauses one and two stand as printed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. All those the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. <coughs> Clause three. 
Yeah, uh, Chair. Um, just, um, Minister, you were, you were talking about it before, the um, definition of a venue. Um, so on page four uh, at the bottom, uh, line 22, um, venue. And the question I was asking um, before was, um, was there some clarity on public or private? Um, and also in your uh, in your um, reply to the second reading speeches, you you mentioned the issue that there would be some negotiation. Um, now, clearly, on public land, um, it's clear that the the state um, should have control and will have control over that public land. Um, the question was, um, would it also go to a private uh, private land or a private venue, um, whether or not it's a a venue that's um, for the arts, and and I might say under venue, whilst you refer to that minister, um, I don't see that in that definition of venue, meaning um, uh, something that is used. Oh, actually, I stand corrected, minister, as I sit here in my slightly post uh, injection haze. Um, uh, you do partly for cultural or artistic purposes, but to get to the point, um, uh, yeah, does this? Does this cover private as well as public land and venues, or, or is it um, somehow implicit in the bill that it only covers public? Minister. So, look, uh, first of all, in <coughs> regards to um, could a private venue be considered to be declared by the minister, the only time that could happen is through agreement of the private landowner. But it is possible that in the future a, um, a, a, uh, an event might be identified to be able to be overseen by the, the, the trust uh, on a private um, site or private land. However, that would have to be agreed to by the owner. If the owner said no, you can't do it. So that's, that's uh, the issue around the private aspect. The other uh, elements, of course, relate to um, uh, land that may, or land or spaces or places that may be uh, overseen by government and other entities. Main roads, for example, in the case of um, um, Highway to Hell. Um, uh, uh, but again, there would be agreement required. Um, uh, or, of course, uh, land that may be vested in local government. Um, uh, so uh, the key aspect is agreement. Um, and the clause allows through uh, uh, um, that um, definition uh, to allow that to be declared as the venue for that artistic pursuit. But it is very specific, or it is very, very clear about the need for that to be through agreement. So it wouldn't be able to, I couldn't come to your house and say, I'm going to declare that your house is, and land is um, going to be a, uh, we're going to have a hip hop, up my garden, a hip -hop a festival. <laughs> hip hop festival, and you, and you uh, agree. It'd be an interesting hip hop festival at your house. I haven't been to your house, but I don't know how your accommodation. Rustic. <laughs> would I think the word. But I also just need to highlight that uh, um, uh, under um, this as this aspect is is uh, the same as the, is currently in the act which I refer you to sub, uh, uh, to clause, uh, clause three, Se sorry, section three, sub clause two. Um, and that is reads, if you go to, uh, on, in the bill itself, page two, the minister may from time to time declare by notice published in the government gazette, any building or structure constructed or adapted to be constructed or adapted and used, or to be used for public presentation of one or more of the performing arts to be a theatre for the purposes of this act. Okay, thank, thank you for that, Minister. Look, and again, this is for the information. Oh, I'm chair. Thank you very much. Um, just this is for the information of my colleagues in the upper house, so they don't go through the same um, query and debate. You, you said that it has to be my negotiation, but I, I'm still not clear where that's. I know that that is logically what would happen, but where is it actually required, either in this? Uh, act, or is it? Does the power derive from another act, or is it a, as I say, a statutory construction, uh, accepted statutory construction? I'm just <coughs> intrigued. Minister. Yeah. So can I, I just refer you to the current act, which is uh, uh, um, 
section three, subsection two, which ca currently exists, we are simply uh, extending that aspect to la uh, 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 land. So it's so, clear in that. I'm, yeah, I'm fine. I didn't yeah. want to. And, that, and the that's point. what we're doing was, with that. Yeah. Okay, good. So that, that's useful for the information. Um, in my next section is section four. So the question is that the clause stand is printed. All those in favour say aye. 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 Contrary say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, section four. <coughs> clause four. Clause four. Thank you very Sorry. much, Chair. Um, in um, this uh, section here, I think we've, we've now covered the question of, of public and private. Um, the first, uh, in 4.2, a declaration under this section may be expressed to have a, 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 a effect for a, a period specified in the declaration. Um, do you think it would be better to say must be expressed to have effect for a period specified in the declaration. And the reason I say that is, and, and that, so that time period may be indefinite. Um, it may be for two or three months. I fully understand the point you made, Minister, that you know different events. You know, the highway to hell may be a week. Um, the uh, other one, uh, other events may go over months or even years, perhaps. Um, but I would have thought that that making it time-bound gives a deal of certainty for everyone. Member, a good question. Member, uh, I do need to highlight the current Act, as it is, uh, it is as, as it is written, actually doesn't have any um, requirement with regard to uh, sure. uh, specifying the period. This essentially does. And as I said, um, the uh, uh, being too prescriptive would not allow the flexibility that would be required of a future event. I mean, I envisage, and I, and I think this is an important fact, a, a consideration. We will, in 2026, acknowledge, still to be determined how, uh, the bicentenary, bicentenary of the state in, in Albany, and then, of course, followed by, in 2029, the state. Um, I envisage, as we have that journey towards and beyond that, those dates, um, that there will be a whole range of opportunities that will uh, uh, um, be considered for celebration, for commemoration and for acknowledgement. Um, and so those would be, it may be of a short nature, in terms of a one-off event. They may be of a festival-based nature, which may go on for uh, several days, if not in the case of Perth Theatre events. Some of them go on for, um, can go on, or the, that period could go on for um, uh, you know, two to three weeks. So I don't want to be constraining on uh, the capacity, but I think the important fact is that there is a commitment to determine a period so that when the artistic nature of the event um, or entity is considered, that that then would determine how long it needs to be considered for in terms of um, the period for the declaration. Because uh, I would be it would be remiss of me to interfere in the creative juices of our creative um, people who uh, who. Um, come up with some magnificent ideas. And as you know, for example, member, um, your government, uh, your government or the previous government, um, had the highly successful Giants uh, event, which was part of the um, Perth Festival. If this legislation had been in place, the actual capacity to uh, declare in that case, you would have probably declared several uh, major sections of Perth City, or the Perth CBD, as the festival uh, uh, event, which would have meant there would have been a much more seamless um, uh, collaboration and capacity. Uh, I want to see more of those sorts of things happening, and so we want to have. We, I think we have addressed the fact that there needs to be a specified period, but we haven't determined what exactly that specified period is, because that is up to our creatives to essentially request. Yeah, thank thank you very much, Chair. Um, Member Thank you very Scott. much, Minister. Um, and look, I understand that, Minister, and I think I understood your point um, clearly, and that is um, 
uh, you're going to have different periods and so you've got in that clause a declaration under this section may be expressed to have an effect for a period specified in the declaration. So it's the period that you're indicating is variable. What I'm saying is wouldn't it be better if you always have to have a period specified, not, just, not that it's the same amount of time, it's only a period specified. Um, so saying must rather than may, it's just around that certainty, Minister, um, you know, for everyone involved, that, that they know very clearly, um, you know, uh, the, the period of time, whatever the period of time is, um, that this particular designation or this declaration, I should say, um, covers. So it was really that question of must, may, not altering the intent of the clause, but really saying, look, we should do this all the time, as opposed to sort of leaving it up to someone's discretion. And the question is that clause four standards printed. All those in favour say aye. Yeah, uh, you had a further question? I do. Apologies. Um, the um, question of consultation, um, particularly for local communities and local government, um, again, is there. Um, when you're declaring a place, so it might be, um, you know, the, uh, the playing fields at uh, uh, the rugby playing fields in Cottesloe. Um, uh, is there any particular requirement for consultation for for public land, uh, for example? Minister, Look, the the um, key word in the um, in the, uh, the bill is the word intent. Uh, so ultimately. Um, the ultimate declaration by the Minister of the day uh, to intend to, to declare uh, would uh, uh, obviously include a process that the Minister has arrived at that, having satisfied uh, a consultation process. Um, and uh, so that's where the, uh, the, uh, the clause relates to intent. Um, uh, again, because there are safeguards in here about uh, uh, the, the element of agreement is embedded, um, so um, uh, the minister of the day would arrive at the proclamation, if you like, uh, of the intent to declare a place uh, at the end of the process of consultation, um, and that would be. Uh, um, um, uh, and there is, and, and again, uh, the current provision in the, in the existing <coughs> act is the same. So we're not doing anything different. Thank you. The question is that clause four stand as printed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those the contrary say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause five. Member for Cottesloe. Thank you very much, Chair. Minister. Um, uh, look, going along the similar lines, and it may be a very quick answer on your part, and that is uh, the Minister may declare arts organisations to be resident um, companies. The, the, you know, as I, I appreciate that it's um, something that may not occur often, but uh, if you have a situation of groups being forced together where it's, there's some incompatibility or um, otherwise the requirement, does that consultation requirement also go to this um, clause um, where you're declaring an organisation to be resident companies, you know, whether it's in the, uh, you know, His Majesty's Theatre or some other venue, um, you know, can the minister um, simply say, look, I don't care, I've got the power and you're all going to work together in here, or is there some consultation? Because nearly, obviously, in all of those venues, I would expect there are current bodies that currently um, use those as their particular um, residence, if you like. Minister. So, um, Member, I think it's important to highlight that the declaring a resident company doesn't refer to a venue. So it's the capacity to actually declare the company um, uh, or declare a, re a company a resident <laughs> company, but it doesn't um, refer in the, in, in the clause to essentially a venue. It's not saying I'm declaring you a resident company at His Majesty's Theatre. Um, it, they're separate. They're, they're, not, they're, they're not one of the same. So now, why is this needed? The importance of this is, and the importance of this is actually um, that uh, this clause. Uh, recognises that publicly funded arts organisations are critical 
to the arts sector and to the into performing um, uh, performing arts sector. Um, and so uh, the, the so the, the, there is a need or importance for the minister of the day to be able to um, uh, publicly recognise that uh, the, the, um, that um, uh, or an entity. Um, and that underpins their importance to the sector. And specifically, the state-funded resident companies use the trust venues, which are publicly owned or leased, as their principal place of performance. And that exists now. Um, essentially, obviously, uh, how um, uh, Black Swan State Theatre, uh, um, uh, its principal place of performance is, of course, the State Theatre. However, it regularly holds productions. I went to one recently uh, at uh, His Majesty's. And also, of course, in other venues around the state, when, when and if um, the State Theatre uh, Company, uh, through one of its productions, is touring. So, um, uh, um, um, so that is why, essentially, this uh, element is, um, is needed. Um, and uh, essentially, as I, I did highlight in my second reading response, uh, examples of some of our existing companies that essentially are already regarded as um, as, a, as a resident company, and I highlighted them as our WA Ballet, WA Opera, uh, State Theatre, uh, or oh, sorry, Black Swan State Theatre, Barking Gecko, etc. Um, uh, so it's important to to understand that it is about um, declaring the resident or the capacity to declare a resident company. It doesn't refer to a venue. In fact, wait. In fact, to be a resident company, here you are. There you are, so here we go. <laughs> In fact, to be a resident company, you already need to be an existing user of a trust venue. So, for example, and, and that I, I can refer you to um, uh, clause, uh, uh, sorry, part, part one, clause five, um, where uh, sub, uh, subsection um, Members. one. Given the time, I will vacate the chair until the ringing of the bells. Madam Acting Speaker. Um, Minister for yeah. Arts and Heritage. If, the if, if I could ask my uh, advisers to join me again yes. in the uh, chamber. <coughs> If anyone's going to spill it, it'll be me. So again, just if I can uh, reintroduce um, my advisers this evening, Madam Acting Speaker, to my direct right is Ms Margaret Butcher um, from Perth Theatre Trust, the department, is that yes. correct? Uh, Sarah Risk is immediately in front of me. She's legal counsel. And Ms Caroline O'Neill is my policy advisor for culture and the arts in my ministerial office. The question is that Clause 5 be standards, standards printed. Chair, the Minister was just uh, warming to complete his answer to my um, query on that. Go ahead, Minister. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes, yeah, so, um, so in, clar in, 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 in concluding my comments, um, the uh, uh, um, declaring resident company doesn't refer to a venue. Um, and it, it, ultimately, the uh, uh, a, a declaration protects companies from future, gov from future government decisions that may wish to put interests of commercial ahead of state-funded uh, arts organisations. Um, this is important because uh, we need to remind, uh, be reminded that uh, these institutions, be they His Majesty's, be they Perth Concert Hall, be they uh, other uh, venues are essentially their primary purpose. Yeah, of course, is essentially um, uh, for um, uh, arts and culture purposes. 
In fact, that's fine. Um, Chair, for your information, the next clause that I wanted to, um, or the next section I wanted to talk on was um, trusts powers. And that's number uh, 11 on page 8. They do five. Clause 11. They do five. So then, I say that again. The question is that clause five stand as printed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. All those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that clauses six to ten stand as printed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. All those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. And now we move to number 11. Clause 11. Thank you uh, very much, Chair. Um, Minister, just in relation to um, Clause 11, the Trust's powers, um, and if we go to Part 3, um, the Trust may, for the purpose of performing any of its functions, do all of the following, <clears throat> and it lists down a range of, um, uh, of things that, that the Trust can do. I'm just wondering if you could let me know what ministerial oversight there is on the trust in relation to those matters. <coughs> Again, excuse me. Um, and um, otherwise, what limit is there on the um, trust in those transactions? And I get, you know, my concern is um, th whether the um, you know the trust could enter into arrangements which bind the state ultimately, um, but lead to you know, financial distress, if you like, because of the magnitude of the arrangement or the deal. So I'm, and I'm just wondering where where does the minister intercede in all of that in terms of making sure that the trust is not going too far or doing things that the government would not approve of? Good question. I thank the minister. Uh, sorry, thank the member. Um, I just wonder if uh, um, uh, you, this, this section, as you've highlighted, talks about... Um, uh, the purposes or the powers. Um, essentially, um, the uh, whilst it outlines those powers, there is a clause which is clause 12, um, the following clause which talks about the general restrictions on the trust's powers. And um, um, uh, I refer you to subsection 3, which relates to the trust must not exercise the following powers without the minister's written approval. So um, that obviously relates to disposal of property, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, and that um, I think uh, allays your concern. The question is that clause 11 stand as printed. All those in favour say aye. All those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that clause 12 stand as printed. All those in favour say aye. All those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Under clause 13. Um, Minister, just in relation to um, clause 13, um, clause 13 to the Treasurer may by written notice give to the Trust exempt any business arrangement or class of business arrangement from the operation of subsection 1, um, which says that the Minister has to approve those things, either unconditionally or on conditions specified in the above notice. And I, I'm, I'm just wondering whether the, there's a risk there um, with those arrangements that, they, that, again, you end up with a situation of the trust doing things because the minister's exempted them from that ministerial control? Um, or are you satisfied that the minister always has uh, the ability to exercise control over the trust? Yep. Again, it is a good question. Member, if I could refer to the current Act, uh, which, of course, um, uh, is within, embedded within the new or within the um, uh, or, or reflected as part of the uh, carried over. That is on page of the Act, page 13, uh, subsection 3 of clause 16 from memory. Sorry, 17. Um, and I refer to subse uh, subsection 3. The trust mu must not exercise a power conferred by subsection 2 TA in relation to a business arrangement unless the terms and conditions of that business arrangement are terms and conditions approved by the minister and the treasurer in respect of A, that business arrangement, or B, business arrangements of that class, or C, business arrangements generally. So again, the oversight is, is essentially prescribed. Chair. Um, uh, Minister, just in, in relation to that, do you think there's a 
there should be some uh, time aspect to that, and that is that 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 is that arrangement is reviewed. So in section 13.2, um, where the where the trust has been given exemption, um, do you think that that should be uh, time bound in some way, um, or do you think that the again you're adequately protected as it is? Important to highlight that um, essentially uh, it is the it is the treasurer that uh, uh, gives approval, um, and uh, there's a process obviously related to any business case that might be presented. So that um, uh, that uh, uh, um, oversight provision essentially lies with the treasurer. <laughs> Seven zero. Oh, okay. right. yeah. So the, the question is, is that clause thirteen stand as printed? All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that clause fourteen through to sixty nine stand as printed. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those in against say no. <laughs> I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Okay. Yep. Then Going to section um, 70. Look, Minister, this is not a, a perhaps just a general comment, and it's in relation to the comment I made in my uh, my contribution to the second reading speech. Um, it was around, you know, how do we make sure that we don't end up um, stifling public debate, whether we find it irksome or not too much. And as I, I appreciate that there are extremes in everything, and typically you don't want to see those extremes, but um, within the normal uh, sort of set of views in the community, whether we find them irksome or not, that we don't overly restrict it. But um, it may be uh, hard for you to give a specific answer on that, but I am interested in, in your view of that at least. <coughs> Member for the question. Um, look, um, uh, the important aspect is um, under subsection 16 um, D. Um, uh, there's a requirement for a recommendation to the Minister for Policies for letting of the operation of Perth Theatre Trust and facilities and spaces. So, it, look, in terms of the ACL is issue, um, uh, the um, uh, policy is currently under review. And uh, for good reason, the policy needs to be a robust uh, um, policy that reflects the values of the uh, organisation. I, I think also that reflects the um, primary purpose of our state-run venues, and they are always, or, or have always been primarily focused on um, artistic and, uh, and uh, of a cultural nature. Um, now, the uh, uh, Trust's required to, um, uh, uh, has made a decision, well, first of all, made a decision to rescind the um, uh, uh, the non-approval of uh, the application by ACL to hire the venue in, in Albany. Uh, so they rescinded that decision and uh, also consequently they uh, had decided to um, uh, set a course to review the policy. Ultimately any policy will be uh, subject to approval by myself or by minister, the Minister of the Day. Look, however, this is an interesting case because you, I think, already uh, yourself, a member for Cottesloe, have, have uh, uh, I suppose, um, uh, um, referred to circumstances that um, where there may be consideration for a, a um, venue hire to not be um, uh, agreed to or, or allowed. I think the first important aspect is what are the purposes of our state-run uh, entities? Uh, they are, and it's embedded in the in the in the in the act itself, that they are places of cultural and artistic um, endeavour. Uh, so that's one important element of consideration. Uh, second of all, um, the arts in its its own uh, um, history shows that the arts itself pushes boundaries and uh, and explores a whole range of issues, uh, and that is a an important uh, aspect of. Uh, uh, the arts uh, more broadly and in fact in many respects the arts is a place where ideas uh, and issues are explored and and in many respects become controversial um, it's the very nature of um, of, of, of human uh, exploring human uh, uh, endeavor and human uh, ideas um, 
but we know in history that there are occasions where uh, entities um, uh, that um, are of a, a very extreme nature uh, challenge any policy. And it's interesting to note that um, there are, uh, for example, uh, some of our institutions, Australian institutions like um, the Sydney Opera House, for example, have, uh, in the case of the Sydney Opera House, quite a flexible um, uh, higher policy, uh, which is particularly focused on, again, uh, that that is a, an institution that is of artistic and cultural uh, significance, and therefore that is the primary purpose or usage uh, of that venue. Um, and of course, we also know that there are a number of uh, entities, be they universities. You, you sort of you highlighted, I think, uh, universities uh, in your um, second reading contribution. Uh, we know that there are universities that also have policies about their venues. Now, those universities, remember, are publicly funded. However. Uh, they have uh, higher policies or venue uh, uh, usage uh, uh, policies that um, uh, by and large have, and I think only recently in the UWA's experience, only recently in the recent period um, refused, uh, um, I think, a, um, well, a person considered a far right, uh, uh, with far right views with regard to the Muslim faith, um, and those were refused. Uh, ultimately, um, what this Act continues to embed is that um, any policy uh, that is uh, developed will be subject to ministerial approval. Uh, that doesn't change, and uh, as, as we know, the current status is that the policy is, uh, is, uh, is being reviewed by, by the Trust. At all? So the question is that clause 70 stand as printed. All those in favour say aye. All those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clauses. The question is that clause 71 to 96 stand as printed. All those in favour say aye. All those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is, is that the long title be agreed to? All those in favour say aye. All those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. That includes consideration and detail. reading of the bill. The question is, is that leave be granted? Uh, all those in favour say aye. aye. All those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, move that the bill be read a third time. The question is that right? Uh, I'll just stand to uh, make a very brief contribution and I'd like to thank the Minister for um, entertaining my questions and in particular to thank the Minister's uh, staff and the departmental staff um, for coming here today. This is the culmination. As the minister knows, there have been discussions about this over a, a long period of time in the last government and this government, so pleasing to see the bill come before the House. Overall, it is a, a bill that um, you know, reflects uh, what the community wants out of the, um, the Theatre Trust or the Perth Theatre Trust as it was um, and reflects a modernisation of that. So. Um, uh, you know, there were some concerns. I think the minister has largely answered those. My colleagues in the other place will almost certainly uh, interrogate that uh, a little more. Um, I still do think there is a little bit of a uncertainty about the, the formal requirements for private venues, but I think the minister's um, uh, made every endeavour to try and answer that question, and we just need to see um, to make sure that in the existing act that that all of the requirements for consultation uh, and agreement are there, but, but otherwise, um, thank the minister and commend the bill. Thank you. 
Good to ask. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you, um, Madam Deputy Speaker. In uh, closing the debate in the third reading, can I just also uh, thank uh, the member for Cottesloe for um, his uh, cooperation during consideration of detail, uh, and the other members that, of course, uh, spoke during the second reading debate of this bill. Can I also thank Caroline O'Neill, uh, my policy adviser from Culture and the Arts, Ms Sarah Risk, uh, Legal Counsel, and I wish her the very best for her, uh, her uh, uh, birth of her second child coming up in November, and to Margaret Butcher, um, Perth Theatre Trust and, and, depart and from the department. And can I also just place on record my appreciation uh, to, the, to Morgan uh, Solomon and the uh, existing Perth Theatre Trust members um, for their uh, stewardship of, uh, the, uh, uh, of the trust uh, over uh, the period of time that I've been Minister for uh, Culture and the Arts. And, uh, and also reflect on um, the late Max Kay, who was a uh, former, he yes. was he a, a former, he was a former member of the Perth Theatre Trust. Uh, Max and I, I, I knew Max from earlier times, but uh, uh, Max, in many ways, epitomised the spirit of uh, of theatre in Western Australia. Many people would remember him going to his uh, civic theatre shows there in uh, North uh, Perth. Um, but to all of the trust uh, rep representatives who are on the trust board, uh, both past and present, can I thank them for their uh, contribution, and particularly the chair, uh, uh, Mo uh, Morgan uh, um, Solomon. And uh, I commend the bill to the House. Thank you, Minister. I move that the bill now be read a third time. All those in favour say, is that right? All those in favour say aye. All those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. A bill for an act to establish the Arts and Culture Trust and to repeal the Perth Theatre Trust Act 1979 and the Perth Theatre Trust Common Seal Regulations 1980 and to make consequential amendments to various acts and for related purposes. Orders of the day. Government Business Order of the Day number two, Children and Community Services Amendment Bill 2021, second reading, adjourned debate. Member Carlson. Madam Speaker, thank you very much. Um, again, um, I do have to um, uh, caveat my presentation here to say that um, um, it won't be the scintillating contribution that the member for VAS would have given uh, to this bill, but. Uh, uh, in order to allow the government to conduct its business, um, I am the lead uh, in this debate in the absence of the excellent member for VAS uh, being here. And obviously, the Honourable Nick Duran is our uh, shadow spokesperson for this, and uh, he is in the other place uh, and will contribute to the debate um, there. So, um, I do indicate at the outset that um, the opposition is supporting this bill. Um, and I will make a uh, brief contribution uh, to the bill. I um, uh, will not be going to consideration in detail, Minister, um, unless any of your own members wish to do it, but I will leave that to the other place um, in terms of any detailed uh, examination of particular issues. Look, just uh, in terms of this bill, this is a very important bill coming before the parliament. Um, as all members here know, um, this came out of the 2017 Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse, um, and that there was a, uh, a recommendation uh, that state and territory governments enacted legislation um, coming out of that review. I, I will say I, I am at a personal level disappointed that this bill has made way for, um, for other bills, for example, the Row 8. Um, the Bealia Wetlands Bill. I can't understand how the government has prioritised the Bealia Wetlands Bill before this bill. This goes to the core of the safety of the children in our community. This bill was substantively debated, or in fact, I think, Minister, this bill actually went through this chamber in the last parliament with our support. And uh, I would have hoped that it could have come forward earlier. And I, uh, I'm not trying to, Minister, um, uh, blame you in any sense for that. I appreciate this is a lead sort of framework, but. I would have thought that, given uh, the Bealia wetland um, matter was completely within the hands of the government for the next four years, why they would push that bill before this is beyond me. But in any case, I guess the important thing is that the bill is before the House, um, and as I say, a, a very important matter 
um, for uh, protecting, um, the, you know, amongst the most vulnerable, one of the most vulnerable groups, groups in our community, and that is um, children um, from predatory um, sexual abuse. Um, this bill amends the uh, Children and Community Services Act 2004, um, and as I said, implementing the recommendations of the 2017 Statutory Review of the Children and Community Services Act 2004 and the 2017 Royal Commission into Institutional Response to Child Sex Abuse. Um, the, a large proportion of the bill uh, mirrors the uh, 2019 bill, which was passed. Uh, in the Assembly, but um, was not um, prioritised in the Council uh, in the last Parliament. Um, I, I would ask, Minister, and not for me and not for this Parliament, but if it, was, if it is possible, Minister, for you to show the, any differences between the 19 bill and this bill, it'd be very, and my colleagues in the other place, and it would short circuit some debate. Um, uh, if you could produce, or if your officers could produce uh, uh, any any differences between the 19 bill and this bill, just so, um, given that it's been well debated in this place before, um, any any issues that are that 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 members may wish to be aware of um, uh, when it comes to the other place. Um, uh, I do note, um, uh, subsequent to the 19 bill, there was a standing committee on legislation um, uh, review of this. So, uh, um, uh, and uh, uh, that that uh, made a number of recommendations, and um, recognising the strong support for the bill on all sides. Um, I won't um, go through that in detail, but there was concern expressed in the last parliament as to why um, the only group that was identified um, for the mandatory reporting were the uh, people in religious ministry, which was the fifth of the categories of the five groups that were identified by the Royal Commission who should uh, uh, be required to have mandatory reporting. Um, uh, in, in relation to any suspicion or knowledge of child sex abuse matters. I do note that I've, uh, my understanding is that the, uh, this bill, in fact, has amended that, and now all five categories uh, are included uh, in the bill. Um, I, uh, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about that further on, but um, look, certainly um, very appropriate that that, that occurs. Um, and I will say I know there was some discussion and have been discussion in other places about the, um, the issues around the confessional in the church. I will say my, this is my personal view um, in relation to that matter is that I do not think that that is an excuse and I think that was a view that was broadly expressed by members here. I think in whatever guise, if you're aware of child sex abuse, then you must report that to the police. And, that's an unequivocal um, uh, point. I, I, I understand that there are, uh, you know, for religious reasons, there are some people that that believe that if you um, require uh, religious uh, uh, people in religious ministry to reveal issues that are revealed in the confessional, it may undermine that process and it may undermine the rehabilitation. I, I ultimately I understand those arguments, but I don't accept those arguments. Um, I, I think it is no different to any group, and uh, uh, but but I do respect that that people might have a, a different opinion for good reasons, not that they want to protect sexual predators, but that they see there's some greater good in that. Um, but as again, once again, I clarify that that I think the direction the government have taken on this is entirely appropriate. Um, uh, so it is good to see that um, uh, good to see that. Uh, the government have taken on the recommendations. In, in fact, and you can, I'm, I'm happy to stand corrected, Minister, because as I say, uh, I'm certain the Minister for VAS would not need this clarification. But uh, my understanding is, but I think all of, all but one of the recommendations in the Standing Committee uh, uh, on Legislation review, the Joint Committee on Legis uh, or yeah, Joint Committee on Legislation. Um, uh, uh, all but one of their recommendations was adopted, um, and I congratulate the minister for, for taking good progress into that committee's um, good work. Um, the, um, just in relation to the proposed extraordinary powers of investigation designated to officers um, by the uh, CEO, and clause um, 69 does delete over a 
a page of powers, um, but then clause 71 replaces it with 10 pages of powers to investigate any offence um, in the bill. Uh, and the bill also introduces out-of-home care workers as mandatory reporters uh, as well. And as I've said, that um, very much aligns with my view that anyone in a, in a formal role that's aware of abuse of children, or in fact anyone who's aware of abuse of children, um, should be reporting that matter so that we're protecting our youth. Um, um, there were some, or have been, amongst um, some people I've spoken with, resourcing concerns given the extra work being required and likely, likely extra support being um, accessed by um, care leavers uh, is the word here, but um, I guess it's uh, caregivers, it's not uh, leavers is a, a, the wrong word, but uh, accessed by caregivers. So there are going to be extra components which will be now re required in care plans, so cultural support plans for Aboriginal children uh, and Torres Strait Islander children. Uh, leaving, care, uh, leaving care plans from age 15 and the child's participation and wishes. Um, uh, also, um, uh, there is a concern that previously the government's underspent the care lever supports um, available until the age of 25, and so that the budget, um, the budget uh, uh, has not been fully utilised in that area, and um, yet there are waiting lists um, that were cited in the Auditor General's report as being a uh, an issue, and uh, and uh, I guess it is. Uh, the, the question is: Are extra resources being uh, provided to allow and to assist with the preparation of those more detailed plans? Um, and uh, uh, there was also an issue in terms of, and I guess this is a sort of broader thing: the implementation slash enforcement of this bill. Um, uh, will, the, um, will the department have the required resources for that? Because there will be a larger compliance component, um, if you like, for the department in relation to this, and obviously very important work, but now there are these extra categories. There is going to have to be audit and follow up to make sure um, that this, uh, this new law is being complied with um, appropriately. So um, just um, in relation to the uh, just, Minister, and this is, I'll finish pretty well on this point. Just the um, five nominated groups, um, are, are there going to be separate proclamation dates for the different groups, or are, um, are they going to be done together? Now, I understand there had been some discussion on this or some debate on it, and there was a view expressed that there was a requirement for consultation with certain of those other groups, the other four groups. Um, the point was made to me that um, the religious uh, uh, leaders were not afforded that level of consultation, and so the view was, is there really a requirement for the government to undertake uh, that detailed consultation, or should the government really be looking to proclaim this for all groups uh, at the same time? Um, in any case, uh, and I'm sure it's the minister's wishes, I know the minister's genuine intent in relation to this matter, um, uh, but otherwise that you know, these, these, should be, these groups should be proclaimed as soon as possible uh, so that we ensure children are getting the best protection that they can possibly get um, as soon as possible. Otherwise, as I say, um, um, uh, not subject. Um, I'm grateful if the minister can answer those queries, but otherwise um, this bill has the full support of the opposition. Thank you. Thank you. Mm, member for <coughs> Forestville. Thornley. Thornley. Thank, thank sorry, you. sorry. Thank you, Acting <laughs> Speaker. I'm, I'm very pleased to rise to speak to this bill and uh, offer my full support for the Children and Community Services Amendment Bill 2021. And um, note that I uh, last had the chance to uh, uh, present a grievance to the Minister uh, about this matter. This. Uh, uh, the, the circumstances behind uh, the uh, justification for this kind of legislation late last year. And in that grievance, I um, mentioned a matter 
that occurred at uh, my old school, uh, a school that I left nearly 41 years ago, uh, but uh, it was an event that happened uh, relatively recently at Trinity College, uh, and it was on a school rugby trip uh, in uh, 2017, on a school rugby trip to Japan, when a uh, young fellow was um, sexually assaulted by his peers. And uh, terror, and, and, I, and my, my heart goes out to the young fellow. The, the pain that he suffered, physical and emotional, I think the bullying that occurred in the lead up to that event, and then the subsequent events, it, it just got worse because two teachers who were on that trip were aware, the court found that they were aware of what happened, and yet they didn't report it. Uh, so I think uh, any public discussion around this area to make it clear to people that they have this reporting duty, uh, it's, it's absolutely vital that we all in this community, in our communities, realise that uh, when we see these sorts of offences, we have an obligation to report. And one of the things that becomes very apparent in this legislation, uh, and uh, the Minister expressed it well when she introduced this legislation into the Parliament, was that uh, those who are ministers of religion, they too have a, uh, an absolute responsibility to report. And in fact, I, I believe that in the, um, the rollout of the targeted training uh, of different groups, that in fact we're going to start with uh, the ministers of religion. And um, th this actually, uh, I, I think, is, is very well justified. Um, members will know that I was um, born in the UK and indeed spent the first four and a half years of my life in the UK. And at that time, my parents were wondering, well, which school will we send our eldest son to? And uh, they were very excited, although I think they were just only beginning to realise the financial stress that they might have been about to place themselves under. They, they put my name down for a school called Ampleforth. And um, I, uh, I think I'm very relieved I never went to Ampleforth. Uh, but um, Ampleforth had all sorts of uh, cachet around it and uh, uh, beautiful grounds in North Yorkshire and wonderful sporting traditions and uh, a whole lot of uh, alumni who'd achieved all sorts of remarkable things. But in recent times, it's come out that there were some terrible sexual abuses that occurred at that school. And um, I uh, know that at the time, the abbot of the school, um, a, uh, a Basil Hume, who then later went on to be uh, the Archbishop of Westminster, the Cardinal, a Cardinal in the Catholic Church, and a very respected man. But um, Abbot Hume, as he was at the time, was aware of some of the sexual offending that occurred by a particular uh, priest or uh, monk, in fact. The, the Am Ampleforth uh, is a school that's run by the Benedictines, um, the Benedictine monks. Basil Hume was aware of the offences and decided to shift this offender along. It, instead of acting on the offences and reprimanding, instead of reporting to the police, decided, well, we'll just shift this fellow along. And I heard the comments uh, from the uh, uh, Minister for Water, member for Bass and Dean, and he addressed the uh, problems that have been so <coughs> apparent in the uh, Christian Brothers Order, where I think the same thing has occurred. Problems would arise. People in the hierarchy of the, uh, the brothers uh, in the Catholic Church, uh, in all sorts of institutions, would hear about problems and then just quietly move people on. They wouldn't report them to police. One can only speculate why they didn't go about reporting to police. Perhaps there was a bit of public relations management. Perhaps there was a genuine view that if we gave brother so-and-so Father so-and-so, a fresh start, 
that they might be a, a reformed character. Perhaps they felt that the matter could be dealt with internally. The evidence doesn't say so, though. The evidence doesn't support this. In fact, the evidence says very clearly that when you move these people on, they would just start again. And there are some uh, really heart-wrenching documentaries about the awful things that have occurred in various religious orders around the world. So, um, and I do say around the world, not just in Australia, not just in the UK. These things have occurred uh, in many countries countries, tragically, it seems to be something that is a problem in religious institutions where there's a culture that, that allows this secrecy to, to develop, to ferment, a, a, allow, a secrecy culture that uh, also is backed up with a degree of arrogance that says that we know best, we can move things on, we can solve the problem. So. These problems just don't get dealt with at all and, in fact, are allowed to proliferate, to, to uh, carry on. So I think it is very appropriate, and I, I noted the comments from um, uh, the member for Cottesloe, that, that uh, we, we are going to tackle this uh, by, I think, first rolling out the training and the targeting of the, these various groups to ministers of religion. And uh, uh, the issue of uh, what's said in the confessionals should stay in the confessionals. I think we've gone so far beyond that. We just have seen too many of these uh, tragic, se tragically serious errors, these damaging errors occur that we just can't tolerate that approach. There has to be a recognition that uh, the law of the land must stand and must be respected. We shouldn't leave it to interpretations of uh, those in various religious orders at all. But I noticed over the weekend a very interesting article. Uh, in It was published in The Observer in the UK, and it uh, was uh, its titled Why Public School Boys Like Me and Boris Johnson Aren't Fit to Run Our Country. And it de develops this theme of this institutionalised idea of grandeur, of uh, a, a special uh, sanctity that goes with some of the, the public schools, as they call them in the UK, quite confusingly, but that's all part of the, the confusing use of language that j develops this code of uh, brotherhood, I suppose, around those, because they, really, these are, are private schools, but they call themselves public schools. I believe the history behind it is that the exam results would be publicly available or something like that. Uh, so public school boys, as they usually are, the the, the strange goings on and and the the very deforming nature of sending young young boys to a boarding school where they're forced to behave like little men. But then at night, they're still crying for their mums, their brothers and sisters, for their, their pets at home. And how deforming that is on their characters. Uh, and and this, this article by Richard Beard goes into that in, uh, and expresses it very well and highlights that it actually entrenches a culture where you do everything to conform. The last thing that at a school like Eton or an Ampleforth or uh, another private school elsewhere and in this country. You don't want to stand out too much. Uh, if, if you let it be known to your peers that you have a um, fascination with uh, something like, you know, it could be a hobby like collecting butterflies, you can be sure that if you if word gets out that that's your passion, that others will seek to belittle you and, and, and poke fun and mock you. That, that is the experience of many. And so you end up by being the sort of person who, who takes nothing seriously, uh, is very cold, and I think it was Mahatma Gandhi who said uh, that there's a hardness of heart of the educated, and he said that was his feeling about those who had had that 
public school education that was so treasured by the English ruling classes that they had that hardness of heart. And uh, that was a hardness of heart that was developed in those schools because it was the only way people could survive. It's a bit of an extension of the whole stiff upper lip idea. Um, but the belief, and it's held still by many, and indeed by many who are of a, a, a social standing in the UK that would never have the opportunity to go to one of these public schools, the belief is that, oh, that's the perfect training for leadership, that you could be a leader. And in fact, the experience suggests that in the UK at the moment, I think out of the uh, uh, the, the cabinet members, I think two thirds of them are, are all educated at these expensive private schools. It's, it, parents send their kids to these schools because they believe it is the ticket to success for their kids. They believe it is the way of ensuring that they they become cabinet ministers or uh, captains of industry. Uh, it guarantees that they're going to have a certain income level. Thank goodness our Australian society has so moved on from that. We're, we're so different. But I'm always nervous when, when I hear people sort of making strong reference to how the UK operates. I think there are so many areas where we have to really watch out because they have got it wrong on so many areas, on so many levels, in so many areas. <laughs> Indeed, it's a good example. And in fact, uh, it's an, an interesting example uh, in, in many ways. And uh, um, I, uh, I know that they're very proud of their uh, success rate with vaccination. But, uh, you know, when they've got a death rate of 130,000 people, uh, some mishandling there, mixed messaging. And, and perhaps it gets back to this point that uh, 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 Richard Beard was making in his... his uh, article that it's it's just you don't take things too seriously and and also and and Richard Beard makes this point in his article that um, it's a bit the idea that uh, well you can live with this we will your know, social injustice we'll just live with it COVID will just live with it it's a continuation of that mentality it's an idea that uh, you can just uh, uh, have these things uh, sure for your own personal gain do whatever it takes um, and, and yes the culture of secrecy that's that's all acceptable um, but fit in, show no weakness, and uh, make sure that you're not ridiculed for anything. But uh, uh, it's um, it, 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 this this conforming, but a coldness of heart. That's the point that he keeps coming back to, um, and and of course uh, have. Uh, very strong ideas of where your role is in society and what your social rank is and uh, uh, make sure that uh, those who are below you are well and truly aware of it and have a almost coded language so refer to a, a public school a private school as a public school all that sort of thing it's all part of it um, but um, I, I'm very pleased that in this legislation we see a uh, uh, a real um, meat on the bones coming about what the responsibilities of people in positions of responsibility actually is, to make sure that those who are in a position to report are obliged to do so. Uh, and I think um, that's uh, something that uh, I, I know teachers are now well and truly aware of. I had lunch with some school principals from my electorate on Friday. And this topic came up. They were well and truly aware of their reporting responsibilities, and uh, they see it as as a, a part of their role to be uh, on the lookout for this sort of thing and to know what the procedures are to understand that. Uh, so it's it's really um, important that we we back up what is a, a good human instinct, a good human desire to to make this reporting that we back it up with a good legislative framework and a good administrative process that lets them do that, knowing that they're doing the right thing, knowing that it's uh, what society expects of them, and that they are just doing uh, what the law requires. So that, that all makes perfect sense. So, Acting Speaker, I'm um, uh, very pleased to support this legislation. Uh, I, um, I, I, I'm 
somewhat uh, um, surprised that it didn't make it through the last parliament, uh, but uh, that's um, uh, something that uh, um, only those who uh, uh, sought to um, impede its passage can account for. Uh, but uh, I'm very pleased that uh, I, to note that there's, there's uh, support on all sides of the parliament uh, in this 41st parliament. That's a good thing. And uh, I think it is exactly what the community expects of us. So, um, Acting Speaker, I commend the bill to the House. Thank you, Member Thornley. Uh, the question is the bill we read for the second time. All those so, Minister. Acting Speaker, yep. yes, I'd, I'd like to take an opportunity to address some of the issues um, that have been raised in this important debate and uh, start by thanking uh, all the members um, who have contributed. And uh, yes, it is frustrating that we uh, got so far with this bill in the last parliament. In fact, it had gone to the um, committee, to a committee in the upper house in the other place. Um, we had uh, accepted all but one of the recommendations of that committee and were ready to uh, proceed when, um, unfortunately, uh, the uh, debates were cut short. Um, there, there was a um, it was frustrating, I think, for everyone. But it did give us an opportunity to work through some of the issues uh, that were raised through the debate. And I think as a result, uh, today, we have a, um, a better bill. And uh, I'll go through that in a, in a bit of detail um, this evening. Um, so can I just um, begin by, uh, again, um, acknowledging the important issues that are, are being addressed in this bill. Um, they do cover a few different issues, but at the centre of them is the um, principle that in our uh, Children and Community Services Act, um, we want child safety and the consideration for the best interests of the child to be at the centre of um, of all of our uh, all of our deliberations as well as our actions. Uh, this is an expectation both of the community and this government um, that child safety should be central to everything we do. Changes to expand mandatory reporting reinforce that children's safety. Uh, and their right to safety and protection from harm is paramount. Ensuring stability and continuity for children in care, because uh, um, a child's significant relationship and stability of their placement is important to their well-being. The second consideration in the bill, Acting Speaker, is addresses the um, issue of promoting stability and continuity for children in care. This is crucial uh, because a child's significant relationships and stability of their placement is central to their wellbeing. This bill implements recommendations from the review of the Act that took place in 2016-2017, uh, a process that we largely inherited from the previous government and the lion's share of the work was done by the uh, department uh, under the last government. Um, this bill implements recommendations from that review to prioritise a child's significant relationships and stability of their placement. The third objective of the bill makes positive changes to cultural connection and safety. These changes are so important because, shamefully, over half the children in our child protection system in WA are Aboriginal and because connection to community and culture is essential for those children. The evidence tells us that connection to culture for Aboriginal children is a protective factor. In fact, the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sex Abuse made that point very clearly. Um, evidence, uh, the, the connect, that connection to culture is also associate, associated with better outcomes across emotional, social and physical health. So the McGowan government remains committed to the best interests of children and young people in WA, and I hope that we're demonstrating that through this comprehensive bill uh, that, we're, um, that we are in the process of debating. Uh, we won't shy away from the work needed to be done to protect children from harm, particularly sexual abuse, and this bill clearly demonstrates that commitment. Um, I, I just wanted to address some of the issues um, that were raised by various members, and I will work through that, but can I notice there are two amendments um, that we have um, uh, we, that we have flagged, and while I understand the member for Cottesloe 
uh, as the lead speaker um, for the Liberal Party has indicated that he didn't want to go into consideration in detail, we may need to do that to pass these amendments. So they are technical uh, amendments, two of them re relatively minor. One is in relation to clause 38, and this amendment um, relocates the requirement in section 89A2 into a standalone clause, a new clause 38A. The section 89A2 requires an Aboriginal representative organisation to be given an opportunity to participate in preparing a cultural support plan for an Aboriginal child. This, amended is needed, this amendment is needed so that the ARO, or Aboriginal Representative Organisation requirement, can be brought into effect at a later date than the other provisions relating to AROs in Clause 38. The other provision in Clause 38 defines the terms cultural support plan and leaving care plan and are necessary to the support the operation of other amendments in the bill that will commence operation before AROs will. It is therefore necessary that they become separate clauses in the bill. AROs participation in cultural support planning can only commence operation once the Department of Communities and AROs are ready. This will require the development of operational models, regulation and the procurement of organisations that will become AROs for the purposes of the Act. So essentially we're, we are requiring Aboriginal representative organisations to do a number of things. Some of them we are not ready for them to do that. We will need time and we want to be able to separate those two provisions in the bill so that one can take place, um, one can take effect straight away and the other um, will take some more time. In relation to the sec second amendment, uh, in relation to clause 39, this addresses a drafting oversight by removing the word approved from section 90 in brackets 2A. This is consistent with amendments in the bill that now refer to Aboriginal representative organisations rather than approved Aboriginal representative organisations, so a minor drafting error there. I'd um, so like to address a couple of the issues that were um, raised during the, um, during the debate and uh, again can I thank those members uh, who spoke. Um, first of all, uh, the member for Riverton, uh, and this was a common theme uh, of a number of people who spoke who talked about their professional lives before coming into this place and their interactions with some of the issues that have arisen in the bill. And uh, that's certainly the case for the member for Riverton <coughs> in his extensive experience as a GP. He talked about um, uh, his shock uh, as a young doctor uh, and uh, I think when he was first in Australia, um, seeing that uh, someone had been prepared to use um, uh, a child to assist uh, in masking drug use, but in the process of uncovering that issue that was discovered that the child actually had drugs in their system. Uh, and so began his interaction with child protection and other authorities who are tasked with investigating and, if necessary, um, um, acting on, um, on those concerns. Uh, as a mandatory reporter now, um, doctors uh, understand full well, I think, their obligations. Uh, and uh, a number of members spoke about their own experience as mandatory reporters, um, uh, particularly uh, the member um, for Bateman and the member for Collie, um, Mar Collie Preston. Um, so uh, as mandatory reporters, as teachers. And the process that is put in place as mandatory reporters where you're not actually required to make any decisions, you're not actually required to form, a f um, uh, to, to know what will happen after you make that report. There is a process that's undertaken. Um, people will be trained and, and capacity will be built um, by those professionals, um, as occurs now with the uh, mandatory reporters uh, and supports in place. And in fact, that really goes to the issue, um, Member for Cottesloe, that you raised about why it was in the previous bill that we only um, concentrated on one 
occupation ministers of religion in that uh, in that bill rather than expanding it out to the other four or five I think other professions that had been recommended by the Royal Commission we were always we had always committed to expand it out to all of those uh, um, occupations however we understood that we need to make sure that we've got the systems in place and proper training amongst those occupations to ensure that the job is done properly and and therefore um, uh, we had prioritised ministers of religion um, for a couple of reasons, including the fact that as a broad occupational group, they are perhaps one of the least regulated, unlike, for instance, school psychologists or, um, uh, or the youth justice workers or out-of-home care workers who already are used to operating within a regulatory environment. Uh, and so uh, that's one of the reasons we prioritise Minister for ministers of religion. However, we understood that caused some concern and so it was uh, one of the um, recommendations that we picked up when the bill was reviewed by the Legislative Council Standing Committee on Legislation in the other um, place in the previous parliament and we were um, happy to pick up that recommendation that now um, includes all the other occupations that were recommended by the Royal Commission. Uh, as mandatory reporters. Having said that, we will phase in the implementation of uh, those occupations. And uh, Member for Cottesloe, you did um, you did ask that question about um, the implementation, and, and that is that we have committed. And I may have said this in the second reading speech, um, but ministers of religion will be um, have a commencement six months after the provisions of the bill are proclaimed. Commence. To commence, um, the uh, out of home care workers and departmental and associated department of communities offices, one and a half years after the bill's commencement, school counsellors and registered psychologists, two years after the school bill's commencement, early childhood workers, two and a half years after the bill's commencement, and youth justice workers, three years after the bill's commencement. Uh, and so, um, and already uh, the Department of Communities has been working with those broad occupational groups uh, to uh, understand what the processes of capacity building will be um, within, those, uh, within those areas. And um, despite having our differences in some areas, I can say that including, for all the churches, I think including the Catholic Church, um, it's been a very positive engagement about ensuring that there are, are frameworks and the like set up for that training. So uh, I was referring to the member for Riverton's contribution and the importance of uh, mandatory reporting and his experience in that. Uh, the member for Riverton also spoke about the um, central tenets of the bill in relation to um, the, the need to have cultural supports uh, and cultural planning and, in, and uh, um, a re revision of the hierarchy of placement for Aboriginal children. These are all uh, amendments that have arisen from the um, review of the Act in 2016-17, and um, they really go to the heart of our commitment to improve outcomes for Aboriginal children in care. Um, obviously, we want to prevent those children coming into care. That's always our priority. But should there be a need to, to bring those children into care, um, the provisions that um, are contained in, in the bill uh, give a much more fulsome requirement of all parties and enshrined in legislation um, to, um, uh, to improve cultural outcomes for Aboriginal children, to improve their connection to family, uh, to country uh, and to their kin. Uh, and, um, and the member for Riverton also spoke about the investigative powers being modernised. And members might be aware, but the investigative powers now within the Act have basically uh, the proposal is to pick up those investigative powers that now exist in the early childhood um, regulatory area, um, and um, will, will essentially mirror those those provisions by and large. So that's. Um, to modernise uh, the capacity of the Department of Communities when looking at any of these uh, issues, including uh, not just the issues that we've spoken about, uh, quite a bit about, child safety, but also about employment of children and the like. Uh, the member for Collie Preston also, as I said, spoke about her experience as a teacher and as a mandatory reporter. And uh, it's been a, an absolute privilege 
in this new parliament getting to know some of the new members and you only have to listen to any of the second reading speeches on a number of bills to be really um, heartened by the diversity um, that we now have within this, the, the diversity and the, and the depth of experience across um, across life, really, as well as professional lives uh, that we have across the parliament. And Member for Colleague Breston, I acknowledge your work as a, a dedicated um, uh, education professional in your community and understanding um, the real challenges in, in facing families who have um, where, there, where there is an entrenched disadvantage. And it's not enough for us just to talk about doing something about that or to say that something needs to be done about it. You've been working very hard, as I know other members of this chamber, and I'm looking across the chamber, but um, you and other members that contributed have committed much of your professional life to actually trying to make a difference for those families, and I commend you for that. And so when you spoke about your experience as a mandatory reporter or interacting with child protection staff as a teacher as a deputy principal, um, you understand the challenges um, that face both the Department of Communities and, the, and the, 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 um, the school community, the broader community that come together to ensure a safe environment for, for children. Uh, you also made the point, Member, that the earlier we can intervene when children do experience any sort of sexual abuse, um, the better placed we are to get good outcomes. And again, of course, our goal is to prevent abuse and to do everything we can to prevent that abuse, to send every legal signal that we can that abuse should not occur and that if it should be uncovered, um, it, it, those per, um, that per, perpetrators will be brought to account. But also that um, we understand that it's not just enough to have laws to, to have those laws written in our statute books. We have to build the capacity amongst our community around institutions, uh, around everyone that is, has interactions with children and, um, and including families and individuals uh, to ensure that they're safe. And that, that is really the, the um, framework that we have available to us in the Royal Commission recommendations, which we have committed to implement all of those that are relevant to Western Australia, and we are working through as a state uh, implementing those recommendations, and um, many of them are contained in this bill. Uh, I, I did just want to mention, actually, while we're um, speaking on that issue, you would think after being in here for a while I would get used to bringing out my notes and putting them in a way that I can find them when I'm up on my feet. But anyway, um, so you're making the point, <coughs> Member, that the earlier we can intervene with when children have had uh, trauma or sexual abuse, the better. And um, we have some very good practices here in Western Australia, in fact, um, some of the best in the country, if not in the Western world, in our child advocacy centres and our co-location of services um, when child abuse occurs so that children give their evidence once uh, and uh, tell their story once. And then if it's non-familial ab abuse that um, the family are then supported in one place um, to work through that process so that it's both um, minimise any... It, it not only minimises any sort of trauma or re-traumatising of retelling the event, but um, therapeutic and supportive environments are put in place as much as possible while not compromising the criminal investigations. So we have that model now in Western Australia and it's, and it's strong and it's good and, um, and um, that is a model of co-location of different disciplines, so police co-located with child protection officers, co-located mm -hmm. with therapists and the like. Everyone's got their job to do, but they do understand at the centre of it is the child that has been uh, impacted by this and, uh, if necessary, their support, um, whether it's their family or other support uh, people around them. Similarly, as a government, um, we have committed to understand better uh, childhood um, trauma and adverse events on children and uh, I'm very um, pleased that the WA Centre uh, for the Pursuit of Excellence in Responding to Child Abuse and Neglect is something that we have established as a government. We've supported the establishment of this um, both through Lottery West money initially and then through um, an additional $4.3 million towards both the WA Centre and a national centre that was a recommendation of the Royal Commission 
um, and um, this centre uh, was brought together by um, the uh, Australian Centre for Child Protection, um, which runs out of the University of South Australia but is a national body, uh, community service organisation Parkerville, Children and Youth Care, which members here would be aware, um, and Youth Care is the founding um, partner. And uh, its job is to look is to bring together clinical and research specialists from across Australia. And it's initially been focused on research and development of therapeutic models designed for Western Australia, um, looking at what our service needs are and what client populations need work, and the creation of a high quality workforce with specialist child trauma um, communities of practice linked to a tertiary qualification. So, in fact, their initial piece of work was um, prioritising um, some training around childhood trauma, responding to childhood trauma, and to date 300 professionals working in and around child protection. So they might be police, they might be education staff, they might be child protection staff. Having completed the first online training on understanding childhood trauma, 60 of these people will have completed an advanced unit in assessing childhood trauma and next year this cohort will also complete the third university accredited program on responding to childhood trauma. This is actually quite significant and I know uh, the member for Bateman is uh, interested in this as well, uh, that um, unfortunately we see childhood trauma um, manifest in many different behaviours in young people which we mistakenly um, understand to be bad behaviour or willfulness or a lack of dis di discipline or whatever, um, but people who understand children a little bit more and have a, we need to have a more sophisticated understanding of how trauma manifests if we want to be able to address it. Um, and so I'm very pleased the West Australian Government was able to support um, that particular centre and it's made a bid to uh, become the national centre that was recommended in the uh, Royal Commission. Uh, uh, the member for Collie Preston also made the point uh, of modern forms, of sort of emerging forms of, of abuse in um, sexting or uh, electronic transfer of, of images and the like, and the challenges that that can face, uh, that that can um, bring to um, their supervisors, to their families, um, when you have young people doing that to each other and what that means. Um, it, it, this is about supporting young people and mandatory reporters will need to have the capacity to understand their obligations in relation to that. Uh, and um, finally, Member, you also spoke about seeing where successful placements uh, have been done in your community where Aboriginal children might be placed with non-Aboriginal uh, carers but have been able to really engage with the local Aboriginal community and understand their local Aboriginal culture to get the best outcomes possible. Um, the, the child placement principle means the priority is to place children with their Aboriginal extended at, um, family, their Aboriginal communities, um, um, but of course we have amended that uh, placement principle to ensure that if it is um, preferable uh, that they can stay within their communities, perhaps with a non-Aboriginal carer, to ensure they stay connected to their extended family uh, and their uh, country and their, their community. Uh, the member for Kimberley uh, then spoke and um, it was great to hear your contribution and uh, you, uh, member, uh, go back a long way with this bill because I think uh, we spoke um, when you first came into Parliament, and in fact, uh, the member for Kimberley helped facilitate some of the review of the Act early on uh, before she came into Parliament. I think back in 2016 17, was involved in some of the consultation. And uh, the member for Kimberley um, knows these issues very well. Um, in, in, her in, in the seat of Kimberley, um, high, I think it might be 98 or 99 per cent of the children in care are Aboriginal. Um, and um, she pointed out to us that the, when she was making her address that it was National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Children's Day and uh, the theme was Proud in Culture, Strong in Spirit and that's a very fitting um, theme uh, for what we are endeavouring to do through this, um, through this bill. 
Uh, and so I thank her for her work in, in her community and the very, very complex issues um, that, that, uh, that her broad community, and when I say one, it's not one community, it's a large seat with lots of different communities in it, um, the, the challenges of keeping people, keeping children safe, of keeping culture strong, uh, and uh, understanding how we can work with um, mainstream services to draw on the best of them, but to maintain uh, the cultural credibility uh, and the cultural connection, and, and in fact do what we can to feed uh, to feed that identity, um, particularly for some of the more vulnerable members of uh, of the community. Uh, and rightly, the member uh, pointed out that while we no, no longer have a stolen generation, um, we need to deal with the gross over-representation of Aboriginal children in care, um, and we need to do more to reduce these disproportionate numbers um, of Aboriginal children in care. The Child Placement Principle uh, recommended in the Bringing Them Home Committee um, uh, is uh, important and, in fact, there are a number of amendments that refer to um, the Abor Aboriginal Child Placement Principle and um, I, I have spoken to some of the um, departmental, my ministerial equivalent and the departmental uh, representatives in Queensland where in the Queensland equivalent legislation the Aboriginal Child Placement Principle is actually explicitly um, spelt out the five cornerstone elements of prevention, partnership, placement, participation uh, and connection. Uh, and um, we were called on by um, Aboriginal advocates to um, make sure that those principles were firmly uh, articulated in the Act. And while they're not um, explicitly spelt out, uh, I, I do want to assure members that they inform a number of amendments um, that are contained in this bill, particularly amendments to sections 9, 12, 13, 14, 61, 81, 89 and new 89A and section 143 are all particularly relevant to the Aboriginal Child Placement Principle um, that was considered by many to be the kind of founding, the cornerstones, the founding principles of trying to establish a, a good quality um, child protection system um, that would give better outcomes for Aboriginal children. Uh, and uh, uh, again, um, I thank the member for her contribution in regard to, um, uh, to how these issues that have been dealt in, that are being um, proposed in the bill will make a difference to um, members of her community. Uh, and um, I look forward to uh, her meeting her commitment when she says she will continue to advocate for children in the Kimberley. Um, I have no doubt about that at all and I hope that we can work in partnership uh, to get good outcomes. The member for Belmont um, spoke very passionately about mandatory reporting, uh, as did a number of members, and um, their um, you only really have to read any sections out of the Royal Commission into child sex abuse um, to be reminded of the bravery. I don't know if bravery is the right word. I, I know some get a little affronted by that. It's very difficult for um, survivors, um, victim survivors, to come forward, but we are indebted to them um, for telling their stories because we would not be, we would not have this body of work. The Royal Commission would not have the the um, the, the path that it has laid out for us very clearly, uh, the very clear path of improving uh, systems to prevent child abuse if people had not come forward. Uh, and um, the member for uh, Belmont spoke about um, her passion in this area, um, the frustration with some of the institutions, particularly uh, some of the church institutions, including the Catholics, um, that. Um, that really uh, allowed perpetrators over time to continue to um, go on and abuse, uh, if not in the same environment, if just simply to get moved. And we know that the research tells us that they only um, uh, would go on to abuse again. Uh, and fundamentally, the, not only the, the physical and the, um, the physical assault, uh, the, the sexual assaults, the bullying, but, but fundamentally the betrayal of trust and the obligations um, that were held, uh, that um, 
adults had for those children in their care and how they were betrayed. Uh, and um, the member also spoke about um, uh, some of the other cultural protections in the um, in the bill and how important they will be. Uh, the member for Kingsley spoke about her experience as a member of the committee uh, on the Commission for Children and Young People, for the Commissioner of their Children and Young People, um, and the work that they did in their Words to Action report, uh, understanding how other jurisdictions, um, very comparable to our own, have dealt with these issues. And um, fundamentally, they have dealt with them. They have made a choice and they have made a statement, as um, I'm confident this parliament will, that says uh, we understand people have their religious views, but they will not um, they will not override uh, the, um, the laws of this land and our determination that children's safety um, be given priority. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I can't do justice to the words to action report here, um, but uh, the, the, it's for another time and, and we will get an opportunity through other bills to talk about this, but the, the various levels of accountability of systems that we uh, are putting in place, the independent oversight um, for institutions that have a lot to do with children called reportable conduct, for instance, the independent oversight of um, out-of-home care and child safe principles was another strong recommendation of the Royal Commission that we're working on. And I can assure members that we continue to work on all of those recommendations and we've committed to, to report annually, and we have been reporting annually on our implementation of the Royal Commission recommendations. Um, and of course, the member for, Kim, um, for Kingsley was brought up um, with foster siblings, so she knows firsthand um, the commitment um, the, that a family makes when they take on a foster child. And um, it has been one of the great pleasures of holding this portfolio is to see um, where children are, are nurtured and cared for, what fantastic outcomes uh, can be achieved. And um, I thank her parents, both of which I've known for a long time, uh, for, for um, their dedication to um, having a, um, a broader family. It's great to see. And finally, our acknowledgement of our home stretch election commitment. Um, Member for Cottesloe, you, you did refer to this a little uh, during your speech, but we made an election commitment uh, in the 2021 election that we would allow um, support for children in out-of-home care to 21 uh, rather than the mandated 18. At the moment, there are some uh, supports that can be put in place after a child leaves care at 18, ages out of care at 18, um, and that is available to them and legally available to them. But the commitment that we have made as an election uh, commitment um, to implement home stretch will be a lot more fulsome and we back that up with dollars in the uh, election campaign. So thank you for that. Uh, the member for, uh, for Coburn spoke again very passionately um, about the failures of some institutions in the past, of the religious institutions, particularly the Catholic Church, but they were not alone in this, um, in, um, in how they failed um, uh, children in the past and as institutions. Um, while there has been um, some uh, improvements made, uh, and I see some of those improvements in the um, safety uh, offices that are put in place in parishes and in churches. I've, um, I've uh, been to some of that, uh, those presentations and met some of that staff, and I have no doubt that they are um, that they're committed to uh, improving child safety uh, in their communities. However. Um, we don't back away from saying uh, that where these professions that we have that have been recommended to us by the Royal Commission have particular obligations. Um, th those obligations will be mandated in law, and that's what we're doing here. Um, as the member for Coburn said, when you hear about these um, victims of child sex abuse, there are not. They, these, are not, these are not abstract concepts, he said. These are children who have been deprived of their dignity and safety. Um, and uh, he goes on to talk about um, the importance of, um, of these provisions that we're putting in place, but also to continue uh, to challenge some of those very powerful institutions in our community um, who are not 
are, are not meeting modern expectations uh, um, of um, the primacy of, of, um, of child safety. Uh, the member for Netherlands also has a um, strong professional background in, um, in social work. She, she uh, not only was a social worker for many years, but she has trained many social workers and, and taught them at, at Curtin University. Um, she said that she was working as a social worker when mandatory reporting first came in, so she understands um, the principles and the operation of that um, of uh, that system. And of course, um, she also spoke about being a member of board of Forgotten on the board of Forgotten Australians at Chewett Place. And that's a support organisation in my electorate, I'm well aware of it, um, where she made the point that people with lived experience uh, of um, abuse are highly privileged in the organisation and form over half of the board. Um, but um, it's, it's been great organisation to be part of and to see their work uh, and to, when I can, get along to their Christmas parties and other events. Um, and I was very proud to be here in the parliament in June 2018, as the member referred to when the Premier apologised uh, on behalf of the state to child sex abuse um, for those who were in uh, state care. And I know it meant a lot to a number of members of a number of the members of Chuart Place who came along to that apology. Um, the um, member for Bassendean uh, spoke about, uh, as he has before in this place, uh, again in support of mandatory reporting and his experiences at, um, C as a student at CBC Fremantle and then realising that um, one of the brothers that, he, that taught him and who he had in fact had bad experience uh, with um, had in fact been a paedophile and his work uh, since uh, discovering that in um, calling for his school and uh, other Christian Brothers schools and other schools to do their bit in, a, in the modern world, current day, to um, uncover uh, abuse not only as it may occur now but to right wrongs of the past, and that might mean taking a proactive approach to contact past students, for example. And as the member was speaking, I was thinking of the example in the High Court when um, former Justice um, Dyson Hayden was accused of uh, sexual harassment, and the new head of the High Court simply took matters into her hands and wrote to staff and previous staff and outlined very simply that um, there had been allegations that this wasn't child sex abuse, this was just um, sexual, just this was sexual harassment, um, but was very proactive and clear and ensured that there was no um, hiding behind that. And I thought that was a good model um, that other organisations should uh, um, seek to adopt. Uh, uh, Member for Bateman, you spoke about, um, again, your... Uh, experiences at different points in life of seeing um, children who have been um, very um, um, terribly impacted and, and the case of seeing the funeral of a 12-year-old of a girl who um, had suicided um, and then through your professional life at times partly being motivated by this um, but also seeing these issues come up against you as a teacher, uh, as a community member. Uh, and your passion um, and understanding of these issues. And I, and I thank you for that in the past and look forward to the contributions that I know you're going to make in this place. Uh, you uh, made a good point, I thought, about um, the um, that there still is a level of, um, of shame that comes from victims talking about these issues, and uh, particularly for boys, for instance, to talk about abuse that may have occurred and we need to do everything we can to in have comfortable environments and therapeutic environments um, when abuse takes place. And the WA Centre that I spoke about before and all of the work of um, communities uh, uh, works very hard um, within the department but also with our community sector organisations to ensure that we have a good, good professional practice and a drawing on um, uh, the best supports that we can for victims um, and their families. And I see that every day. I see that every day in the work of Department of Communities uh, who are working um, in the child protection system. 
uh, and member for Vic Park again a very um, uh, comprehensive and articulate um, uh, advocate for um, for mandatory reporting and and uh, for those of us who are brought up Catholics I think you are still a Catholic understanding uh, the um, the arcane matter of uh, canon law and and uh, the dilemmas that are there um, uh, notwithstanding all of that in the 21st century um, things are changing and I think the world is expecting certainly uh, Australia I think is expecting um, their institutions to change as well and uh, so thank you for that um, contribution and I know that again you, you in your community will see these issues come up uh, as you have already as a, as, um, as a member of the public and, and uh, as a parent. A member for Dawesville uh, has a different professional background. She um, uh, spoke about um, uh, working as a paramedic and as a first responder. And while that is not a mandatory reporting uh, um, occupation, it is someone that sees victims uh, and the need to be sensitive to what is occurring around them. And I thank you very much for your um, contribution. And you spoke about um, an organisation we both care about, and that's the Foster Care Shed. And in fact, um, you were talking about uh, Mandy Bishop and Karen uh, Kajorski. And uh, in fact, Mandy Bishop, who I think was the founder of Foster Care Shed, um, her um, foster daughter Chloe won two awards at the Achiever Awards uh, um, this last week. And um, it was just so lovely to see. And I saw on social media there was something like 400 comments or something in, on her, in her. Um, in her uh, post about it, it was really great. And when you see what um, she and her family and Karen and others have not only been able to achieve with their own children that they've taken in, foster children, but that whole community in there is really very powerful. And I know you see it and want to support them um, as a member for Murray, Murray, Wellington, Murray Wellington does. I'm quite impressed at my ability to talk, actually, um, acting speaker. I've been going for quite a long time, so um, I'll, I'll try and... Um, I'll try and wrap it up soon. Um, so, Member for Cottesloe, thank you for your contribution. I know you were a late sub uh, in this area. Um, and I think you asked some questions about um, are the differences between the 2019 bill and this one. Uh, there has been a table given to um, the Member for Vass and the Honourable Nick Garan, and I have a table here I can give you if you're interested. Um, so essentially the Legislative Council Standing Committee on Legislation looked at this in the last parliament and we adopted all but one of their recommendations um, and, um, uh, and we're happy to do that. Uh, um, a, a lot of them were um, really, really matters of um, implementation of the mandatory reporting, but there were other issues uh, that were causing some angst uh, about um, the uh, extent of um, uh, engagement or uh, um, consultation with Aboriginal uh, family, Aboriginal representative <coughs> organisations, etc. And we um, accepted some amendments to try and clarify that and um, appease some concerns about that. Uh, and uh, I think I referred to, um, I should be able to finish up fairly soon, um, I think I referred to the starting dates, the commencement dates for mandatory reporters uh, earlier. And finally, um, Member uh, for Th Thornley, thank you, I said Gosling Thornley, um, thank you very much for your um, contribution. Um, you left school 41 years ago, we both did. We're both the same vintage, it's sort of staggering really. Um, but um, in fact, uh, these, are, these are not um, issues of the distant past that we're dealing with. We're dealing with some of the schools and some of the religious orders in the Royal Commission um, that we're still uh, facing now. And in fact, uh, the member uh, spoke about um, the case of Trinity and some teachers, I understand that um, members, uh, uh, teachers um, were uh, prosecuted for failing to mandatory report uh, an abuse, but I understand that's still before the court, so I won't say much more about that. And Lily spoke about some of the um, distortions and toxic culture uh, that comes from some of the um, private 
uh, often all boys schools, although there are single sex schools, other girls schools where there are problems as well. Um, so um, thank you for your contribution. Uh, again, uh, can I thank everyone um, for their attention to this important, these important matters uh, and uh, commend the bill to the House. Thank you, Minister. The question is um, that the bill be read a second time. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those to the contrary say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. A bill for an act to amend the Children and Community Services Act 2004 to implement recommendations of the 2017 statutory review of the act and to introduce mandatory reporting of child sexual abuse for certain persons and for other purposes. Is leave, is leave granted to proceed forthwith to the third reading? No, because I've got to move. No. Leave is not granted. We will go to consideration in detail. Doing this amendment, the two might get the advisers to hold off. Minister, where would you like to begin? Um, I think it's clause 30, 38. 38. I've said that. I don't need my advisers in now. Yep. Um, the question is that clauses uh, 1 to 30 stand, 37 stand as printed. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those to the contrary say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, I move that the amendment to clause 38 stand in, stand in my name. So the question is that the um, words to be deleted be deleted. The question is the words to be deleted be deleted. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those to the contrary say no. The, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that the clause as amended be agreed to. The question is the clause as amended be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those to the contrary say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 39. New, sorry, now this is going to move new clause 38A. So, so. I'll move the amendment to clause 38 to clause 39 standing my name. So that's a new discount. A new clause 38A. Just, Minister, just to clarify, it's the new clause 38A. Uh, apologies. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I move uh, new cl news clause 38 um, to move that page 30 lines 1 to 5, delete the lines, etc. News cl new clause 38A, standing yeah, okay. my name. So the question is that new clause 38A be inserted? The question is that clause 38A be inserted. All those in favour say aye. Aye. All those to the contrary say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Yeah, clause 39. Now clause 39. I move that clause 39. The amendment on the amendment back in my name to clause 39. I thought that was all. Yeah. I think that's all. Yeah. The question is that the line, that the the line to delete the word approved. The question is that the line to delete the word approved be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those to the contrary say no. I think the ayes have it. 
The ayes have it. Yeah, clause 39 as amended be agreed to. Question is that clause 39 as amended, as amended be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those to the contrary say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Okay, so now we've just got to finish on clauses 40 to 75. The question is that clauses 40 to 75 be to stand as printed. Yep. All, yep. Those um, all those in favour say aye. All those to the contrary say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. And the title. So the question is that this be the title of the bill, or the long title of the bill. The question is that this be the long title of the bill. All those in favour? All those in favour say aye. aye. All those to the contrary say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. So that concludes consideration in detail. That concludes consideration in detail. All those in favour say aye. No. All those to the contrary say no. <gasps> I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Madam Speaker, I move that the House now adjourn. <laughs> All those in favour say aye. All those to the contrary say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it.